ready to start. Um, so I'll call to order uh, uh, call to order the meeting and a roll call. Uh, the meeting of the Finance Administration Committee is called to order. We will proceed with a roll call. Please res respond when I call your name. Cedric Real. Present. Bill Johnson. George Mendoza. Here. Chris Cronin. Present. And I, Brad Stevens, am present. So our quorum is present. Uh, announcements. Uh, first, I have some housekeeping announcements. We ask everyone to please put your cell phones to, on do not disturb. If you are joining us by phone and using your cell phone for audio, please keep yourself muted unless speaking. Members of the media, if you haven't already done so, please sign the sign-in sheet at the recorder's desk to my left. Likewise, anyone present in person who wishes to give public comment, please be sure to sign the sign-in sheet at the recorder's desk. To provide access to the public, the public have been invited uh, to attend in person, and this meeting is being live streamed over the internet. Speakers must use the laptop microphones, which are the only way the people of on live stream can hear what we say. Use the mics if the use of the mic is also necessary for proper amplification within the room. If too many mics are on at a time, however, the, they become less effective. Therefore, please turn your mic off when you aren't using it. If you brought a laptop device, please be sure the speakers and microphone are turned off. Otherwise, they will interfere with the mics causing feedback. The committee uh, received no written public comments for this meeting. We also uh, did not receive a uh, request to give oral comment uh, oral public comment by remote means. This that concludes my housekeeping announcement. Uh, we uh, have possibly some uh, early presentations, and I think Chris, would you like to go ahead and give your presentation? Uh, yes, it's actually very brief. It's uh, uh, in preparation for the Board of Trustees' work with the upcoming presidential search and candidate visits. I have some information to hand out quickly. Um, it should be self-explanatory. Thank you. Um, I'll wait till you get it. So Brad, being on the first uh, search committee, you're familiar with most of this. So I just wanted to introduce the process um, to the other trustees during the committee meetings today, since uh, the first candidate visit will be next week. Um, uh, so each trustee will be uh, sent the posting itself that went out um, nation nationally. Uh, the, the candidate's application materials, the final three candidates, their interview recordings, their first interview recordings, and an assignment to complete implicit bias training, which Brad, you've also done uh, already. So um, this will all need to be reviewed carefully by Monday. The implicit assignment, uh, bias training assignment completed ne next Thursday. Uh, and then you're given a homework assignments as far as uh, preparing questions uh, to be used in the final interview with each candidate uh, that the Board of Trustees will be conducting on the second day of the visit. So um, I'm available for, for questions, of course. Um, and uh, there's a prep meeting for the entire board on Monday at three, which um, you'll what, soon what get notice of. Monday. Sorry, Chris, this Monday. Correct. Okay. Yes, and um, we're uh, we're going to send some additional material to the trustees about this uh, a little later today, as with uh, so you'll have the the full picture. But we want you to have this um, here. So, do you have any dates that we can write yeah. down? That'll all be in the memo that Chris will be sending, but I wanted to take advantage okay. of the, the trustees that are here and introduce us in person today okay. at the committee meetings. Great. Thank you for the time. Oh, sure. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Um, well, thank you. Uh, at the beginning of all our meetings, I always like to have one of us talk to us of what's special about Eastern so we can get riled up about that and think about that as opposed to all the reading we've done and all the details. And so George uh, said, he'd be willing to give us a few comments. And so thank you very much. Thank you, you Chair Stevens. Um, I'll just share this. I could probably go on 
for a long time in terms of uh, how EOU resonates with me in terms of a perspective as a human. So I'll start with at least saying this. Um, I think my life started a little bit when I went to college um, outside of my own household. That's where I think um, I became much more of a independent person or a, a thoughtful person. And um, part of it, I think, is as you mature uh, as an adult, but I think part of it is also the journey that we go on um, when we experience post-secondary education. Um, and EOU for me really was about learning. And I felt like I got to learn quite a bit about academics, getting my degree, being a teacher, being an educator, but I got to learn about friendships. I got to learn about life. I got to learn about the experiences that other people have compared to my own experiences and their values, their morals, um, their work ethic, all these types of things. I got to make some really strong connections with our professors. Um, at that time, um, there was a time where I actually lived under the house of the Dean of Education, his name, Jen, Jens Robinson. Um, he kind of took me in my sophomore year, um, started me meeting with me, having coffee with me, um, taking me to lunch once in a while, and then saying when, when he had a room available, would you like, to, would you like to stay here? And that pathway to me just, just projected me towards um, a better life and better values and a way of thinking that I didn't have before. So that relationship was strong. Lots of other, I had great coaches and mentors and friends. Um, so that learning piece, I don't know if any other university at that time could have given me that learning piece. And so the, the outcomes piece is what to me EOU does as well, whether it's graduation, whether it's jobs and careers, whether it's a better life for a human, those outcomes um, that EOU also did for me or for many others, I think in our region or that give back to EOU or that think about their life and, and what the university does for them. Those outcomes are also extremely important for how we create a better world or how we create a better society or how we create a better family or how we create a better community. All these types of things that those outcomes create um, have been instrumental in, for me, but I know for many others. And the last one would just be collaboration. Um, so universities should be about learning. They should be about outcomes and they should be about collaboration. And again, we're right here. You know, there's a lot of people that care and work in partnership and in support of EOU, but the way professors work with our students, the way our students work with each other, the way our teams collaborate and play, the, the networking, the relationships, the connections, the values, all those things is what EOU does. They bring a lot of people together, they make a lot of things better, and then they help us to improve our world. So. I could go on on how I feel about EOU, but I'm just thankful that it gives us this place and this opportunity for us to make things better. Thank you. Well, George, thank you so much. That's wonderful. I think it speaks to the importance and value of on-campus uh, experience for a student. And one of the things we really want to push is get our on-campus uh, enrollment up. So thank you very much. Okay. Um, today, there are several presentations which are considered first read and are being presented for discussion only. The presentations include tuition, student health fee, room and board, as well as a draft of the F FY24 preliminary operating budget. All the first read items will be brought to the May meeting for recommendations of the full board. Today's agenda also includes an update on the capital projects. Our only action item is to approve the January meeting minutes. Do I have a motion to approve? I move to approve the January meeting minutes. Uh, and a second? I'll second that. Okay, great. Uh, Real and Cronin have moved and seconded. Uh, all those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you. It's passed. Moving on to uh, the discussion items, the next agenda item is the first read of the 2023-24 tuition proposal. The proposed increase excuse me, range between two to 4.9%. Leanne Case will walk us through the tuition setting process and the current tuition proposal. So Leanne, thank you, go ahead. Thank you, Trustee Stevens. 
It's a pleasure to be here today. A couple agenda items um, that I will walk you through today, but the first one will be the tuition proposal. The tuition proposal um, started with budget and planning, the tuition advisory committee last October. They put a lot of work into developing a tuition proposal. This is just a draft at this point. They are still working on their recommendation, which will go to the president um, by the end of this week. So there could be slight changes um, before you see the final in May. Um, but so far, this is what we have to present. <clears throat> Today, I'll just, for this presentation, I'll just walk you through the process um, that we go through for tuition setting, look a little bit at the draft um, tuition proposal, and then the next steps that you'll see before May. <clears throat> because this meeting was moved back a week, um, it's really only about three weeks. You'll have your materials in two weeks, so it's a pretty quick turnaround between now and the time that you see the final. When we're working on the tuition setting process with the uh, Budget and Planning Tuition Advisory Committee, um, they have a lot of work to do, but the administration also um, has worked hard this year um, with their efforts with the legislature for additional funding for Eastern. Um, so thank you, Richard and Tim, for all the time you've spent down there and trustees. Um, we've continued to invest at Eastern in our programs for EOU students. Um, even while we face budget challenges and enrollment challenges, we've continued to revitalize programs and add new programs to Eastern. Um, we've also continued to seek alternative revenue streams over the years. A lot of this is in grants. Um, those grants either are ways to offset current expenditures or they are ways to keep our tuition um, at the lowest possible place we can be, um, or they bring in indirect cost revenue for us. So there's a lot of good that gets done with the alternative revenue streams. Another alternative revenue stream, obviously, is the work that we get from the foundation and, and the donations that come in through the foundation as well. <laughs> tuition increases always have been um, and always will be. Um, and certainly in my time at Eastern, the last resort, the last lever that we pull. Um, our students are obviously very vital to the campus. Um, we deal with a lot of underserved students, um, students that are first generation. Um, so keeping our access available to those students is a priority. The Budget and Planning Tuition Advisory Committee charge, um, they advise the president um, on recommendations to give to you regarding the campus tuition and mandatory enrollment fees. Um, the mandatory enrollment fees at Eastern for this purpose are only health service and building fees. Um, you see all of them, um, but for what their actual charge is, it's just related to those two. Uh, <clears throat> the advisory body, which is the Tuition Advisory Committee. Um, they provide opportunities for student government and students to participate in the process. We have four students on the committee, um, two, or, two of which represent underserved students at Eastern. Um, the other two are technically student um, government students. However, I believe all four of them actually serve on our student government, which is super helpful um, when we're working with them. Um, in addition to the student participation, um, we hold other meetings um, with student leadership um, and student forums. And the actual the second student forum is this afternoon at 4 p.m. Um, and at the end of that, uh, they provide a written report to the president, which includes the recommendations, deliberations, and observations that they've taken throughout the year. Again, this work, they meet monthly. Um, they have actually had a, a couple of extra meetings and a couple of informal meetings this year. This has been probably the best um, budget and planning tuition advisory committee that I've worked with. They've been very thoughtful. Um, they've brought things to the table. They've brought proposals to the table. They've talked about everything from maybe we should base our tuition on the three bigs and it should be uh, just a proportion of theirs. It should be some kind of percentage of theirs. Um, they've talked about in-state, out-of-state rates, um, off-campus rates, on-campus rates. Um, so it's been very engaged um, this year. It's, sometimes we don't see that, but this year we did. They obviously take um, pride in their work and in pride in, in what we're doing to the students as well as far as the tuition increases. <clears throat> this year, um, they also um, looked at their guiding principles um, to ensure that they were still aligned with what was in the mission for Eastern. Um, their, their three major guiding principles are maintaining the best value position relative to Oregon public universities, 
building and maintaining financial stability and allowing for consistent improvement of mission fulfillment and serving the regional access needs. I believe that this proposal meets all three of those. Um, it's not perfect in any way. Um, we would all like to see no tuition increases, um, but this is a fairly balanced approach um, using all of our levers that we can to um, stabilize the budgetary environment. Looking at the pros and cons of tuition increases, um, you know, three on each side. You could talk for days about the pros and cons for tuition increases. Um, the pros uh, slows pressure on the expenditure budget, reduces the dependency on one-time funding, and allows the university to continue to operate at the current civil service levels. On the cons, it negatively impacts it can negatively impact the student's educational experience. Um, it can work against the desire to remain the lowest cost OPU and it can negatively impact the future of enrollment growth. Again, there's tons of these. Um, these are just the three that, that rose to the top. Balancing the guiding principles against the need for revenue and a more balanced budget is always a challenge. Um, it's a challenge for the university. It's a challenge for me because of the work that I do on both sides of, of these areas. Um, what we've done to prepare this current tuition proposal is reviewed the various tuition rates at the OPUs and where we are in relation to them. We've compared an analysis provided by Wiley um, to look at the off-campus tuition comparison for them. We engage Wiley in that because they have more tools and more resources to do. They have a larger outreach. It's easier. Gives us a better sense of what was happening nationally, regionally, and in the West regions. And I'll show you those numbers here pretty quickly. Um, but it it it's one of our partnerships with them that really helps us out. We take into account points made by student leadership during those meetings that we've held with them, um, considered the several state funding scenarios. Um, we also look at where we are in relation to the HEC procedures regarding undergraduate tuition and mandatory fees and staying under that 5% so that we don't have to present to HEC. We consider the net tuition impacts and the impacts of financial aid on our students. Um, we refine the expenditure budget down as far as we can um, so that we aren't showing an over, overstated expenditure budget and requiring higher tuition increases that are unnecessary. And we've also refined the, the enrollment projections. Both the expenditure budget and the enrollment projections will continue to be refined throughout the summer. Um, so as the budget you will see in May is just a preliminary. When we come back in the fall, those numbers will be refined for the final budget. For the actual proposal, um, budget and planning, the tuition advisory committee input. <clears throat> General consensus is tuition increases are not desired. They're never desired. However, because of the inflation and increasing costs, tuition increases are necessary. They acknowledge that. They just ask that we keep them as low as possible. Uh, they'll have a, again, they'll have a more refined uh, recommendation that you'll see at the May meeting. Been trying to balance the needs of the university while being sensitive to the affordability of our students. The draft tuition proposal incre includes rates that range between 2% and 4.9%. Um, this will help with increase the increasing cost of instruction and university operations. <clears throat> Looking historically at our tuition and fees, and this just goes back to 2016, just give you a sense of where we've been. Um, over Since 2016, our tuition um, for undergraduate resident students on campus has increased by 30%. On average per year, it's 3.74%. So um, it's, it's not great. It's not terrible. Um, we've never seen double digit increases in any year. Um, so we have been managing those things. Uh, managing um, means managing the cost side of things. So again, this is mostly just informational for you. The resident um, undergraduate online um, tr travels in about the same worry, about 32% there as well. Um, and then our graduates are in around the 30% um, online piece of it. Looking at the draft tuition proposal on campus, we're recommending a 4.9% increase for our on-campus students, undergraduates. Um, on-campus undergraduate non-resident, 3.5%. Off-campus undergraduate resident, 3%, as well as a 3% increase for the non-resident off-campus students. Graduate at 2%. 
no increase for our undergraduate and graduate business differentials, um, and no increases for our dual credit and our high school, um, our high school student. Projected increase based just on those, no enrollment increases included $873,000. What's it look like um, in terms of numbers? Um, it's a $9 per credit hour increase for our on-campus resident students or $405 per year based on a 45 credit load. Um, for our off-campus uh, non-resident or <coughs> off-campus resident students, it's $8.40 um, or $252 per um, for an annual increase. The off-campus students don't tend to take 45 credit hours per year, um, so that the annual is is off is lower than what you would expect, but it's just based on the credit hours. Um, looking at our graduate students, um, increasing those by two percent still puts them at $520. When you're looking at an under at a graduate level MAT program where they take 52 credit hours in a single year, that's about $30,000 a year. So when you put it out to an annual amount um, for a graduate student, um, it feels high. Um, it is in line with our other OPUs, which you'll see in a moment, um, but just being cognizant of how many credit hours a master's student um, actually takes in one single year um, for a program is important to consider. Therefore, you see the lower increase on the graduate programs. Comparing ourselves with the Oregon Public Universities, um, the only ones that are approved is the University of Oregon. Um, the others have just bought, gone to their board. Um, so these are these numbers are from their board materials. Portland State is looking at a three and a half percent increase on their undergraduate on campus, bringing them to 207. Oregon State 4.4. They have a cohort program, so this applies to their new students coming in only. Uh, Western's looking at a three percent. Most of 3.1% increase or $200 per credit hour. OIT, Klamath Falls, 4.9. Um, University of Oregon, 4%. They also have a cohort and it's their new students coming in. Southern doesn't go to their board until next Thursday. Um, so we'll have more information um, when their docket posts probably tomorrow. But you can see looking at this, we're still maintaining where we want to be. We're still below. Um, all the other OPUs for our undergraduate residents. This, I'm not sure if you can see this. Um, this is just a chart that puts everything together and it includes the mandatory fees per term. Um, so it's looking, all the, the color just being the stuff I showed you on the previous one and just shows that those were the things that have changed from last year for each one of those institutions. Um, so you can see the top line is the SCH per um, for undergraduate on campus, um, the per credit hour rate, um, the building fee, the special building fee. Um, almost all colleges have, all universities have a special building fee. It's usually related to a rec center. Ours is related to Hoke. Um, so there's that fee. The incidental fee, which is managed by the student. Um, student health fee, which you'll hear more about from Lacey Carrillo um, today. And then um, University of Oregon also has a student union building fee as well as a technology fee. Um, our student union building our student union building fee is included in our incidental fee. Um, University of Oregon has split those out for for internal purposes at their campuses. The bottom line here on this um, specific chart shows you where we are in relation to the other OPUs. So we remain. Um, with the mandatory fees and resident tuition, we remain 3% behind or behind Western. We remain 4.8% 4, 4 behind Portland State. Um, it feels like we're creeping up on them, but it's important to remember that there are a lot of other differentials and fees that are charged to students at other universities. So when you look at a couple of the universities, um, they charge a 37% differential on some of their health programs. So that's in addition to their base. Uh, there's also um, uh, universities who have a business differential similar to ours, um, but for their undergraduate, it's 18.4 or $18.40. Um, ours is $14.50. College of Arts. Um, 
I'm not sure if this is new or if I have just not um, really paid attention to the differentials at the other campuses, but there are several campuses that are charging differentials on the art programs. These are high cost programs. We see that um, in the SSCM calculations because completers in the arts are actually, we receive additional funding in them. But these are colleges that are recognizing that those are high cost programs and adding in those tuition dollars up front for each of the students. Um, other colleges charge $25 for a differential. Um, so there's all kinds of other things that go into it. So we really try and stay when we compare um, and present this just at the base SCH rate. Um, but I always want you to keep in mind, we're pretty transparent. We're very transparent um, about our fees. We don't have any other differentials at this point in time except for on those business classes. We don't have program fees. Um, we just, this is what you get. What you see is really what you get. We have course fees that are tangible um, for students that have to pay for something. They pay for a field trip. They pay for something that they get in art supplies, um, but we don't have other fees. We don't have several tuition tables. This is, this is it for your undergraduate on campus students. Looking at the graduate programs, um, this is always a little bit harder. Um, we have um, traditionally had two graduate programs, um, Masters of Teaching and our MBA program. We're bringing on three more, um, and our MFA, sorry. We're bringing on um, three more programs. Um, other, other colleges, especially the bigs, have much broader um, master's programs. So it's a little bit hard to find within their tuition tables and stuff to compare apples to apples. Um, but this is looking, looking and digging in. This is, is pretty close to where would align with our programs. Um, Portland State, um, $463 per credit hour, um, but they have a lot more tables and they have a lot more fees that they charge. Um, Oregon State is at 560. It's their online rate. Um, I put that in as our their online rate because all of our programs are are, are online. Um, Western's a little bit lower, and they don't have a lot of master's programs. Um, OIT at 536, um, and the University of Oregon um, really just listed a percentage increase this year um, of zero to five percent, depending on the program that they're in. <clears throat> our off-campus programs, um, we are, are, are pretty close. Um, we're proposing a rate of 286.40 for our residents and 329.60 for our non-residents. Um, Portland State doesn't really list an off-campus program, online program. Um, Oregon State, 350. They rebased their program um, this year to just a flat 350 per credit hour rate. There's no cohorts. Doesn't matter. It's 350. Um, no matter what, as part of their recommendation. Um, Western's at 253, base tuition plus a $53 per credit hour um, rate that goes along with that. Oregon Tech is at 308 plus a $65 per course fee. Again, we don't charge any additional fees um, for our online programs other than the tuition that you see here and our differential. The bottom chart is what um, Wiley provided for us, just looking at the national, west, and regional comparators, the average cost per credit hour, um, and these are these are 22, 23 numbers. Um, they're always providing these to us a year in arrears, um, but nationally they looked at 587 universities, and the average cost per credit was 303. The median was at 287. The west side, 44 universities, 293. Um, median 283, and the regional, they looked at 320 universities, 297 per credit hour, um, or a median of 283. So you can see we're in the ballpark as far as what's being done nationally, regionally, um, locally, um, in the West programs. Uh, so I feel I feel pretty good um, about, about where we are in the e-campus, off-campus, distance education market. These charts and they're also in your materials, so you don't have to blind yourself by looking at them. But the red indicates those are the those are the areas that match and align with the proposal. It's really just to give you a sense of well, what if we only did one and a half percent? What if we only did three percent in all of these categories? Um, if you want to play around with it, it's really what we provide to what I provide to budget and planning so that they can do their modeling as well. 
uh, this chart um, continues on, um, shows the annual increase based on those total credit hours, and then the annual revenue increases. Um, the big piece here is um, our resident off campus. Um, we're foregoing some revenue here by staying in the 3% range. Um, you can see we're planning to generate about $465,000, $466,000 off a 3% increase. Um, if you went to 4.9 or beyond, um, we could generate $760,000. Um, so you can imagine, um, you know, that causes me some pain sometimes. Um, but I think it is the balanced approach, and I think it's the right the right way to go. Um, you could also see in the graduate areas as well. We're foregoing um, $100,000 by staying at this rate um, for our off-campus um, resident students. So. Um, it, it it just shows we're, we're not being greedy. Um, we're not putting all this on the backs of our students. Um, we have a budget issue, um, but we can get, get by that um, without impacting our students more severely than necessary. This is a brief glimpse, and I will go over this um, a lot more during the budget presentation. Uh, but this just shows what it would look like, what our budget today would look like with no tuition increases and no enrollment increases, what it would look like if we went to a full 4.9% increase, um, what it would look like at our suggested proposal um, plus flat enrollment, and then our suggested um, tuition and enrollment increases. So you can just see the bottom line, you're really probably looking at the year-end operating net um, anywhere between $2 million and $3.6 million of a deficit. None of these bring us out of out of the hole. Um, so we will be uh, planning to operate one more year with a budgetary deficit. <clears throat> Tuition setting um, process again, it started in October. Um, we're nearing the end. Um, the budget and planning uh, the finance committee today, um, budget and planning is continuing to make their final recommendation. Um, the, the cabinet will also see that recommendation. And then um, the final student campus community forum is today as well. We'll be back in May with a final proposal for you um, for a recommendation to the full board at the next uh, board meeting. Any questions? What, did I, what did I miss in my notes? Oh, so Leanne, I guess go ahead and sit please. Yeah, just a quick question. Um, I know part of our conversation last year, and then I'm sure it's still a conversation going into this year, is both staying below that 5%, but also um, kind of, in a sense, recovering from our tuition freeze a couple years ago. I guess my question is, with the current proposal we were talking last year, if at some point we have to be more aggressive, I know that this is taking into account no change in enrollment, um, but... I believe last year did as well, and then um, still struggling with enrollment a little bit. So I guess, in short, my question is, to what we've been looking at, where are we at in that process of, are we going to be able to maintain this below this 5% or at some point, are we still kind of worried about slipping into where we might need to make a more aggressive decision? I'm I'm happy to talk about that, Cedric. I think, um, no, we are not confident at this point that we won't e ever be facing an above 5% tuition increase. Um, you know, one of the most critical components of that is whether enrollment starts to recover. Um, but, but no, we're not confident in that. And I think given what uh, enrollment does in the fall, we'll be having a variety of conversations about how to address the budget deficit, both from the expense side and the revenue side. Um, but obviously we're mindful that um, students can only pay so much. And so um, it's definitely not our intent to be thinking about massive tuition increases as a way to recover the deficit. Being above 5%, however, might be part of that. It, it, it's one of the levers and it will, that would obviously come after um, a lot of significant conversation with students and campus. But. I think it's, I'd just add that, you know, the other big variable is how much is the state going to provide? And, and they're not saying, uh, anything of 
you know, a definite nature until after the May revenue forecast. And we've heard from legislators, oh, it's going to be better than we thought. And then yesterday we heard from one, it's going to be worse than it was originally projected. But that that's also a big factor in in the discussion. So every time we're in the first year of a new biennium, we're guessing that until the legislature finally settles on it. Um, well, very well done. Great presentation. Good information. Um, very comprehensive. I love how you show showcase us versus um, as other regional or statewide institutions as well as across the country. Um, I think for me, I can understand everything. Um, I think at times, though, the 4.9 for on campus, whether on campus residential here or students that are WU students, um, the rest is always less. So it's like the people that are here the most, the people that access this institution the most have to pay the most. And that just to me fundamentally sends a message that that's wrong. And I know when you give more information, like we are less than other institutions, we're um, not charging as much. We're still below their, their increases. I think we get to hear that. I don't know what, who else gets to hear that, but I think somewhere in all of that, um, there is a messaging that needs to take place about we're very affordable. We're the most affordable. We create the, the most access. We have the most access. We have these things. While at the same time, we're saying um, students that are on campus, you're going to pay 4.9% more. Or students that are Western you know, University Exchange students, you're going to pay 4.9% more. Because to me, it, it winds up being like, I'm the on-campus person and I have to pay the most. And these guys are paying less. You, so we have to do these kinds of presentations where there is good information, there is data that explains things so that hopefully people can uh, accept, I guess, that as a reality. That was, that's more of a commentary. Yeah, I, I agree. Um, and we had hoped, um, we presented this same proposal a month ago. Um, and typically, oftentimes we'll go in a little bit high um, just because it's easier to reduce numbers later than increase them um, and in hopes especially in the first year of the biennium and waiting for legislature let, waiting for our funding levels um, to be able to come in today and say well wait we're going to read we're, not, we're really not going to be at five. we don't need to be at five four point nine um, we're going to be at four point five um, based on the current signals um, which is I'm not confident enough to drop that down at this point in time um just because of where we are in the budget but i agree it percentage wise it it, it doesn't resonate without the story behind it uh, yes uh thank you chair i i asked you this uh before the session the chart that discusses revenue generation by category just noticed that the undergrad non-resident on campus is extremely low number um can you talk to that about thank that? you thank you for that prompt <clears throat> um so chris had asked in the in your materials it shows um where we how much we think we're going to generate um in each one of these categories and the non-resident um undergraduate on campus is very low and we have very few students that actually pay the full non-resident on on campus rate um, because we have so many programs and so many policies around tuition equity so our Native American students pay residential rates, our COVA students pay residential rates. Um, a lot of our students, while they're out of state, um, fall in that WUI category where they pay 150% of on-campus on resident rates. Um, our Oregon, our Washington, Idaho students pay Oregon rates. And so you end up with not very many students who are on campus paying an actual out-of-state rate. Before that number was a little bit higher um, when we were not including all of the Native American students and the COFA students in the residential rates in those tuition equity policies. So that has changed and it's driven that number down lower, but it's increased our population of students in those areas. So um, it's a bit of a trade off. So, Leanne, I, I, I have one question also. We talked earlier about all this and uh the fact that when i first saw all those lower percentages i said my gosh why aren't we just 4.9 for everybody 
in order to talk about it. And I know you talked about one being that the graduate students have a very high cost, but also you were talking about how uh, we're looking at other outside uh, competition and a lot of, if we raise our rates, we're going to be higher than the other. Can you talk a little bit about that, about how you kept the rates low because of competition getting too high for them? Yeah. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, when we look at the on-campus rates, um, we're really comparing ourselves with the Oregon Public Universities. And part of that is just because of the HEC policy with the 5%. And, and we we have good data from them. I can go out to their board materials and I can see exactly what, what they're going to pay. When we look at graduate students um, and graduate tuition and our off-campus programs, we really look at those more as a market base. So what can a student afford and where do we land within that? Again, trying to stay below those, um, but using that more as a metric than using what the other Oregon publics do. Um, it is just it works a little bit better most of our on, online because our online programs our reach is further so we're looking beyond Oregon for those students so that's why we have Wiley do that analysis for us um, and that's why we look a little bit broader as far as um, the undergrad the graduate and the off-campus programs great thank you very nice presentation more questions good we're going to also talk about the budget coming up and then we'll talk more about possible enrollment changes and we mentioned that a little bit but i think we'll get into that deeper during the budget conversation okay um so the next agenda item is a first read of the 2023-24 room and board rates uh, and housing operation budget jeremy and david jones director of residents life will lead us through the presentation <clears throat> well, good morning, distinguished uh, trustees. We're not even on. Oh, now we're on. Okay, my apologies. Well, good morning again. It's uh, my honor to be uh, sitting with you today and talking about our room and dining rates and our overall residence life programs and some of the things that we've got coming before us. And uh, don't have. Uh, yeah. Jeremy doesn't have a presentation, um, so you'll want to pull your materials up from the agenda and just follow along in the memo that he prepared. Yes. So intentionally just kind of wanted to really focus on the documents at hand to kind of see the numbers and see the story there. And while you're bringing those documents, just kind of wanted to do a brief introduction of kind of where we're at and some of the things that we're seeing. Uh, a few months ago, I was meeting with the senior officers from our Oregon institutions, uh, public institutions, and you know, I said, well, you know, how do you all interact with your board of trustees and how do those conversations go? And they all kind of looked at me and their mouths kind of dropped open and they said, well, we really don't. And anytime we do, we have a script so when we come before them. And so it's, it's pretty directed and it's pretty scripted and really it's just trying to keep things on track. And it was again there that I recognized how fundamentally different Eastern Oregon University is and the personal relationships that we build, the authentic, uh, the authenticity that we do, and really the transparency where we have these conversations, we're a lot more integrated in who we are and the work that we do. And I really value that about Eastern Oregon University and appreciate uh, uh, Trustee Mendoza's introduction today. And it really resonated again with me about why EOU is special and what that is about and i reflected uh as i as i heard your presentation about our residential life program and what it does in onboarding our students here at eou and uh some of the things that not everybody knows is kind of the work that happens behind the scenes of just welcoming these students and building relationships and connecting with them on a one-on-one -on -one basis and everything that we come do comes back to our institutional mission and what we believe in here at eastern Oregon university and one of the things I'll share with you is how I kind of bundle this down to the most fundamental piece of what residence life does. 
And it, it actually came from a concept from a business book of all things, good to great, a few years back, we were all kind of going through that. I, I believe the board kind of was looking at that book as well. And one of the things we uh, we looked at is what is our economic engine in residential life? You know, what, what drives us? What really gives us the fuel to move forward, to do what we want to accomplish and to fulfill our mission? And we boiled it down to one thing, and it's knowledge per resident. Knowledge per resident. And the concept and the idea is the more knowledge that we have per resident, the better opportunities we're going to have to build programs and interactions that are meaningful and engaging for our students. And we do that every single day. And last night, I was training our, our next group of resident assistants in our SSCI 320 course, Introduction to Residence Life. And I got to re-engage that material. And it was fun to watch some of the students in the classroom say, you know what, Jeremy? I didn't know that, but I knew that because I could tell that the RAs were engaging me, that the staff were engaging me on a one-on-one -on -one personal basis at every single step of the way. And that made a meaningful difference on how I acclimated to Eastern Oregon University. And so again, affirming uh, the value, the, the unique experience that we have here at Eastern Oregon University and our unique approach to how we, how we do life and ultimately how we do business. As we're talking about finances today, uh, we're going to be talking about how that impacts our, our student narrative, our student story, and ultimately how we're creating a bigger experience overall. Uh, so in your, your materials, uh, you've likely kind of gone through some of the things that we're seeing here. And as a business, we're no different than any other other business. You know, times are expensive. Things are getting more expensive. Um, enrollment definitely impacts us. Uh, every 10 students can represent about $100,000 for me. So that fluctuates up or down in that regard. And as we look at our numbers, um, we, we can tell that we're on track and we're doing good things. But we also have to kind of have that balanced approach. And I really appreciate how Leanne was speaking about that in her presentation with tuition, that we got to be careful not to outprice ourselves in the market, but also not to undersell ourselves. So we're providing subpar services and we're having to restrict what we can accomplish across the board. And that's really that balance and that best value proposition that I really appreciate about Eastern Oregon University. So I do, um, I am want to look at the uh, the memo here specifically that I have here um, and kind of walk through some of that stuff as we kind of go through and highlight some of the, the key things that we're looking at. Um, in, our, in our guiding principles, we, we do, we want to keep that best value. As I mentioned, we are putting forth a, a recommendation for a 3% increase in our room and dining, uh, which is is going to be tricky to do. I, I'm not going to, you know, sugarcoat that. It's not going to be an easy thing to accomplish, but I think is the best thing to do for our students and our organization overall. And I'm looking at this in the long run, in the long picture, and, and we'll talk about the, the long-term kind of planning document that we were provided in this year's presentation that you may not have seen uh, historically to try and give you a sense of where, where we're trying to head long run. Uh, we do want to build and maintain uh, financial stability. Um, our, our, we're an auxiliary fund. We do need to keep savings on hand. There's no doubt about that. Um, going into um, past our savings and what we have cash on hand is not an option for us. And we know that that's something that we have to keep a close eye on. And at the same token, uh, we do need to invest in our facilities. We need to invest in our programs and we need to keep things going. And we'll talk a little bit some about the projects that we're working on in a little bit. And then uh, overall, we do have some forecasts. We're, we're forecasting a, a 3% or so labor increase. Uh, we'll see where that lands ultimately. And then uh, and Sodexo has indicated that they're going to be requesting an increase. Um, initially, they came to me and wanted a 7.9% increase. And I, I said, we're, we're going to have to sharpen the pencil. We're going to have to do better than that. Our, our students um, our, our students deserve better. And so we are finding ways to gain efficiencies in some of our catering and some of our other programs that are doing much better and, and try to offset some of our residential rates. And uh, to, to Trustee Mendoza's point, we want to we wanna take care of our students that live here and offset the cost expenses with other places that are kind of the uh, the the luxury items, right? Where we're, we're able to sell luxury items at higher prices and take care of our, our residential students here. So the occupancy forecasted, as you can see 
below is kind of an interesting conversation. And I don't know how the conversations go for you all, but it, it does sometimes seem like we get a lot of different information that has contrasting, uh, <laughs> contrasting data. Uh, this year, I've heard anything from, hey, we could be up 3 percent we could be down three percent and we're heavily freshman influenced in our in our res halls and, and that's why we kind of break away our freshman occupancy from our upperclassmen occupancy in that document and you could see this this current year uh, we were projected 221 uh, freshmen we got 187 and when uh, everything kind of settled down and so obviously that was a lot shorter than we wanted to be uh, but we were up on our upperclassmen and our upperclassmen have Housing has been, been performing quite well. Uh, we aren't at a waiting list with it, but it certainly as, is at a, a pushing a capacity route there with our upperclassmen housing, which is a good place to be. Uh, so knowing that we need to focus on our freshman recruiting and continue to maintain that high level, um, we just kind of budgeted on, hey, what if everything just reduces by 3%? It's a very conservative approach. Uh, but I do like to budget from a conservative place so I don't count my, uh, my chickens before they're hatched, as it were. And so that is something that we intentionally did as we kind of built this budget out, as I kind of looked at the forecast over this. Uh, now, the rest of our future planning does increase include planning for 3% increases along the way. And so that is something we want to work towards. We want to get to that place. Um, I want to increase by 3% students. I want to set that 3% kind of standard across the board. And I'd like to continue to grow in that as we had originally hoped. Sorry to interrupt. Yeah. Question. What's, what's our maximum uh, ability that we could do have we filled up? Yeah. So we would be about 432. And and that's kind of pushing most of our beds there, right in that realm there. And we do have a di some different things that we have to think about. Sometimes we've got ADA requests where a student only can be housed by themselves, or different things that kind of impacts capacity. Uh, so there are some th some things there. About seven percent of our students came to school this year with an emotional support animal. Uh, so again, those are other items that impact our space and our ability of how many people we can put in an area. Uh, but yes, that's, we can go much, much tighter, especially as we're competing with University of Oregon. I was talking with a student uh, two weeks ago or yeah, at our preview day, I guess that was just last week. And they were saying they just visited University of Oregon and they saw the room that they were proposed to stay in. And they're like, wow, there was just zero square footage per student. And then as they came here, they came into our, our, our res halls and they saw what we were offering and the experience were there. And they said, there's just no comparison. Uh, this is fantastic. Now I should say we just updated our showrooms and we uh, had real deals come in and Janet Camp came in and helped us decorate. So I, I have to say that probably had a little something to do with uh, our local flair of decorating our, our res halls and, and building out that experience. But yeah, in terms of capacity, we are continuing to plan for what would it take to grow incrementally. And for the Board of Trustees, a few years back, we did do a pro forma on what that would look like if we built new. And this was pre-COVID. And we realized that we would have to be about 80 to 90% full day one just to service the debt. And so we've got to know right off the bat that we can fill whatever it is that we have if we're going to debt service it. And so um, we we have to be very strategic about where we build, when we build, and what that looks like. Now, the other piece of the puzzle there uh, that you're, you're kind of keying into is how do we maintain our current facilities while keeping them full? And so, for instance, this summer, we're doing a $1.4 million renovation on all of it all, and we're going to be doing the windows and the EFIS exterior on that, which will refresh up and will build years of integrity into that building, which is awesome and we're very excited about. Uh, but $1.4 million is a lot of money. And to be able to make sure that we're budgeting appropriately so that we can continue investing in these facilities. But we're also spending a little bit more so that we can get it done in the summer so that we don't impact the student experience. And the student experience is premier to us. And we, we went round and round on this in terms of could we do construction while students are in there? And my position is no. And so knowing that that was my position and kind of where we're working with that, we had to be very creative in doing that. Now we're gonna to have to continue to do that with North and Doherty and Eocene and find ways to invest in the renovation. And our long-term uh, document of our, our planning document includes all those renovations, but it's gonna require 
to stay on track and to continue to spend money but not spend too much money at once, right? <laughs> and so it's that that balanced line that we're looking at in capital repair and renewal and creating that ex student experience. So yeah, great questions. Thank you for, for, for directing me. Uh, in terms of our, our current cost competitors, I did provide a diagram of where we are currently laying there. Um, you'll see uh, OIT is slightly below us. Uh, their facilities are nowhere in comparison to ours, but they are slightly below us. And what the comparison is, is for a middle-priced room with a middle-priced meal plan. And so it's not the, the least expensive. So our least expensive option does beat OIT at this point in time with a triple room and a mini plan. Uh, but again, we wanted to compare apples to apples and find that, that place across the board. Uh, as I spoke with our senior housing officers, Everybody is trying to keep their increases down, and there are talks from anywhere from two to seven percent increases in housing and dining services across our public institutions across the state. Uh, wherever people can, they are trying to keep that low, but where people are strapped and they have no options, they're raising as high as seven percent, um, you know, trying to cover the cost and, and work into this new field. Uh, I think our other competitors are are dealing expansion and contraction in ways that we aren't having to we're we're somewhat in the ballpark of where we've been for a lot of years so we're able to kind of expand and contract much much easier and adapt to our current circumstances much better so with a three percent increase it would represent about eighty thousand dollars to housing and twenty thousand dollars twenty four thousand dollars to our dining program overall a hundred thousand dollars increase in revenue uh, big picture, you'll see our budget does include us going about five hundred uh, or so thousand dollars into our um, into our cash on hand, and so I know that that's what we're doing, and part of it is that that big investment into Alicut Hall that we're doing right now. Uh, we do plan to spread that out over time, but this year it does represent uh, us going into our cash on hand and making sure that we do that. And we've been intentionally saving for this for years. It's been part of my presentation that that's what we're saving for that's what we're doing for so we knew this was coming uh and this is just the time to execute on that because if we don't do it now we're going to be in a world of hurt and maybe in a hunt hall situation uh years down the road if we don't invest in our facilities now and that's why we're kind of making that that decision at this season so that kind of leads us through the document i do want to pause there and check in with the group and see what questions that does provoke Jeremy, very great, very good presentation. Um, impressed with your strategic uh, thought process on all these things. Even like the 3% below, then potentially getting 3% up with the 6% variance that likely allows you to do even more mm -hmm. investments into our assets. So there's a lot of things that you did that, that impressed me. Um, and even how you shared in your communication and your approach. So I was really impressed with you. Well done. Um, Sodexo, is it wrapped up or not wrapped up so that that 3% is clear? I didn't get that sense of whether you Correct. finished that or not. Uh, I've had conversations with the district manager. We ha are in transition with our current general manager, and so there's a vacancy there. Our district manager has understood that I'm requesting 3% and that if he comes anywhere above that, that it's going to have contract consequences. And he, he said he is comfortable with that, and he understands the, the, the circumstance there and the kind of the the position we're holding there. Additionally, we are going into RFP process in this next season. This is our last year of contract with Sodexo. And so they are highly motivated to make this year work really well for us as we come into our RFP for this next year. I'm confident that they will not come in above that. Okay. And if it does, then it, there's a potential things would change. Yeah, but I, there would. The, and just like Leanne mentioned, the last place that we would try to hit is our, our increases to the students. And so it very well may come in catering increases or at the door prices or our summer conference prices. We have a lot of different other levers that we can pull that can offset revenue differences like that. And yeah, we're confident that we can make that work. Um, yeah, excellent. Uh, presentation, Jeremy. Thank you so much. I've I've uh, been in those residences, and they they really are wonderful. Um, can you talk a little bit about the upper class occupancy rise and some of the 
reasons for that? And can we expect that to continue? Yeah, great question. Uh, we were pleasantly surprised when we saw how Olicut Hall in EOC and court. Since we have two uh, different uh, properties that we, we use with our upperclassmen students in EOC and courts, we house about 32 students in our off-campus apartments. And since we renovated those, since we got those back up, they've been popular. They've been full. And it just is, uh, the students like it down there. The price point works for them. And we don't have any debt service on those. And so we're just able to invest in the property. And it just is pretty practical to make work down there. So I've been really happy with how that's been performing. And that's something that we just know the students like. I don't know how many more of them we could build. And so we are floating the idea of what if we just built one at a time and, and tried to incrementally increase uh, on that. And that is something we are examining and looking at a possibility uh, in the near future, uh, hopefully sooner rather than later, and trying to wrap our heads around what that might look like. Now, all look at all, we house about 90 students over there, and that is a completely different experience. It's on campus, it's an apartment style, and it's basically you have an interior hallway, you have a lobby, which is really nice in the winter when it's cold outside and you just want a place to hang out and watch a movie with friends, but you also don't want to do it in your suite. And so the, the space is becoming more and more attractive to students. We're seeing more and more students select into that, which is really encouraging to us that that particular profile was interesting to our students this year. Uh, I don't know how many more we could, what we would need to build or expand for, but we are happy being at capacity there or pushing on that capacity. And we do need to understand that population a little better. So there's a lot of questions we're still holding as we're looking at that particular demographic, uh, especially as we had a smaller freshman population this year. Will we see that decrease next year as we have a smaller population to recruit from for our, our upperclassmen population? And so we're, we're a little bit uh, gun shy in the sense that let's see if we can build a pattern here of, of capacity at these and see what this looks like post COVID. Uh, we're still learning a lot about our students and how they want to inter interact with community and how they don't post COVID. And we've got a lot to learn still. Mm -hmm. Jeremy, thanks again. Uh, I'm so impressed with your approach to how we're taking care of students. I have one question or, or general question is, and I'm having a hard time finding this on your slides where they are, but I remember when you go through our, I'm so impressed I've saved up and we can do this capital improvements and, and the amount of cash that I put notes down here, but I can't seem to find it on this where that is, but it's impressive how much cash on hand you've been able to build up and also now use, but the fact that we're gonna still have cash on hand. So can you go through that somehow without seeing it on this? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, thank you. Um, and under the the budgets there, uh, you can see at the very bottom is the ending cash after bond payment, what we were looking at. And our budget was to have uh, $3.2 million cash on hand this year, and next year, $2.2 .2 million. So going in uh, backwards on that, uh, which actually looks a little strange right there, so I'm not sure <laughs> uh, what... Uh, what that is, I, I may need to do that. But essentially, we've been saving for either expansion or renovation. And we know that expansion has been kind of pushed out a little bit or that, that marker has been pushed out a little bit. And so we know that we've kind of moved into that renovation say, setting of things. We did a capital repair and renewal assessment. Oh, gosh, about a recently, I can't, sometime in, in the midst of COVID there. And what we're looking at is we're looking at about $15 million worth of work that needs to be done over the next 10 or so years, 15 years. And we can expand and contract that and we can look at different things. It just has consequences for everything. So if we do a construction project right now that we think will cost us two million right now, may cost us four million in three years, or prices might get better and it might go down, hopefully. I don't know. I, I, I still am a little bit hopeful that some of our construction pr prices will uh, come down at some point here. But we are taking a long-term approach of like, yeah, we've got this big dollar expense and we want to chip away at it a little at a time, uh, still keep our cash on hand. Um, certainly, you know, our annual budget is you know, somewhere around $3.5 million. So I don't like the idea of going 
too much down lower. Uh, but in the event where we can see that, yeah, it's a pretty safe maneuver and we're just calculating risk with everything and trying to see what our risk appetite is. Um, right now, this represents a, a pretty low risk appetite and I don't see it as a very risky move. Uh, we, if we ran into bigger problems next to our enrollment, uh, it takes a hit, we'll need to adjust our, our strategy next year uh, to, relative to that experience. Yeah, great, thank you. I wrote a note down that at the end of your projections, you're, we're gonna have 2.3 million in cash once you get done, with is, that, is that right? Uh, at the end of this next year, that's yeah, our current budget. Projecting. And that is based on a 3% decrease in student enrollment and then a 3% increase in our room and dining rates and then ultimately our investment in the Olicate Hall there. So, yeah. Yeah, A naive uh, reaction to that is it's fantastic that you've got that much cash. And is it, I would wonder whether we might want to spend a little more on things that need to be done. That's, that's very naive approach. And I'm, I'm happy to just make a couple of yeah. comments, Chair Stevens. Um, just a reminder about the auxiliary, auxiliaries, um, they are self-support, so uh, they have to fund their entire operation and all of their facilities um, through their fund. So um, I would I would echo what Jeremy said earlier on. We have um, intentionally built reserves there because there is a significant amount of investment that needs to go back in the facilities. This first million and a half-ish is just the beginning. So I, I um, two million sounds like a lot until the projects are a million a piece. Right. Um, I mean, in, in reality, there's a significant amount of investment that needs to go back into the facilities. So I think you'll continue to see that cash um, decline as we put it back into the facilities. Yeah. Well, thank you. You're doing a great job. And I would add to, we are looking at a long-term strategy where we space things out intentionally. So if I tried to take on all these projects at once, I wouldn't be able to provide continuity of services. And so, for instance, if I said, hey, let's do North and Doherty exterior this summer too, that would impact all of our summer conferences, our football camps, our MedQuest, our educational camps, and all the things that we're running during the summer that continue to feed the funnel, uh, both with cash flow and with future students and recruitment. And if the football team says, hey, I can't run two, two football camps this summer because Jeremy can't house us. Uh, he's going to have a negative impact on his program in turn, which will include that. And for those that don't know, our football program brings in 30 freshmen to our residence halls every single year, like clockwork. And so if I don't support them and what they're doing uh, and provide a continuity of services, we can get in some trouble. There are some places where we probably could spend a little bit more aggressively, uh, but at the same token, though, I, I'm a pretty conservative person. I, I spent 10 years at the community college, and um, I know that the hard times can come, and I'm prepared to weather them if they do. I just really wanted to say how much I appreciate the way you handle that whole program, Jeremy. Um, uh, you're amazing. So mm -hmm. just wanted to throw that in. I know everybody else has said that as well, but just wanted to... Um, endorse you because yeah. you do an excellent job thank you and your personality is perfect for those students mm. so thank, thank you, you. Um, great other questions or comments well we're a little ahead of schedule but do you mind if i share just really quick in oh, closing please. yeah it would be great thank you for your kind remarks uh it's definitely been a hard couple of years but it's really meaningful to hear your positive feedback and just uh that you acknowledge all the hard work that's gone in so thank you for those kind comments it it uh it's well received well, once again, thank you so much. Great. We are a little ahead of schedule uh, on the uh, uh, on the on the paper. Here. It does talk about us uh, taking a break at eleven thirty, but I think it was supposed to have been ten thirty, maybe. But we we I think we should go ahead and take a break at this point, and let, why don't we come back at twenty five after? How's that sound? Does that sound good to you, Leah? Yeah. Good. Okay. Let's take a break then. Thanks.
good break. Um, okay, so uh, our next item of discussion is a first read of the 2023-24 student health fee proposal and budget overview. Lacey uh, Caprillo, Vice President of Student Affairs, will lead us through the presentation. Thanks, Lacey. Hello, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, so today, um, this is, well, this 2022-23 is talking about the budget and the process, but it is really talking about um, the, the budget for 2023-24. Um, so, but this does span the work and things that happen over this year. Um, so, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to do an overview. You had the materials um, also included when it came to the cover sheet, as well as this um, presentation, and then a memo where I go into a little bit more detail. Um, hopefully you had an opportunity to reference that. <clears throat> so the first thing that's really important, I'd love to get a concept of what do we mean by student health and the importance of student health on our campus. Um, to understand, um, and I'll say this multiple times in this presentation, that our student health fee covers a large um, section of services and resources for our students. And, and when we talk about student health, we're both talking about um, physical and mental health, as well as the other support services we have on our campus. Um, and when we think about the mission of EOU, um, we're serving the whole student. <clears throat> and for students to be able to sit in the classroom and learn, um, we need them to be able to um, focus and not be worried about maybe um, a breakup that has happened, or maybe they have been struggling with some mental health issues for a while, or maybe they just recently were diagnosed with diabetes and need that kind of continuous care. And so that's something to think about when we think about retention and success of our students, their physical and mental health is a huge part of that. And um, you can imagine, and, and I know I've said this to all of you before, <clears throat> if you're stressed out or if you have something going on for you within, within your home or personal life or medically, um, it's really hard to sit and pay attention in a meeting, right? Can you imagine trying to sit in a classroom and learn, right? I, I think that's really important. So for us, um, that mission of that physical and health, mental health, that well-being of our students, we want to provide quality care and affordable health care and prevention and that wellness education. So that's those other parts of it, is that wellness education that we do on our campus. We want it to be affirming and respectful and compassionate and an inclusive environment. We want to help students heal, grow, and reach their goals. And this is all also through when we think about an equity lens in the work that we do, but that's kind of the mission statement when we think about student health and counseling, the physical and mental health side. <clears throat> so when we talk about services provided, there's that medical service, so that physical health. <clears throat> we have mental health counseling and access to health trainers through referral from the health center. <clears throat> And things that are outside of some of those services um, that students maybe don't see because it's a little bit behind the scenes is the expertise that we get with those from our student health services, the physical health, as well as our mental health. Um, particularly, it was very important um, when we were doing work with COVID. We had um, Dr. Wiggins, who is our director of our, our physical health center, our student health center, her expertise in helping the institution understand how best to deal with COVID. Uh, she was able to provide um, testing and other things and step up in a different way, um, helping the institution be better informed when it comes to the work that we did around COVID, as well as our mental health providers we have on our campus. As you all know, you know um, Dr. Marianne Weaver, who is a phenomenal psychologist and has decades and decades of, of experience um, serving um, students who are um, and uh, college students and the expertise that she provides for us and her other <clears throat> mental health providers when it comes to better understanding what's happening with our students, helping faculty member understand what their students are going and talking with coaches and athletics, putting on programs and trainings. And so there's a lot of things that are behind the scenes. Um, also part of that is our behavioral assessment team. Um, and that's where, of course, um, you're familiar where we're bringing together um, key key individuals on our campus who have an expertise and trying to understand the experience of a student who's struggling and try to provide the best support possible. So there are lots of other things that are connected to the student health fee. But when it comes to direct service for students where things that they feel and see and can touch, these are the main components of that. And again, the behavioral, we call it intervention team, assessment team type concept. <clears throat> so <clears throat> every, um, 
a department and program within student affairs has their own objectives. And so help students grow as a whole, as whole people, right? That's a huge goal. Um, equip the campus community to assist students. That's the piece that I spoke to about, about how they're providing support and guidance and their expertise to our community to best understand our students. Um, and then create a safe and confidential space for students. And that's really important. Um, hopefully you had an opportunity in the middle of the, the pandemic um, when we talk about, <clears throat> uh, you know, how we can serve students and be creative. Uh, you know, our counselors did a counselors in quarantine video series that they had for a year. Um, they did quarantine together. That's where the joke was, uh, counselors in quarantine. Um, but that creative way of how they connect with the community. So it goes just beyond all the services. And then that easy access to quality health care. I think that's a really important piece. You all access your own um, medical medical care, and you know how difficult it can be sometimes. You know how difficult it can be, particularly if you need lab work or if you need an appointment. Um, you know, how many times have you called and said, well, um, we can get you in, um, you know, this happened to me. Um, I called a month ago and like, we can get you in in May, right? And I'm calling in March. And, and that's just the reality. And so I think that's something too, is we really want that quality of care, but also care that's provided by professionals that understand um, our student population and they do, right? So the challenges, and I think this is really important to share, budget deficit. So we do have budget deficit um, because it is a student fee funded, meaning that it ebbs and flows depending on how many students we have as fee paying. <clears throat> there are increased cost of overhead and personnel. That's not that's experienced all across the board, um, and particularly in the medical field, um, you see those increases as well. Um, and just the cost of doing business, that low enrollment that I spoke to earlier. And then the challenge of maintaining quality service and access as we manage the budget deficit that we are experiencing. <clears throat> so it's important to know before I have my ask of what I want to recommend, we increase the fee to. It was really important for us to understand um, from a student perspective what's important to them when it comes to student health on our campus, some recommendations. We wanted to be very on and honest and open with them about the budget deficit that we were experiencing to know that we're going to have to do some things differently and we wanted to have a better sense of what are the types of things they would be okay with um, and maybe even some creative ideas and they had very creative ideas. So we did a student advisory group. We had 15 students who were part of that. And we met with them four times over the fall and in the beginning of the winter term. And we had these different groups um, represented from that group. So we did an info line to invite all students with a greater student population. We targeted ASCOU, residence life students, athletics, students from the multicultural center would be considered to be served by the multicultural center, and then OHSU students on the EOU campus. So making sure we, are, we were connecting with our partners who do utilize those services. Um, we also did some student focus groups. So we had our advisory board that met. We had focus groups. Um, that focus group I did was with ASCOU. And then we did a student survey to get some feedback from the students. And the above students um, and those student groups are the ones that we reached out to to complete that survey. So what did we find when we met with the students and got their feedback? One, um, the importance of physical health services on our campus. They let us know that it is incredibly important to them. The second piece is they want to make sure that whatever we do, we limit barriers for students. And what I mean by that um, is there's lots of things you can charge for. You have to be very careful when you charge for things because it does create potentially create a barrier. Um, we want students to have as much um, free access to healthcare outside of paying that fee as possible. Um, our, our peer institutions, or not peer, but our, our fellow Oregon publics, many of them charge for, for services, so a student will pay a fee and then also be charged for services and then also be charged for not showing up, things like that. And so if you put a price on particular services, that does create a barrier for a student. And we don't want a student not getting the care they need because they feel like they can't afford it. Um, and so that creates limitations for us trying to meet that need um, by being very careful of what do we charge for and what do we not charge for? What do we need to subsidize for the students? And so the students both agreed on that, understand that. And so that's something that was important to them as access is very important. Um, so the cost of treatment, when don't limit the barriers there. Um, limit services, they understood we might need to do, but not eliminate them, right? Um, it's important to have the services. And they're willing to increase the cost and decrease number of hours so we can keep the services on our campus. And then they're like, well, we need to know more about it. There's a lot of students who didn't know more about the physical health side of, um, of what occurs on our campus. And so that was great feedback that we received from them that um, 
once they knew about it and understood the value of it, they were grateful for it. So physical services. Um, so when it comes to the physical services that we offer, it is a contract with OHSU. <clears throat> um, right now we're in contract negotiations. And so there's a lot of back and forth going, going through as we figure out how can we best serve students? How can we keep the cost down um, to where we feel that we can, as affordable, um, we can get ourselves out of that budget deficit. Um, I did reach out to other medical services providers in the county, um, Grand Ronde Hospital, which is a phenomenal partner, and we've had fabulous conversations with them. Um, there's limitations on what they can provide for us because they also have limitations too when it comes to providers and things like that. But I will, what I will share with you that the conversations did open up just great partnership and understanding of how we best can serve and support um, students and the community as a whole. So I do see um, that we'll continue to have um, a good relationship and kind of having um, other support services for students as they engage with Grand Rapids Hospital. So I think it really opened the doors for um, other things outside of meeting the direct physical needs that we have for our physical services. But um, it was great dialogue, but everyone has their limitations. And then I looked at local and regional clinics um, and there's not capacity there um, too. So kind of say, okay, where else can we get services? How else can we do that? So we, I did do that, that research. Uh, so I wanna give some historical context for OHSU. We have been in partner with them for over 20 years. Uh, that's meaningful. Um, it's meaningful to me um, because there's a good understanding about um, how to serve students. Uh, they have been phenomenal at hiring phenomenal people. Um, you all have had an engage engagement with um, Dr. Heather Wiggins and you know that she's phenomenal. Um, so I feel like they have an understanding of what, what you need in a director and a service provider who can provide that good service to students. Um, they average about 870 visits per year. And then um, they pr provide long-term service such as diabetic management care. So it's not just like a regular walk-in clinic. Um, they do manage. We um, have had some students that have had some pretty, um, I'm not going to say significant in the sense of um, the student having less struggle, but um, uh, significant um, health issues where they needed long-term management. And we were able for the family and the student got a hold of us and explained to us what's going on. Um, this is before they even arrived on campus. And we were able to connect them with, um, with our, our student health services, um, be able to get all the information we need to be able to provide that support to the students, be able to share the appropriate information and be able to help manage that student's care um, so they could be successful. Um, and so I think that those are the types of things that are so important is that um, even before the, the year started, we were able to make sure that that student and that family knew that um, we'd be able to do our best to support that student. So my proposal. Um, here is um, the fee schedule. Um, I arrived in 2017 um, and um, you can see here, we just had um, no increases. Everything stayed the same. And um, when I arrived, I started to put us on a fee increase schedule because that was necessary. It's important also to know that some interesting things happened and when it comes to change in um, insurance and how the budget um, got fun got funding. Uh, so I think it was about 2011 or 2012 around there. Um, don't don't quote me on it to say around that time. Um, there was that change in uh, the Affordable Care Act where um, students would be able to stay on their families health insurance um, and they're old I think it was 25. Um, and so the institution used to have health insurance that students would, would pay for health insurance. That actually generated a lot of funds. Um, that ended, and as you can see here, nothing changed when it comes to fee structure, anything. And so that kind of got us to a place where um, there was some lacking uh, financial um, health within the budget. So when I took it on, I started to have that fee schedule, um, made some difficult decisions when it came to positions within um, student health, and we started to get ourselves out of the hole doing great and then COVID hit, and we found ourselves back in the hole. And so um, with this, um, when it comes to the increase, it's important to know that I recommend we go to $16 as an increase, so it'd be $230. Um, and this is if, if um, you know, flat enrollment growth, right? So utilizing flat enrollment growth, um, I'm, I'm being very conservative in that. I think that that's important. Um, in the document that I provided to you, there's that comparison about other institutions. Um, we're still one of the lowest, but remember they also charge fees for things that we don't. And so it's not apples to apples, it's apples to oranges. 
Um, so one, it keeps us in line with um, keeping below the 5% increase in tuition and fees. So the student health fee is wrapped up in all of that. And so there's limitations on how much we can increase this fee based on that. Um, it puts us a path to budget stability. And then it remains lower than the cost for health services when compared to other public um, universities. So I'm gonna open up for questions. And you know, I know this is kind of your first read on it. Um, so please, uh, I look forward to the questions to help you can dive in deeper, have the understanding that you need um, to make the, the decisions that, that I know you need to make. Hi, Lacey. Hi. John. Um, on that, maybe it's the third slide. There was one that said uh, limit service is not eliminate and yeah. my first thoughts were can you give me a, an example of some of the services we would limit and not yeah. eliminate? Yeah. So what um let's see. We'll go back. There you go. Yeah, we'll go back to that slide. Yeah. So we're not looking at um eliminating different types of services. We are decrease we're gonna need to decrease the hours. Which, which are the services though is what I'm trying to get at. Yeah, um, so some of that is, do we not do labs? Do we not, you know, is there, do we stop doing diabetic management care? Things like that. So it'd be changing of how we service our students. And um, based on the one, this understanding what we need for students to be successful, that was at the, at, you know, the very top of, of, of the work that we do um, and thinking about how we move forward, um, not eliminating and how we do services, just decreasing the hours in which we do them. Yeah. Um, we looked at, do we charge for some things? And we realized one, if we charge for some things, there's that barrier, but also some of things aren't gonna generate that much revenue. So why even put the barrier in place, right? Like is it? And so what we really focused on when I worked with um, OHSU is that um, can we then limit the hours to service? And that's what we were really looking for that we're not gonna be eliminating things. We're not gonna be putting um, barriers for students and that cost for treatment. We're really just gonna decrease the number of hours. So I'm, I'm imagining that some of the things that may be high hours might be less hours or some of the things that really don't happen to a lot. Mm -hmm. do Last one is, I just did for me the quick math on 214 to 230. Um, that's about a 7.5% increase, just in case. I didn't know if you were trying to say that or. But I saw the in line of keeping below the five. Yeah, so that is added into all the other fees and not sixteen dollars. When we think about tuition and the other fees, keeps it below that five percent. So my increase may be more than five percent, yeah. but when it's added into all the things that are like considered to be part of that category, it keeps it below five percent. Yeah. Anybody else have questions? Um, this is probably just more of a quick answer question. I don't know. I just noticed uh, kind of a pattern with the 15 and the 950, and I was just kind of curious um, what's some of the history of why we chose those amounts. And then, because, I mean, then the 16 stands out because it yeah. falls out of that pattern. Yeah. So let me um, go back to there. And I, yeah. So when I um, first started down the, the the road of increasing the fee, um, the first thing that I had to do is understand, I wanted to make it um, smaller increases. I had to make a larger jump that first year because we were so out of sync. Because we had one, two, three, four, five, six years of not increasing the fee and everything else went up significantly. Um, and, then, and then we had no revenue from insurance. And so it just, I mean, it just depleted it. Uh, and so the idea was I would do smaller increase. So I do one very jump and then have smaller increases. Well, um, there you have my $15, my 950 doing that smaller increase. It also allowed us to make sure that um, when we, um, we were below that, that 5%. So I had to be, so some of it is I have an, an idea, but then if we're raising something else, I have to lower this down, right? So that's the, the other types of things I have to consider. Um, and um, during, uh, and then you'll see I went back to 15, and part of that um, was that um, COVID support and what we're going to need to get through COVID. Um, and so that 15, and then the 950, 
So if you remember, I think, Laura, I want to make sure I'm correct, Leanne, that was when we went flat with tuition. In 2021, 22, that was flat with tuition, right? Was that flat with tuition? Yes. Yes. Okay. Thank you. So because we went flat with tuition, I wanted to make sure that we honored that concept of we don't want to raise the cost of things too high in the middle of COVID. And so I felt even though I knew because of COVID and what was going on, we needed a little bit more. I wanted to honor the fact that we were telling students, we don't want to increase the fees to you too much. So for us to say, we're going to keep it flat. And then for me to go to everyone and say, well, since it's flat, that gives me so much percentage to increase it, right? I wanted to honor that, but I still need to increase it enough to try to cover as much as we possibly could based on that, right? Um, and then um, when we came out of COVID, I realized we needed to do that work and we need to get that um, back up in that 15, that 16. The 16, if we continue to do good work and good work in the sense of enrolling our students, um, the, it will be lower amounts given, right? So I had my plan, we get out the hole and then COVID hits and things hit. So that kind of explains the logic between each of those increases, hopefully. This, yeah, yeah. All right, yeah, thank you for the presentation. Could you talk a little bit more specifics about uh, the hours of the uh, health services open, when students can be seen, yep. are they seeing a physician, are they seeing a nurse practitioner or a nurse, and what happens in the weekend, what happens in the evenings, yep. things like that? Yep. Yeah, so um, they are seeing um, a nurse practitioner, and that is um, uh, Heather Wiggins, and um, and so we had a, a, a secondary a secondary provider that also um, uh, I believe she just graduated with a nurse practitioner, but it was at that level. Um, and so that typically is who the main providers um, on our campus is those nurse practitioners. Um, I think uh, for me, they also happen to be very um, uh, experienced nurse practitioners. So um, they are, you know, some of the most phenomenal medical professionals. That's why I think we're very lucky in our- Do they, uh, yeah. at times nurse practitioners need a physician backup? Do they have a physician backup? If they have a case that they want to- Dr. So, so um, they don't. So maybe I'm inaccurate of all the credentials that they have. So they don't need a medical backup. So maybe I'm missing a piece. I, I don't mean that they need it, but if they wanted it, do they have medical backup? Do they have? Sometimes it'll be something coming up that they need some more help with. Yeah. yeah. Oh, um, so I would say that that's that's the benefit of being part of OHSU is that our medical those medical professionals are fully integrated into OHSU and oftentimes teach courses, thank you, oftentimes teach courses um, uh, within OHSU as well. And so we have um, kind of the resources of OHSU at our fingertips and they do as well. Yeah, does that help to answer? Yes, and, and so and when are they open? What are the hours are open? So um, typically they're open um, four days a week, um, partly on Friday. Um, there needs to be some admin administrative time um, and so when students, um, students would go to a clinic or to the emergency room and if they have anything after that. Okay. And then they, they have to, take, they, they take care of the cost of that, right? With... No, they, it would be through, um, uh, if a student has insurance or, um, you know, if it's an emergency, um, our health center can't do it anyways. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. So it's, it's something that if it's something that a student can't, um, uh, and so, yeah, students would still need to, to do emergency services if they needed that. They do it on their, yeah, yeah. they take care of themselves. Okay. Mm -hmm. And I couldn't quite understand what you said when, uh, uh, as far as the hospital here go, did you say they didn't have the capacity? I couldn't quite understand the terminal. Well, um, you know, um, I had a very open conversation with them about you know, our needs and what some of the things and, and some of the ideas we had were, could they provide, have providers and actually still keep them in our facility? Um, I do know that there is options for us when it comes to being able to utilize the clinics, but that would be an, potentially an increased cost to our students. Um, so that is possible. Um, so some of it was how could we bring um, providers um, here on campus and not can there's limitations because those providers are needed as other locations. Yeah. It would just be interesting to me to see if you had a quote from them to see uh, where that would uh, be in relationship to OHSU's. Uh, yeah, I, I, I have quotes um, about particular types of services, and um, those would be more for the students. Um, and so students would be paying per visit. And so, um, 
it's it's it, it's a different it would be different structure for the students to pay yeah thank you yes thanks for the questions and your knowledge about medical <laughs> is helpful yeah so asking a great question so uh could you help me understand so we contract with ohsu yes so uh are they increasing our contract amount with them or how does that work oh, if we don't have... increase this fee to that is that jeopardizing the contract with ohsu and um, what they provide we wouldn't be able to afford it um so um their costs increased just like our costs increased um, we had a large jump um, in the middle of COVID uh, because of um, the Pay Equity Act. Act, um, and so when they did the Pay Equity Act, um, the salaries of those professionals went up. And um, I do believe people need to be paid equitably. Um, and so I think that that's that's just part of doing business is their cost increase, our cost increase, and then trying to meet that need. So uh, that's not in jeopardy because. One of the reasons I'm asking that is because we all know that the clinics are packed, just like what you said. So I would think if we were in jeopardy of losing that contract with them, that that would be really detrimental to our university students. So I just I just wanted to make sure that this fee made it so that we could continue the contract with OHS. By, making, by limiting some of the hours, we do have to make an adjustment so that what the contract costs and what we can afford match up we couldn't continue the same exact services there was no way we could meet we could meet that but i think ohsu and i were just working together to try to get where we could get somewhere where we are able to to create the best balance we possibly could and does this include the mental health aspect oh, yes. of this well? so when you think about the fee um and the budget the budget is the contract we have with ohsu it's the salary of of our um, mental health professionals it is part of the administrative fee that you get from the office of student affairs and the management it's trainers um it's um you know supplies and software and things like that so the fee um pays for all of that thanks you're welcome yeah thanks so much i know we're, we've had a great presentation we've moved along a little bit extra so do we need anything else to close with at this point yeah i was going to just do one more yeah. Probably big picture operations or logistics for me, then, then I'll move on. Um, 160 student days, roughly, and it's in operation during the students and yep. time. How many hours per day exactly is it open? Um, so it's typically, um, I mean, they take a, there is a bit of a lunch break, but it's, it's majority, majority of the, the, the day. Obviously, say, Eight, eight o'clock to four o'clock or eight o'clock yeah, to three o'clock. About that, yeah. Yeah. And then the other parts were, you know, at, at the eight hundred seventy visits um, per year, whether it's mental health or other health issues, it's like, um, and I'm just saying, one hundred sixty days open, it's around five and a half visits per day, and is and is that like the standard, or should more be seen or less be seen? What's the, the yeah. In comparison to other universities, is five and a half visits per day or six visits mm -hmm. or five visits per day the standard? Yeah, I don't, I don't know the standard of that. Um, I don't know the standard of that. It's really hard um, to to get those standards because every institution is doing it differently, and so you have larger institutions that have their own medical center, right? And then you have smaller institutions that are actually a few of them are contracting out with a completely um, off-site medical provider, and so. Um, you know, to find someone who matches up with us well is a little difficult. Um, our services um, for a typical um, uh, medical service, we actually provide a little bit more medical than other institutions would. They may not do diabetic uh, management treatment and things like that. Um, and so um, I think for me, the question I have is, is that meeting our students' needs? You know, is that enough? Um, because part of it, they also do have administrative duties as well. Um, and so I know that the way that they've been able to manage that is kind of an ebb and flow um, sometimes when we have, you know, um, flu season and things like that. 
um, they might be seeing students a little bit more. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they do telehealth too, um, to make sure they're managing that. Um, you know, so there's some very smart things they can do in, in supporting students and seeing more students if we need to. Yeah, but I don't, I don't have that. Um, yeah, th thanks. Thanks so much. We, we, we're already over time here a little okay. bit, so, but it's been a great presentation. Thanks for what you're doing, but we, we're going to have to move on. Okay, so this is a fiscal uh, uh, 24 draft preliminary operating budget is, a, is our next item for discussion. This will be, include a brief overview of all major funds. Leanne will walk us through the budgets. And uh, this is a very important part of our, of our meeting. Uh, thank you. Thank you all. Um, appreciate uh, another opportunity to talk to you about the budget and the tuition and how all of those things interconnect with each other. Um, I will be a bit mindful of time because I do want you to um, have an opportunity to hear from John Garlitz on the capital plan um, since we missed that the last the last go around. So um, luckily, a couple of items um, with the budget, with room and board, and also student health, you've already heard about. So I'll probably skim through those at the budget piece of it. Uh, Trustee Mendoza, you were you were spot on about the the culture at Eastern and and how we move forward um, with the relationships that we have and we build um, that that culture makes me less nervous and less anxious about the budget process, even though we have a budget challenge, um, even though I'm going to present a not balanced budget, which just causes me extreme pain um, for the second year in a row. Um, I'm confident that the campus can come together and, and pull us out of their pro the issues that we currently have. I'm also thankful to the leadership that we've had along the way, um, that as we built up a fund balance that was fairly significant, um, that we made prudent decisions. Um, we didn't just decide to spend that along the way um, because we have that now to fall back on. So thank you for your, your remarks this morning. Um, they gave me a great segue into the budget, the budget piece of it. I'm going to walk you through um, just the, where we're at right now with the budget. Again, when I come back in May, I will present a preliminary budget for your recommendation to the full board for approval. And then I'll be back in October with a final budget for FY24. Um, we are continuing to look out as far as we can. Um, little little bit of a challenge right now, um, waiting for our funding for this biennium. But we're always, um, I don't want you to ever think that we are not planning two to four to six years out, um, even longer um, when we're looking at the budget and the impacts and tuition and, and state funding and all of those things. Um, at the end, we'll talk a little bit about closing the gap and how we do that and what our um, strategies would be going forward. Um, just a reminder, um, throughout all of this, we've made significant investments in the campus, even um, with the COVID and coming out of the, the post-pandemic and enrollment challenges, um, we've continued to invest in new programs, people, technology, student engagement. Some of that's been on grants. Um, some of it's been out using our fund balance. Um, some of it's just been standing up the new programs. Um, those investments, um, we say this year after year, but those investments, it, it, we have to execute on those. Um, so those new programs that we're bringing online, we've got to bring in the enrollment to go with them to support the expenditure side of it. Um, we face some some uphill battles with the state funding model. Um, working through those challenges and how do we rebase ourselves with the the new model and how it works. Um, and then we're always having to work with our cost escalations, most of which seventy to eighty percent of our expenses are in personnel costs. Um, we have two unions, um, so those are locked in costs. Um, we have PEB and PERS, um, those are also fairly locked in. We don't have a lot of opportunities um, to change those without reducing personnel. So um, we're doing our best that we can. You'll see there's not a lot of cost escalation above our personnel costs going into FY24. Um, we've really tried to minimize um, new requests um, and new increases that 
or in this this current budget be a little bit of a struggle going forward um, but the offsetting piece of that is actually asking for budget reductions for next year this is an, a revenue estimate going into fy24 um, this slide does not include as you can see does not include tuition increases or enrollment projections so basically this is a base revenue budget the state allocation is based on the DAS CSL, unknown at this time. Um, we've got lots of options I'll show you in the next slide. Um, this also includes our SELP funding, our ETSF funding, and our other state programs. So it's beyond just what we get out of the model. Um, and it also includes fee remissions um, and some other funding. So at, at this point, um, with nothing else being done, we'd be looking at almost a $50 million revenue budget. Looking at the state funding outlook, um, lots of options. Um, Tim and Richard and everyone has been working hard um, with the state level to finalize, um, get us some more, get us some more funding. Several options. The governor's recommended budget came out in December at $933 million for all of, all OPUs. Um, and then the DAS CSL came out at 972. Co-chairs came out um, 947, which is a 2.5% reduction off of the DAS CSL number. Um, and then the OPU request um, was $1 billion. So those are all of the numbers we can play with and everything in between, um, hopefully nothing less than that. Um, this particular, I have just based it off of the DAS CSL at this point in time. That would give us an increase of about $836,000 um, from the state funding. So probably be somewhere somewhat less than that. You can see looking at the co-chairs, it doesn't make a huge difference um, for us, $200,000, um, not to minimize the impact of $200,000, but the difference for us between the CSL, DAS CSL and the co-chairs is only about $200,000. There's also the regional university planning do dollars. Governor's recommended budget had $15 million for the TRUES. Um, that is still, um, I believe, on the on the table somewhere in the mix. Um, I will defer to uh, co-president. Yeah, I could just mention that uh, Tim and I have been talking to lots of legislators about uh, that, getting back into the co-chair's budget. But the key on that 15 million is, uh, the one thing the governor's been consistently said since she proposed it is, it's not for operating funds. Funds. It's not to supplement your ENG fund. It's for actions and activities that will contribute to long-term sustainability of the regional universities. So it's not like, oh, we're going to get a fourth of that or whatever, and it's going to help us on the revenue side. That's not what, what it would be allowed to be used for. Thank you so much for that. <clears throat> Built into the budget is um, what we what I would term as known expenditure changes going into next year. Um, we'll see at a minimum a million dollar increase in labor expenses, uh, four hundred thousand dollar of OPE increases. A lot of that is tied to um, changes in the PERS rates. So and it's also tied to our faculty contract. We just notified the union this morning. Uh, they'll receive a 3% increase in September um, along with a 1% step for those that are eligible. Uh, that This year in this contract was based on the CPI um, for the first time and it was based on the March CPI. So we were able to notify them early. Um, the classified staff are, had a reopener in their four-year contract. They'll begin those negotiations in earnest um, in around July to next fall sometime. Um, but while they're negotiating, they still receive their step increases, which is about 4.75% um, for everyone that's eligible there as well. So we know that there'll be some increases in labor coming on. Uh, the match on Inlow Hall is $500,000, a little $560,000. Um, we've we've spread that across several several fiscal years, or at least two fiscal years. So next year we're anticipating that the match cost for Inlow Hall will be about one hundred and thirty thousand. We have inflationary or compliance increases um, based on utility costs, uh, software contracts, all of those things for about three hundred and seventy four thousand. Enrollment driven increases, um, additional staffing, uh, adjuncts, all of those things, one hundred eighteen thousand. 
We've also built in $2 million in temporary savings. Temporary savings for us are vacancy savings for the most part, or budget that goes unused during the year. So um, we have we currently still have several positions around campus, probably several is too small, many positions around campus that are vacant. Um, so we will be going forward using some of those savings. It's not necessarily intentional. We're not holding those positions vacant in, on purpose, um, but they do add up as far as our savings go. And we also are able to offset this current year, we were able to offset about $1.2 million with grant savings. So utilizing our grants to cover some of our current costs. There'll be a little bit of that next year, um, but certainly not $1.2 million. This budget that you're seeing today doesn't include any new requests. So there were $690,000 in new requests um, that we're still contemplating, and those will come through the budget and planning um, recommendations that will come out later this week. Um, and if you had paid attention to an earlier um, longer term projection and what FY24 might look like, we had built in the low soul hall match. Um, um, which is also another million dollars. Um, we will not be spending that next year. It's obviously not in the capital plan at this point in time. So we have pushed that out several years. So that was removed from the from the budget. Total expenditure budget um, right now with all of those things, no enrollment increases, um, $55 million. The gap at that point in time, with using the $2 million in temporary savings, $3.4 million use of fund balance at the end of the year, June of 24, bring our fund balance down to $7.3 million, um, our fund balance as a percent of revenue down to 14.8. And we want to reduce that. Um, obviously, we've got some ways to do that. Closing that $3.4 million gap, um, because we can't sustain the continued burn of fund balance at that level, um, we have to find other ways to do that, whether it's through enrollment initiatives or finding efficiencies, reducing expenses. Um, without tuition or, or enrollment increases, um, that three, we do have that $3.4 million gap. Um, any changes in that, a lower uh, proposal, um, Lower enrollments than what we have right now um, drives that number up. Additional expenditures drives that $3.4 million number up. So we're really trying to work within that, pulling all the levers to stay in that, um, and then hopefully reducing the gap as well. We approach the closing of the gap, hopefully in a balanced approach. Um, use of fund balance, alternative revenue streams, operating budget expenses, reductions or efficiencies, and enroll, enrollment increases and tuition increases. And just a reminder of the fund balance policy, um, our goal level is between 20 and 25%. We would need to bring the $5.4 million deficit down to a, just under a million dollars to reach the 20%. So um, we will be below the 20% um, in any budget that we propose this year, unless we make drastic drastic changes between now and next fall. Use of fund balance, um, just to walk through pros and cons, similar to what we did in the tuition proposal. Um, again, the millions of these out there, but use of use of fund balance pros, reducing the dependency on revenue increases. So the more fund balance we use, the less tuition increases we might need to take, um, reduces the need for budget reductions. Um, the cons, it doesn't meet the board goals. Uh, it doesn't provide um, board confidence in the finance staff um, or the university. Can negatively impact the future of the institution, can create pressures on addition, future tuition increases, which is what Cedric spoke to this morning, having to take higher increases going forward, um, reduces our fiscal flexibility, can impact our financial statements and our ratios, which plays into our HEC conditions, and can also impact our accreditation. And so we just try to be very mindful of using fund balance. Um, it's fine for a short term, um, but it's not a long term solution. Looking at alternative revenue streams, and this is this could be fundraising donations, use of the foundation dollars, grant revenue, um, camp revenue, anything that comes into the institution that can offset our ENG expenses. Right now, um, it's it's been primarily in grants for this current year um, and going forward. 
the pros on using alternative revenue streams, it reduces our dependency on revenue increases. Um, it's a metric of our ascent goals. So increasing our alternative revenue coming into the campus is one of those goals. Um, it can also increase opportunities for other revenue streams. You have a grant, um, you get a match grant, you have a grant, you're showing um, success towards those things. Maybe another grant is gonna be successful. So it, it does have some serious pros there, um, but the cons are it's temporary funding. There's an increased workload if we don't add people to manage those grants or the, the programs that come out of those grants. Um, and it's a reliance on uncertain funding. So you're hiring people on a limited duration basis because we don't have permanent funding behind them um, to offset those at the end of the day. We can look at expenditure reductions or efficiencies um, in the budget process for FY24. Um, instead of asking for across the board reductions, um, we asked departments to think strategically about what they needed to execute on their goals and find ways, find efficiencies and find places where we can reduce costs. Um, this is really one of the primary focuses of budget and planning. So in addition to talking about tuition, they talked a lot about the budget and 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 concepts that they would have for reducing expenses. We've heard everything across the board from reducing professional development, I'm, uh, reducing travel, looking for more efficient ways in utility costs, all of those things that have come up with, with that, that particular group. Um, they've spent a lot of time really strategizing um, how they wanted to form their recommendation going forward to the president. Again, looking at the pros and cons, uh, it slows the pressure on the expenditure budget by re by making a calculated reduction or finding efficiencies. Um, it also reduces the dependency on revenue increases. The cons that can negatively impact our student experience once we start slowing uh, expenses and we start slowing the money that flows into programs, um, the students are impacted by that. It can negatively impact the employee morale in the workforce. If we start reducing positions, uh, we do freezes or layoffs, um, someone else, the work goes on. Um, so someone else is picking up that work. Um, it can also negatively impact enrollment growth. If we can't invest in marketing and we can't invest in recruitment, um, those areas are, are key to our success, um, but we don't have a lot of levers to pull on reducing expenditures over time for the university. Enrollment increases, um, this, is the, this is the big one. Um, We've dedicated a lot of efforts to improve enrollment at, at Eastern. I, Laura and uh, the provost have both engaged actively in recruitment and retention summits this spring. I think we're up to five recruitment and retention summits. Just really digging into how those those areas interact with each other and how they engage with each other and what their priorities are going forward. I think it's been great work. It's brought together really a large level of synergy, um, which I think is going to pay off in the future for our enrollments. <clears throat> Pros for enrollment increases, reduces the dependency on tuition increases, it improves the student experience, uh, the right balance can reduce the impact on potential uh, budget reductions in the, in the future. The cons that can drive increased costs, more students, higher costs, um, we're taking students really on the margin right now. At some point, if we do have a large increase in, in enrollment, we will see an increase in expenditures. Um, right now, we have the capacity to absorb most of those costs. It can increase the impact. It can impact the class sizes and it can impact space utilization. Currently, our enrollment increases are estimated at 7.5% over the current um, 2022-23 projected enrollments. Those increases of the 7.5% would generate an estimated $2.3 million um, in total revenue over next year. Is 7.5% uh, real? Um, it certainly could be. I'm going forward. We're going to continue to refine those numbers as we work forward. But there's so much good work going on right now. Um, our application numbers are up. They are, uh, let me just give you the specifics. Our, our applications across the university, regardless of modality, are up over a th by over a thousand right now compared with last year at this time. 
That's anyone who submitted an application. The submitted applications that are um, complete, um, up by 628. Admitted students are up 700 and 700, 373 over the prior year. Those are all fantastic numbers. And again, are they real? Um, they feel real right now, according to Genesis, um, our director of admissions. Um, they've done a lot of work going forward. Um, our financial aid office just packaged new students today. Um, so they're a little bit ahead of the game. Admissions has instituted um, texting campaigns. Um, they've added, they've not added staff, they've, they've uh, reinvigorated their staff, they've changed up their staffing, um, which they believe has helped. They've added a campus visitor, um, they've improved their slate applicant portal, all of these things that are going on. The off-campus programs have similar initiatives that are they're working towards. Um, so there's, there's just, there's so, so much work being done. We get a little hung up on the application side of things and new students coming in, but on the other side, we have retention efforts that are happening with the Title III dollars. All of those things are paying off. Um, advising is heavily in the mix with the recruitment, the re recruitment and retention summits. I'm bringing them into the fold for those matriculated students. How do we keep those students here? And um, we have new, new programs. Um, Dr. Newman in College of Education is looking at re moving the special education program online, increasing the base for those students and that population of enrollment, looking at revitalizing the edu undergraduate education program by spending more time and efforts with our transfer students. Uh, we will be adding a fee remission for transfer students in the next academic year um, for those students that come it to Eastern. And prior learning is a high, hot topic right now. Kevin Walker and his team are working hard on prior learning efforts. Uh, it's just, it, the list goes on and on. And, and, and Laura certainly has a, a better sense of everything that's happening. These numbers are big, um, but we also have three graduate programs coming on. All of those things that have been approved, all of those new programs that have been approved by the board in the last two to three years, uh, those enrollments should be coming to fruition this year. Um, but again, uh, we want to be realistic as well. So we will continue uh, to work with enrollment management and shoring up those numbers and bringing them into line so that we have a real reality um, for the fall term and stuff. But I'll get off that. I'll get off that soapbox. Um, this chart just shows. Um, so I. You want to have, I want you to have heard what I just said, because um, this chart shows where we are as far as the the lines are the top line um, kind of reddish. Um, those are revenue since 2016. The gray line is our expenses. You can see, but 22 is when we kind of topped out. We our expenses exceeded our revenues. The blue bars are um, our SCA, so you can see a drop. Um, I would just tell you that the scale on the right-hand side is the SCH. Um, so we're looking at between about 99,000 SCH last year, um, and we were a little under 110,000 um, in 2016. So we've got a ways to go to get back to where we were in 2016. Um, but don't panic too much because the, the, the scale scale makes this look a little bit worse than it is, um, but wanted to be able to provide this to you so that you have this information as well. Tuition increases, um, I won't spend a lot of time on this because we went through the tuition and proposal, but it just I would emphasize the tuition increases after all of those goals that you saw, um, all of the strategies that we use, uh, tuition increases are the last piece we use to balance the budget, balance the not balance budget. Our FY24 draft budget assumptions that we will end this year as projected. Things look very good. Um, things look on track uh, for FY23. The tuition proposal um, would be approved as presented. Enrollment is at or above the projections. We achieve that two million or more in savings during FY24 and our expenditure levels are at or below the estimates that we're putting forward. This I presented this in the tuition as well. Um, the 
that's kind of where we would be. We are shooting for that far right column, um, a burn off of our fund balance of $2.2 million or less, bringing our fund balance as a percent of revenue down to 16.4%. Any questions? Any questions before I questions? We do need to move on quickly, but uh, yeah, yeah. Thank thank you so much and all the work you've done. And you and I have talked a lot about this, and we all know this that we can't continue to not have a balanced budget, and we just have to balance the budget one way or another. And eventually, hopefully, enrollment will do it for us, and tuition will do it. But if not, we're going to have to cut programs. So we just hope we can do that. If if oh, I so could just add, Chair, no, if I could just add to that. Um, Yes, <laughs> and um, the the crux of the matter is we are approaching a time when we can't wait any longer to see if enrollment will recover. And and for me, and when I look at future projections, that marker is this fall. And if we don't see significant recovery in enrollment, then we'll need to talk about how we correct our budget on the expense side. That's um, that's the reality of the situation. So I think it's just important. Um, we've, we've signaled it repeatedly, so I don't think any of this is a surprise, but we're now two years of um, a, a, quite a not balanced budget, and that's simply not a um, pathway we can keep going down, so. All right, by gosh, we're gonna get this done. So we uh, are going to do a capital update with, with John Garlitz. And uh, is, it, can we, is it legal for us to go over just a few minutes? <laughs> We're not going to get you. Well, uh, yeah, I mean, lunch is out here. Yeah. And governance committee will start at uh, 1210. 10. Okay, we got a little time. So, But you got to yeah. get your lunch in, too. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, that's great. Yeah. Thanks, Thank John. Thank you, Chair Stevens. Um, <clears throat> quick capital bu project budgets sorry capital overview basically it's the big three um I, I call them because right now we're looking at the field house or we're, we're putting a, a bow on it we had to draw a line in the sand somewhere uh i noticed uh, i put in my uh disclaimer here we still have beyond day one items there's a lot of people are seeing new things well, we need netting. We need, there's lots of things we'll have. That, I think, will go on for years, if not decades, um, if we use the facility correctly. So we are gathering that information, and we will be putting it through the budget processes. Um, Grand Staircase is a, oh, I'm back in the field house. To open up, um, I know the presidents have walks, so use, utilize it if you have an active UUID card. Um, you, you have access if you don't have one, but get one, um, get a, we have rec passes that were for just for the field house. Uh, Grand Staircase, we've been, um, in, we're in public procurement right now. All the planning, all the permitting is done. Um, we're putting the final touches. We're having good discussions with the CTUIR. Um, we anticipate opening, right now we're anticipating opening beds on April 18th. Um, everything set all times subject to change. Um, unfortunately, it's snowing today, but that's the um, the, the weather permitting. Um, this uh, I put in last time, it was more appropriate for holidays, but Waterleaf incorporated a rendering. And so we're trying to, we'll, we'll try to replicate that, um, that image. In the hall phase two, that's the one big project where in a design development, design development has been completed we are going through the um, hashings on it. We are getting ready for a, what we're calling the great move out. So everybody's going to move out from Inlo um, around by August and then hopefully move back in by August um, of 2024. So there's a lot of work to do um, in here. There's a lot of work to do to get people moved out. Um, the primary focus is, of course, students, making sure that the least impactful is we're not we're under no impression that we're going to not impact everybody but the least impact we want is on the students um and the last item we that i had was the um capital renewal capital improvement renewal funds we get a new batch here in may and so we're going through the process of how do we prioritize that what are we seeing what is 
unfortunately, what is breaking, what's not breaking, what can we defer, um, what's never enough. But um, that's the uh, the world we have, we have, and it's not going to change anytime soon. So we have to prioritize. That is a process we're going through the budget and planning. We've provided their input. Now we've got. Now we have to go through the budget and planning to get their advice and prioritization, and then we'll present it to the executive leadership. So. Questions, comments. What are they? I have a quick one. Just John on the um, on the phase two movement of inlow. Yes. Can you just describe a little bit more? Who's going where? Where are they going for? We don't example? quite know that yet. We're we'll developing scenarios. We kind of know what we've done is we've basically taken an inventory. Who needs who needs to move? Off, who can move off campus doing the COVID model? Is there a hybrid situation there? What do we really need to move? How do we best fit? What are the areas that best fit for student interfacing? So we've had some discussions in terms of where does that best fit? Is it Gilbert? Is it Hoke? How do we look at scenarios? So I've been redirected to get some finer details in scenario planning. And once those pros and cons of different scenarios, then we'll start executing on, um, on the specifics of who sits where and where are they going. And in summary, though, it will be scattered. Yeah. Sorry. There isn't a student service offices. We have a good plan for keeping them in a central location and an easy to find location for students. And everyone else will have, we just kind of have to fill up space that exists. So it's, yeah, yeah. for a year, one year, one everyone year. can survive one year of that. Yeah. And we all will be indoors. So, <laughs> <laughs> it, I, so far, not in trailers. <laughs> Just quickly, yeah, the timing must have been a little bit challenging for this because if it's all torn up when we have new students coming and assessing our campus and I mean whether, I mean it's exciting to have new stuff, but when it's all a big mess, I hope it doesn't yeah, deter that's, people from coming here. It's actually part of the reason why we went for, um, I call the ripping the bandaid off approach. Um, the minimum is the year long. And taking this building fully offline allows the project to start and complete in one year. And no one is in this building and no one's around this building. The other options are you take up to three years and you phase the project and you have certain parts that are under construction while people are still operating other parts of the building. Also a model that is fraught with problems. So in Low Hall won't look great some days, but no one will be in it. Um, and the rest of campus will be available for for people to see and enjoy. Um, and hopefully this really cuts down on the length of time that the project takes. I have learned on this campus that project fatigue is a real thing and most people, you're, you're better off to find the shortest pathway and they can actually survive more disruption than a more prolonged, when does the noise ever stop in this building? Um, so that that is the pathway we've, we've chosen and, and hopefully by closing the building completely people kind of just get to enjoy the rest of campus for a year. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, thank you, John. Thank you. Other questions? Yeah. So uh, we, and you see, we have a written, written report submitted, internal audit update. I kind of Stokes uh, folks um, have that and then just read that online, right? Yeah, they will be here in person in May and they will present their first two um, audit reports. Uh, one will be on Title IV, um, Clery Act, and the, other, the first one will be on Clery Act, and the second one will be on the NAIA um, compliance report, and then they are in the process of starting Title IV. So uh, good work is coming out of them. It just, it takes a long time to get everything done. Anybody have anything else for good of the order? Thank you for all your hard work and uh, let me.
Well, it's after 1210 and we have a super full agenda today. So I'd like to call the governance committee meeting to order. Um, Chris, um, please respond um, when Chris, um, the secretary calls your name. Anna Cavanato. Present. Chris Cronin. Present. Tamara Mabbitt. Present. Brad Stevens. Present. Maurizio Valerio. Present. Uh, quorum is present. Thank you, Chris. Uh, could you please start us off with announcements? Certainly. Thank you, Chair Mabbitt. Uh, first, some housekeeping announcements. I ask everyone to please put your cell phones on Do Not Disturb. I didn't do that at the last meeting. It rang. It was very embarrassing. Uh, <laughs> Board Secretary not following the rules. Uh, members of the media, if you haven't already done so, please sign in the sign-in sheet at the recorder's desk to my left. Likewise, any present, anyone present in person who wishes to give public comment, please be sure to sign the sign-in sheet at the recorder's desk to my left. To provide access to the public, the public have been invited to attend in person, and this meeting is being live streamed over the internet. Speakers must use the tabletop microphones, which are the only way that people on the live stream can hear what we say. Use of the mics is also necessary for proper amplification within the room. I'll just say it's uh, it's really common. I've observed this in so many meetings, including the last one. Uh, and time, you know, to get your mic up like this for some reason, it actually makes a really difference. People can't hear very well if it's up there. So try to be conscious. But I also want people actually to feel safe in just pointing that out to people. Like, don't feel bad if someone says, hey, your mic's off or your mic's, you know, because we just need to, it, it helps to keep us aware. And we all forget from time to time, just like I did with the cell phone. Uh, <laughs> um, and let's see, I've got. If you brought a laptop or device, please sure this, be sure that the speakers and microphone are turned off so that they don't cause feedback. Uh, and uh, in front of you, you've got you will find the meeting agenda, meeting materials, and travel reimbursement form. Please sign the travel form and uh, return it to my assistant Pepper, to my left, uh, by the end of today's meeting. Uh, the board received no written public comments for this meeting and also did not receive requests to give oral public comment by remote means. And likewise, no one has signed the sign-in sheet for public comment. That concludes my housekeeping announcements. Thank you, Chris. Um, does anyone have any other announcements? I don't have any. So as Chris announced, we received no requests from the public to give oral testimony either in person or remotely. Um, so um, Secretary, could you let us know if anybody signed the signing sheet? Yeah, sorry, I, I, they have not. So. Okay, no problem. Okay, as we have no public commenters, we will move to our next agenda item. Uh, Secretary Buford, will you please manage our public comment today and help us with the first agenda item? Yeah, we're actually skipping a little further down the page because <laughs> we don't have comment. Yeah. So to 1C. 1C. Okay. So we now turn to our consent item. Um, don't anticipate anything to be controversial there. Do any trustees wish to discuss any consent item, which today is approval of the January 25th minutes? No. Okay. Um, I'd take a motion for approve the minutes. I move that we approve the minutes of the, uh, sorry, of the previous meeting. <laughs> Second. <laughs> okay. It's been moved and seconded. Um, do we do that by consent or roll call? Uh, by consent, but it's also helpful for the recorder to say who oh. made the motion in his second. Okay. Date. So for the record, Christine um, Cronin, trustee, made the motion and trustee Maurizio Valerio seconded the motion to approve the minutes of January 25th, 2023. So all those in favor, say aye, please. Aye. 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 Okay. And opposed, no. Okay. The motion passes unanimously. We're now moving to agenda item two. Um, the topic is the Rural Engagement and Vitality Center. Uh, this is an informational meeting. 
Um, and um, the discussion will be led by Vice President Tim Seidel and Executive Director of Wallawa Resources, Nils Christofferson. And they'll be discussing uh, the Rev Center, um, which we commonly hear, Tim Seidel. Uh, thank you, Chair Mavitt, uh, members of the committee. Um, we are uh, hoping to be joined by uh, Nils uh, Christopherson and Nels Gabbert. Um, however, uh, one of the things that is going on in relation to the Rural Engagement Vitality Center are some meetings in the Baker City area um, regarding some work we're doing on uh, developing an innovation, a regional innovation hub um, with Business Oregon. So we're, we're overlapping here, but that's why we have a team approach. Um, uh, joining me um, today uh, is Grace Donovan, our brand new uh, executive director, literally started last week. Um, and Corey Quillen, um, who's our program manager um, with the Rev Center, and she's been on board with us for several months. Um, uh, I'll, I'll give them um, a chance to introduce themselves here. Um, and uh, well, maybe we'll, we'll just go ahead and do that now. All right. So uh, I'm Grace Donovan. I am a originally from Enterprise, graduated from Enterprise High School, and am really excited to to be back in Eastern Oregon. Um, prior to joining the Rev Center, I worked abroad in Chile for many years, doing uh, entre building entrepreneurial ecosystems. So I worked with local entrepreneurs to grow and scale their businesses, get connected with capital, work with our partners, including universities, to promote innovation and entrepreneurship locally. So I'm very excited to bring that to a lot of the projects that we're seeing here at the Rev and really excited to <laughs> continue learning more about what's going on and then hear how we can also support the community um, you know, with this platform that we have. So nice to meet you all. Hello, my name is Corey Quillen. Um, I have been in this role since uh, late October of last year and am a graduate of EOU or rather OSU at EOU 2016 with a degree in rangeland ecology and management. Um, I believe Maurizio taught one of my classes or at least was a guest speaker several times. Um, I grew up in Pendleton and then I left for several years to go explore the world and and uh, serve my country in the military. And now I am back in La Grande and raising my family and nothing is more important than connecting the next generation to the community and getting everybody excited about where they're from and where they live and building into that for the next for the next era. Love it. Okay. Um, so we're really excited to have both of these um, professionals on board with us. Um, as you can see, um, uh, Corey's been on with, with a little bit and uh, just just a little while. And um, prior to that, we were with Julie Kennery, who was our program manager for a number, a uh, couple of years um, when we launched the Rev Center uh, and really helped us um, pull together the framework and the base, uh, the basis for the Rev Center. So um, if you looked at the, the materials, um, great. If not, I'll just reiterate here. We have talked about the Rev Center with the board um, several times. Um, wanted to reiterate that this is a partnership um, uh, between Eastern Oregon University and Wallawa Resources. Um, I, Brad could probably speak to some of that. I think you know, uh, with the, he's been on the board at Willow Resources for a number of years as well. Um, this is a unique partnership that was developed um, with Nils Christofferson and um, uh, President, former President Tom Insko in many of their conversations about how can we engage uh, the university with the region. Um, in many years past, um, and, and, and maybe Chris uh, Cronin would remember this too, we had um, a, a program for a number of years called the Regional Services Institute. This was funded by a USDA um, Economic Development Grant uh, through the Department of Commerce. Um, that, the funding for that, uh, that went away, but for many years that group, that organization office here on campus helped do something similar to this. They helped engage the university with the, uh, the communities that we serve. Uh, fast forward, we really were seeing, and Tom heard a lot about this when he came on board, and I think many of you as uh, originating trustees heard about this too, is how do we re-engage with the community? How do we bring um, Eastern out into the public? Um, we really helped crystallize that with our mission, um, the Ascent, uh, I'm sorry, with our mission with the development of the Ascent, um, and then in 2018 with our designation as Oregon's Rural University. Um, and this really helps crystallize that work. Uh, the Rev Center really does these partnerships. Um, and we've had some, and I'll have uh, Corey talk about a couple of them here that she's been involved with, that put us in front of the community. Um, the biggest difference is that the, the REV is designed to be um, responsive to the needs of the region and the communities that we serve, um, as opposed to maybe us saying, here's the research we're doing, we want you to respond to it out in the communities. I mean, when we have those discussions in small towns and they say, well, we'd love to 
talk to some students about how we could develop a business plan for our, our product or our community or our little nonprofit organization, but we just don't have the resources. Is there something we could do to make that happen? How can we, how can we facilitate that? We've done that recently. Um, and uh, one of the examples I might use is our um, urban rural theater project where a small group from halfway, um, a couple of retired faculty from Southern Methodist University who are in love with Eastern Oregon and, and had moved back to this region, had these great concepts they wanted to put together. We sat down with, um, with our deans and some of our faculty and talked about in the theater department, how could this come to fruition? And we were able to then engage students in the learning process. So we had interns plugging into this and that's really a core part of this work is uh, developing um, experiential learning opportunities for our students and um, developing workforce um, in the region, tying those pieces together. They were able to then start in on from the ground level, working with these um, uh, these folks from um, halfway in terms of like doing the interviews um, and then writing the script. And now it's going to move into production and we'll be showing it. We have, we'll have live production of it here on campus. Um, it's a great example of how a student can actually do something that they can then take out into the business world, into the graduate school and say, here's what I actually did. Um, this is, this is you know, very similar to the research we could do in chemistry labs when we can actually, students can actually do hands-on research with our faculty. This just expands it to so many of our other students um, who are maybe in the arts and humanities or in education and other areas um, to get, get this experience. So, um, Willow Resources, um, if you're not familiar with them, they're a community nonprofit established up in Willow County um, in Enterprise, and they have um, been fantastic partners with us, um, working to structure this initially and get it up off the ground. We've been able to leverage experience um, and expertise from not only the not only Nils but all of his team members at Willow Resources. Um, they are the fiscal agent for um, the Rev Center, and the Rev itself is moving into being a, a standalone nonprofit. Um, we're, we're doing that intentionally um, because that allows us then to compete for other grants and funding opportunities separately from the university and well resources. Um, uh, you, when we, we send in a grant, if it's authorized by U of O or sorry, Eastern, um, it may be something where we're competing with other schools. Um, we need to compete for Eastern against other schools like a U of O or an RSU or somebody else for those grants. Uh, this enables the REV to be a standalone applicant for grants and, and get additional resources and then have those resources um, locally that we can use and be able to help support student, the student research opportunities, help support the program itself, um, help support travel, help support staff. So uh, we've been building that out and we've had, again, wonderful support from not only Willow Resources, but then expanding that out to the Ford Family Foundation, Oregon Community Foundation and other organizations um, that we've been able to engage with. So um, I'll stop there and see if you have any questions here, and then we can talk about some of the and give some examples of some of the projects we're working on. Trustees have any question? <clears throat> I'll take the liberty of asking a question. Tim, you mentioned you're moving towards um, establishment of a nonprofit. Um, has has that already happened? The filing the paperwork to to move into a nonprofit, and then what's the board of trustees role? in authorizing that um the we have moved forward with um authorizing um applying for um nonprofit status within the state of oregon and put together those um those documents um and i don't believe the board has separate because it's not, not an entity of the university so i'd have to defer to our legal expert that's right <laughs> so any uh group on campus could form a nonprofit without uh, explicit authorization of the board? No, uh, this is uh, under delegated authority of the president under board statement number two. Thank you. Uh, and we'll have that a little bit later. I, I, and I could also talk a little bit about the board itself, the board of directors um, of the uh, this nonprofit includes um, co-presidents Shavs and Moore, who are also on the board. Um, as well as Nils Christofferson and um, Joni from his, his, basically his CFO um, from Allow Resources. So those are the four board members um, and the officers include myself as president uh, of the nonprofit board um, and uh, Lori Barrett in my office as the uh, secretary, uh, Joni from, um, I'm sorry, I can't remember Joni's last name. Masdam, thank you, from Allow Resources um, as the treasurer and Nils Christofferson as the vice president. So the long-term plans 
to continue to expand that board um, and even create advisory boards so that we can gather additional input. Um, we also want to make sure that it stays um, uh, nimble and able to respond to, to um, requests and needs in the region. Yeah, I, th thanks. I, I might just say a little bit about the history of our resources and, and the association. Well, our resources got started a little over 25 years ago when the, um, the good old uh, the logging industry really shut down in Willamette County and the loss of the mills and that sort of thing. And that was a small organization that's grown and it's established to maintain sustainable rural-based, uh, land-based economy. It's grown tremendously. It's now over 22 employees, has close to $3 million budget a year, and is seen both regionally and nationally as a leading organization in a land-based type organization like this. And we've talked quite a bit about uh, about the Rev Center and the association with Eastern. And it really fits the Willow Resources mold or goal perfectly what we want to do to get uh, engagement with local students, experiential learning, uh, that sort of thing. So it's, it has very, very strong community support and it was wonderful to have the staff here that we have now. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Do you have you continue, Tim, if you'd like? Okay. Maurizio. I'd just like to say welcome. It's great to have Rev here with 100% of the Rev staff. <laughs> uh, and uh, I love the concept. I think that this is a very unique partnership between a higher education institution and a type of organization like Wallawa Resources. They have done phenomenal work on many different fields, research, education, uh, uh, involving the youth and uh, economic development in not just in, a Wala in Wallawa, but also in the region and is leading by example. So thank you. Um, welcome, uh, um, Grace, and good to see you, Corey, again. So love to have here the Rev staff. Thanks, Maurizio. Um, I think I'll turn it over to Grace and Corey and let them it, Tell you just a couple more some of the details because I believe that's really where people get a better understanding of what like what is the Rev Center doing like here's what we're actually doing and you can see the connections and and how it works so good. Yeah, thank you. We've had we have a lot of projects that we're currently working on. Corey has been managing most of them, so she has really been doing a phenomenal job of keeping things running while I've been getting onboarded. So I'll let you talk about some of your the programs that you're most excited about, and then I can fill in on any others. Okay. <laughs> um, the two that I'm most passionate about are the ones that involve uh, our youth. Um, one of them is our Cottonwood Crossing Summer Institute that is held. It's a week long summer program residential in that the, the high school students come and camp with us in Cottonwood Canyon State Park for a week and they work with uh, three uh, EOU professors and then two guys from ODF and W come and teach a course as well and they get to choose one of these four programs and then through the week they're studying in these small groups underneath these professors and they can earn two credits two college credits doing this program and then on Friday they uh, present their findings their report to um, the group but also with all of the the board members and funders and stakeholders in the program will come on Fridays and it's a real fantastic um, um, just coming together out in the middle of this really beautiful canyon. And it's this really great experience for these students because there's no cell service, there's no Wi-Fi, they are completely unplugged. We are along the river. Um, if the water behaves this year, we'll get to do a day flow and just really get to have uh, provide this experience for these young people to just really step out of their regular day to day and have this incredible experience they'll remember for the rest of their lives and build their own professional foundation off of. And some of our students are, um, one of them in particular whose name I can't remember, but she's a member of the Warm Springs tribe and she was a student one year and then the next year came back as a guest speaker. And it was really touching and something that we're trying to keep the momentum flowing in that way to have, now that the program is four years old, to have students that have been there before but are now adults and pursuing their um, professional careers or their educational careers um, coming back and speaking um, to the students. And it's just, it's all very exciting. And in the evenings, we'll have a little round the fire conversation. It always gets very touching and it's a reflective time. And 
it's I from what I've heard, this will be my first year, but from what I've heard, uh, nobody walks away with a dry eye. It's real touching and everybody reflects and looks inward on the experiences that they had during the day. It's really fantastic. Um, <laughs> can you tell I'm passionate about that one? <laughs> <laughs> the other one, and um, the Rev doesn't get the honor of, of being the founder of this program. That goes to Kelly McNeil, who's a um, staff here at the at EOU and the Human Health um, Performance uh, Department. But it's Go ASAP, which stands for Get Outside After School Activity Program. And it focuses on LMS, uh, LaGrand Middle School students, 12 to 14 year olds, who are kind of slipping through the cracks. They don't really have a community. They're not members of band or sports teams, and maybe their home life is a little shaky. And they've been identified by the principal and two counselors. That's it. It's very elite um, by uh, as children that might use a little bit of a net catch and um, could thrive having a community, being a part of a community. And um, I get the honor of being just hands on with these kids this year. And I have 15 of them and they're just rambunctious and exciting. And you can tell that they don't necessarily have a structure that they're used to. Um, but my role is to um, take them up into the mountains, teach them that they can do really incredible things and they can push themselves out of their comfort zones and they can rely on themselves while also building a community with their peers and learning physical activities that they can go and do. And any member of Go ASAP can rent from the EOU's Oregon, or not Oregon, outdoor activity program in the field house. They can rent gear from them for the rest of their lives for free, being a part of Go ASAP. And so they really, it's this really great collaborative effort to get these kids um, sort of, it's they're at a fork in the road when they could continue down the path of being an at-risk youth or go towards this direction of being this really great member of a community and a, a supportive person with their peers. And having been an at-risk youth myself back in the day, they really pull on my heartstrings and I am so happy. My butterfly net for them is just so big. I'm not letting any of them go through, but okay. That's your turn. <laughs> Thanks, Corey. And I think just to compliment a few other details as well, um, both Go ASAP uh, and CCSI pull from university enrolled students to mentor students uh, and also you know do conduct research projects and capstone initiatives here at the university. So we are, and it's also a pipeline the way we see it at the Rev to get you know young students engaged and exposed to the university's capabilities and get them excited about um, in, in considering enrollment at EOU. Some of the other projects that the Rev Center is currently involved in, um, Tamara, this is one that I know you're involved in as well as the Research Transportation Equity Initiative at Morrow County. So the Rev Center has been supporting uh, DLCD as well as Morrow County uh, to do conduct research and surveys of um, populations that have been that are marginalized and since they don't have the greatest access to transportation they might not have a car they might not be able to drive so how can morrow county um, better service them with fixed route transportation initiatives so the rev center has been facilitating and working with other community-based organizations to survey um, beneficial of that transportation network, as well as how that could impact employers and folks on Main Street in the region. So that will be concluding in June. Uh, we're in the final stages of collecting interviews, and then we'll be working with professors on campus, as well as student interns to um, present the data analysis, and then present that to Morrow County for their uh, use and benefit. So that is one of the initiatives that we're working on. An ongoing initiative uh, is with the Blues Intergovernmental Council. So looking at the socioeconomic impacts of forest planning, how land use specifically within the three national forests here in Eastern Oregon, and how the Forest Service's plans will affect each, uh, each county and its respective economy. So that's something where we've worked with the Forest Service, county commissioners, uh, and a whole bunch of stakeholders in the region, and working with two professors here, um, Peter Mailer and Scott McConnell. Um, Peter thank you, <laughs> Peter Mailey. And Scott McConnell to do that research and analysis. Again, also drawing on student interns to do some of that research and analysis. So the projects of the Rev span from you know working on very large research projects that will have a really big impact on the region uh, that are very again analytical, 
all the way to the creative, which is the projects that uh, Tim mentioned in terms of that theater. So those are some of the projects that are currently in process. We are also preparing now to send EOU students to Portland as part of the Urban Rural Ambassadors Institute, where students enroll for a five-week course on how to bridge the urban-rural divide. Uh, this year's focus will be on transportation systems and how infrastructure in sparsely populated areas and densely populated areas is different. And students have the chance to go to Portland, as well as Portland students come to Eastern Oregon to see those differences and apply real life problem solving skills under the supervision of faculty. So that's another example of a program that we're doing. Thanks. Fantastic. Question. <laughs> um, great, great program. I'm a huge fan and continue to be. It gets better all the time. So do any trustees have questions or comments for Grace or Corey or Tim? Uh, I just wanted to ask a question about, um, and Grace, you're brand new, and this is a whole new program. I was a fan, I'm a huge fan of this program, as well as a huge fan of the previous program that went away due to funding. Um, sometime, um, not now, um, we'll have a longer conversation about opportunities for other funding that looks uh, like service what used to be here. So lots of funding to help local government. So um, once you reach the community and you talk to Lostine, who has a part-time city clerk, of the 59 cities and 10 counties in Eastern Oregon, every county has a county planning director. 59 Out of 59 cities, five cities have a planner. And you don't get new housing, you don't get new growth if you don't have the capacity. So um, a small group, thank you to the Dean's Council, um, we met with the Dean's Council a couple of weeks ago and talked about a model that comes out of either Portland State or University of Oregon. It's a lot to throw at you. So when you're ready, I'm all game to, to listen. And um, there's just some real tremendous opportunities, again, with funding attached. So I love the programs you're working on. Um, yeah, Trustee Cavanato. Yeah, I have a question. Uh, do you have like a call for proposals uh, for your center? So like a wide compass wide call for proposal, or are you limited in terms of the scope of projects or, you know, how many projects you can handle at one time? That's an excellent question. Currently, we don't have a formalized call for proposals, perhaps on our website, but this is something where if there is, you know, funding available, if we have identified community needs, we encourage everyone to, to bring those projects to the REV. Um, and Tim, you can perhaps compliment here. So, you know, part of you know getting onboarded, you know, I'm going to be talking to a lot of folks in the community, talking to a lot of professors, and identifying those needs where the Rev can bring resources from the university and meet a community need and get students involved. Our role is really to be that junction box uh, between both. So, while we're fielding requests and ideas from the community and the university, we're going to serve as a matchmaker for where are do those needs intersect. Where is their funding? And, and we can go forward with those projects. So if you have ideas, send them our way. <laughs> we're also promoting some as well. Yeah, certainly feel free to, to send them to Grace. And that's one of the things we were holding back on is um, until we had an executive director in place to be able to manage all those that come in. Um, but again, it's designed to be responsive to the needs of the region um, as opposed to a uh, bunch of campus ideas and then we're supposed to go out and facilitate them. Um, so really, unless there's, and there's many times there's been a connection, somebody has talked to uh, a dean and said, you know, I'd really love to engage with this and it's great, how can you help us? So um, with the Blues Intergovernmental um, Council uh, project and facilitation there, we work with Dean Henninger um, and said, okay, we have this project, could we do it? Could can we make it happen? He connected us with uh, Dr. Maley and Dr. McConnell. Um, we sat down with them. They were able to put it together. We actually invested in some software platforms to be able to do the research. They engaged students who now have been able to graduate with that experience and take it on to um, careers uh, where they've, I just had one student come and join us at a legislative hearing to talk about her experiential learning and how she parlayed that into um, a job um, in economic development on the coast. Uh, so there's um, those kind of definite connections that we're making. We're also um, doing the outreach to go out into the region. So we're meeting, Grace will be going out and talking to uh, the Eastern Oregon Border Committee. Um, we're already working with the governor's regional solutions team, um, Northeast Oregon Economic Development District, many of the other economic development and community development programs. Um, the great thing about the BIC is that it's made up of commissioners, county commissioners from throughout Eastern Oregon and Southeast Washington. And they have all kinds of ideas and needs that they're giving us. So the list is pretty extensive on what we're trying to um, sort through and match up with what's 
possible and what we can do. We also want to make sure that we perform um, and that we deliver. Um, I can tell you from my experience, um, we took on projects in the past where we didn't perform, not the Rev Center, but this was prior to it, where we didn't perform um, and we didn't connect. And in talking with faculty, it was like, I didn't have the resources to do it. Nobody could help me match up students or how do I, it was just like, here, go do this project. So we're we're using that as a, the Rev as that junction box to be able to facilitate the connections and the needs and then going to the right folks like talking to the deans and saying is this something that would match up with with programs or faculty in your area and have them say yes or maybe they'd say no maybe that's not and then here's another way we could approach it so we may partner with another organization um, or even another university to help facilitate those needs of the region thank you um, i'm happy to make some introductions to cities and counties um would love to host you on the other side of the mountain um the, the snow wasn't too bad driving over today. You won't mind. You're 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 um, an old hat at that. If you grew up in Malawi County, not mm -hmm. a problem. But um, I think there are less. There are fewer programs uh, west of the mountains. Um, huge demand, though. So I see lots of opportunities. So yes, we will definitely connect on that. Perfect. Thank you. Any other trustees have questions or comments? Oh yes, Chair Martin. Yeah, you kind of answered. <clears throat> excuse me, my question, Tim. But so how do because. Obviously, our focus at EOU is the students. So how do the students get involved with this program? Is it through the deans then? You kind of mentioned the deans. Or how, how, how does the two work with our students? How do, how do those kids get on that? I do a lot of uh, going into classrooms and just speaking face to face with the students. And I found um, for Go ASAP in particular, I have four EOU student leaders, they're called. And they're all volunteers and they're all doing this out of the goodness of their heart and the and to build their resumes and their personal uh, experience. But um, I go around and I introduce myself and I leave, uh, I have leave behinds with, you know, QR codes and I'll blast out emails to um, relevant professors and departments to make sure that the word is getting out. Social media as well. I have a social media intern. She's lovely. She's doing a great job. <laughs> Um, and I might add that each project isn't just a, a, it could be a classroom project, it could be an institutional project, um, it could be um, a, a standalone project where we just need a couple of, of, of students. Um, I know I'm talking with um, Dr. Shannon Donovan uh, with our uh, Sustainable Rural Systems Program that will be Sustainable Communities. Uh, she has more projects than she could and students to match up with. And so we're, we're also working with her. We work with our career services um, area to ensure that the internships um, or these learning opportunities are actually you know, aligned with outcomes, um, and so that there, there, there's true meaning. That we, we, what we don't want is students to go, you know, not do anything or have non-meaningful work. Ideally, they can graduate say, I "Actually, pulled this research. Here's I worked with, you know, these professors to put this together. I, I led this project, and they could actually put it into a portfolio. They can um, share after after graduation. So those meaningful interactions are critical." real quick, sorry. Um, as, as far as the paid internships go, I do post job postings on Handshake and blast those out um, with links to emails and on social media as well, because I want to take the interns through that legal process of having the equity as far as accessing the job posting goes. That's for the, the paid positions. Um, and then as far as like Urban Rural Ambassadors, which is is a class that I want children to, or children, sorry, <laughs> that I want the students to apply for, then it's more of a go to the class and speak to the students that are in that kind of field in the first place. Um, but that's where that's at. Sure, oh, yes, please. I, I just uh, want to compliment you. I It's been wonderful to hear about this program. And I took some notes. I think you, you might have already said this, 14 internships, 17 projects, and 30 partners. Um, that's pretty impressive, and and just in in on uh, in relation to students, the fact that they have these opportunities to have real, genuine applied learning that they can then, as you said, Tim, take and put on their resume when they're in a job interview, be able to describe a very extensive real world experience is just invaluable. Plus, it's doing a lot for our region. So, thank you for the presentation; it's excellent. Super valuable um, comment. Thank you, Christine. Um, particularly from someone who's worked a lot with students. So I'm not surprised that you and Cheryl Martin um, came up with those questions. Super exciting. Keep up the great work. Um, a lot of success and a lot of potential. So thank you very much.
Tim, I guess you get to stick around at the table. Yeah, get to stay at the okay, table. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you both. You're welcome. Thank you. And welcome back to Eastern Oregon. So we'll now move to agenda item 3A and Vice President Tim Seidel will lead us through legislative developments. Um, uh, Chair Mabbitt, if I may, I, I might mention what, uh, what we talked about in terms of adjusting the agenda. Okay. So um, the item C, 3C here, uh, we're going to postpone in order to add uh, more time for discussion under item four uh, around the um, presidential interview process. Thanks. When you're ready. <laughs> okay, Thank you. I just want to make sure I provided enough time. Uh, well, we are into our 12th week of the legislative um, session. This is a long session, of course, uh, as we mentioned. Um, there's been uh, some culling of the bills, which has been helpful, um, but our focus has remained the same throughout um, the throughout the session. It's to be talking a lot about um, the state funding that we need for higher education, in particular, the funds that help and resources that help Eastern Oregon University. Um, so you can see in my budget note or my uh, my my uh, report, my staff cover sheet, that uh, there's been a couple of major um, pieces of legislation that have passed. Um, the governor's um, housing bill, two hundred million dollar package there, um, uh, and another uh, package for semiconductors. Um, now we're moving into the phase where the funding is really it's going to be coming to the to the front. Um, Richard and I just spent the last couple of days in Salem. Um, Talking with legislators, we were able to meet with the Speaker of the House, um, with um, uh, one of the senior one of the senior senators on governance. Uh, we were able to meet with local legislators uh, as well and talk to them about our our priorities. Where we're at um, is, and we can kind of um, talk a little bit about university governance legislation later. But where we're at is that there's in the governor's um, budget recommended budget there was a the a fifteen million dollar carve out. Um, for the technical and regional universities. When the co-chair's budget came out, that budget was, that line was not in the budget. Um, so now what are we doing? Well, we're advocating to get some of that, or all of that fund put back into the budget that will wrap up at the end of the uh, session. Um, the framework that was produced was just that, a framework. It's, um, here's what we're thinking we we want to focus on. Uh, that means it's not, it's not locked down. It wasn't, well, because it's in there. It's not, we're not in there. It's a go. Um, it just gives us another another stopping point to uh, reflect on where we're at with the budget and then talk about what we want to do next. One of the next dates that'll be important is the May revenue forecast. Uh, in the previous meeting, Richard uh, noted that we've heard conflicting reports, some folks saying they expect it to be down um, or it's less optimistic in terms of revenue generation for the state of Oregon. Others folks have said they think it will be flat. Um, we're waiting to see. We're certainly in an odd economic time uh, with folks who have been projecting a re uh, uh, a recession for a number of months now, and it just hasn't happened. Um, the reports are all over the place in terms of employment. It's hard to figure out. You have lots of lots of open employment jobs, um, and anybody can go get a job doing just about anything. And and even students at EOU can go out and make eighteen dollars an hour at Panda Express. Um, then you have that, you know, compared to increasing increasing inflation um, and uh, or speculation that there's going to be reduction. Well, that usually goes with a decrease in employment. Um, but we're not seeing it quite yet. So we're all kind of waiting to see how this uh, how this all works out. But we've focused on the, the, the 15 million. What the technical and regional university presidents have talked about um, over and over again is um, staying united and continuing to present that we need to use these resources equitably um, amongst our institutions. We want to share that those resources. We want to split it up um, evenly amongst the institutions and then also create a pool of research funds that we can use to advance our institutions. So there's needs at each of the institutions that they want to use that small pot of money to invest in. Rest assured, this is way less money than we need. There, the 15 million is not a fix, right? We've had a couple of conversations where we've had to explain that, oh no, we need a lot more than this. This isn't gonna fix everything. This is a one-time pot of funds that we can use to leverage things like at Eastern where um, it will help defer costs in the, in the, in the future where we don't have to uh, pay for something in the future and uh, not not we're just going to put it into our fund budget and, and call it good um, the other piece of this is to do some research that we want to capitalize on we talked about earlier um, this year was the um, the study that the oregon council of presidents had put together called the national from the national center of higher education management systems or NCHEMS report 
uh, took a look at all of what was happening in higher education in the state of Oregon compared to other um, national models and came back with recommendations. We want to take another look at that, um, another step with that report, if you will, and um, slice it a little bit further and just focus on the technical and regional universities. So, so this is great information. What does it mean for Eastern, Western, Southern, and Oregon Tech to be able to be efficient and, and find resources and, and find sustainability going forward? Um, we want to do that. We want to do um, a public perception survey. We would also like to do um, an economic impact uh, survey and assessment. So we have the tools that we don't have access to. We're like those small communities we were just talking about that don't have all of the resources that a major research one university may have to be able to tap into the needed um, assets and or uh, uh, funds or resources that we have to we need to get to to get to move the universities forward. Um, so we're focused a lot, as you can tell, on that on that 15. Uh, 15 million. We're in every meeting. It's like the first thing we're talking about, and the last thing we're we're leaving with them as we as we head out. We're also incredibly supportive of the public university support fund. This is the bigger budget um, for all of the universities. Uh, the co-chairs uh, framework uh, threw in about a two and a half percent reduction um, to the CSL. That's the roll-up costs. That includes not just our flat budget, but the roll-up costs that we have to pick up for um, benefits, for example. Um, for our employees, uh, the other costs that are associated with you know year-to-year -year growth, um, where people strangely expect you know to be able to keep up with the cost of living, and they'd like to have a raise, um, or at least have their salaries keep up with cost of living. And so, and to ensure we don't pass that on to our students and say, well, we're going to have to increase our tuitions exponentially high, uh, we're been, we've been talking a lot about that. The number we have is 1.05 billion. Um, that's the ideal number that we would get to. Um, right, and we're expecting, and what we're hearing a lot of is, it's probably going to be maybe at state CSL, um, which will be will be less than that, but um, that would at least get us to uh, a level that we can try to sustain at. But it's not going to do a lot of investing in terms of doing anything new for any of the universities. The other um, the other priorities statewide that we're focusing on and continue to focus on are funds for the Oregon Opportunity Grant. These are the scholarships that are available to students. Um, whether they're going to a community college or to a university, but we have so many students at Eastern. Uh, we pulled data to try to find some students. We have, I think, around 500 students who received Oregon Opportunity Grants um, just here at this university. Not unsurprising when we have the highest percentage of Pell eligible students attending Eastern. Uh, we also are focused on student tribal grants. These are resources that the state put into supporting students from, um, uh, from our, our tribal partners. Um, we have a student lined up who will be doing testimony before the Ways and Means Committee from Eastern who basically was able to come to Eastern because of that support she received um, to um, uh, attend university with a, with a student tribal grant. Um, one of the other uh, key funding items that we're really excited about actually is a bill that was I've talked about before called Hungry Free Campus, um, which is something that the students and the students statewide have supported just to help put some resources in front of students who may have um, food scarcity issues and build a build out like food pantries. It's very unique because it it's, it's supported by, um, it was started by uh, Keegan Sanchez, who was a student government um, president here. Uh, he's now uh, in law school at Willamette and he works for Representative Bobby Levy and they, they pulled together um, uh, us and others in preliminary, preliminary to the session and then put together this package that would uh, basically we'd have to go in and show what we're doing and then we could actually get resources to be able to build out our food pantry systems here at a school like Eastern. We'd also get a designation as a hunger-free campus if we're able to fill in uh, some of the gaps and ensure that our students aren't going hungry. So um, that's a real uh, a real issue for a lot of our students. The um, uh, other pieces of, of funding that we really do need to focus on for Eastern include our Strong Start funding. Um, we're hoping to get that rolled into the um, the overall costs for the university, uh, the budget for the university, and support for our benefits navigators. Um, uh, I think we may have talked about it with the board and others, but uh, we have one benefits navigator right now, Jose, who's um, over in Hoke, and he works with students to help them access all the needs, all the resources that they may not know that are available, whether they're trying to find uh, child care resources or get, uh, sign up for SNAP benefits or just find out they've got, they have some housing issues. He's helping them connect the dots and getting them to the right people um, in the right time. Uh, and then um, sports lottery, um, that's a formula-based um, funding scenario, but it favors the technical and regional universities it's it really because it does a huge amount for us to be able to um, attract and retain student athletes here. Uh, and then of course, Moonshot for Equity. Um, that's what we're hoping to use some of those resources if we receive them in the true fund to be able to apply that towards Moonshot for Equity. And that's, again, it's not a separate standalone project, 
Moonshot is really about retention. If you look at the 15 best practices in student retention, they're all the things that we're doing and we need to do more of it here at Eastern. And it's just applying those across the board and say, this is what we're gonna do to help make sure our students can come here and be successful. It's removing barriers like uh, for a student to be able to get their transcripts moved from Blue Mountain to Eastern. Um, just it's removed because we'll be on the same software platform. So they can just come right over to Eastern, all their transcripts come right across. They can make sure their, their degree will match up. They're, they're not gonna be out of classes. Um, so it increases that efficiency. Um, on top of all this, is our request for uh, capital. And that is um, going to be a struggle. Um, we'll be lucky if we see some funding. Hopefully we'll see some increased funding in our capital, in, uh, CINR, capital improvement and repair, uh, otherwise known as deferred maintenance. Um, we will see some increase in there, which is what's proposed in the budgets thus far. But our, our project, Losal Hall is ranked, and correct me if I'm wrong, Laura, I think it's number six on the, on the list of about, if you would say there's a top 10 list of projects, there's more on the list than that for all of the universities. However, that um, project and others are in jeopardy because of the amount of resources the state is putting into um, the housing and homelessness issues. Um, so that's dominating the available bonding capacity that the state has to provide resources, um, resource, resources for us. Uh, we're making the argument that we really still need those projects and and we're in particular talking about this isn't a new building. This is a we're taking this is a building that needs restoration that needs care um, that we want to um, uh, pick up the we want to make sure to pick up and get going so it doesn't fall into further disrepair. And that's uh, the case that we're continuing to make. We had students testifying last Friday in an informational um, hearing with the capital construction committee, um, and we'll have some more conversations about it as well going forward. So um, just a few dollars on the table and a few projects um, underway. Uh, I haven't even addressed all of the number of policy bills, but I included a lot of them in this. Um, I want to be sensitive to the time, though, because I also know that we have some other things to talk about in terms of the presidential search. So I'll stop there, see if you have any questions, and we could touch on the governance and then move on. Yeah. Um, Jim, I have a quick one about Bill 2802. Uh, establish a pilot project, PSU at EOU, uh, to increase hiring of students at nonprofit organizations. This is fantastic. Yes. What is um, it all about? Sure. Representative, Representative Nathan Sosa reached out to us in Portland State um, pre-session and said, would you be interested in working with us on this? Um, we think that there's an opportunity to provide uh, tuition deferment or tuition discounts to students who are involved with helping nonprofits. I said, fantastic. This is very relevant like to the Rev Center where folks, hey, we have an internship. Great. Do we have any resources for, to pay these students? No. Well, when you have 70 to 80 percent of your students who work for a living, they have to make a decision between a, doing, it, doing an internship that may be unpaid and working. And um, that's like, you know, it's the fast food. I call it the fast food issue. But students can make more money working at a fast food restaurant than doing an internship. And when it comes down to it, many of our students say, that's great. I'd love to forego the cost, but I need to pay. I will not be able to pay my rent. I need to make money to pay my tuition. Uh, so how do we match those those pieces up? Um, this would actually add resources not only for a tuition discount, but for um, uh, those nonprofits to be able to pay those students as well. And so that means that we can say, great, you know, you'll get a little bit of discount here and um, you'll get paid as well. So now, instead of looking at this as I'm gonna have to lose money to do this, I actually can make money, pay my bills, pay my tuition and get this fantastic internship. And then the nonprofits win as well. So we um, had some folks testify from uh, the Lowell Historical Society and um, even from uh, working with uh, Ginger Savage down at the uh, Crossroads Community Arts Center in Baker City. And they talked about just the, the desperate need they have to get students. Everybody wants students to come work for them. It's a great opportunity to get this learning, but if there's not funds that come along with it, the students have to make the tough decision to um, do the internship or not. So uh, that one's moving forward. And uh, it's gone down to ways and means. It's something we're very supportive of. And uh, the nonprofit sector in Oregon employs more people than manufacturing. Mm -hmm. So it, it is real. It's just, you know, it, there are jobs, many jobs associated to that. Thank you. You bet. Excellent. Thank you. Should we move? Um, if there are no more questions, should we move in the, what, 10 minutes we have left? to talk about presidential onboarding, Chris? Well, I think we let's talk about the governance legislation. If, 
Oh, okay. I thought they were blended. Okay. okay. Please, sorry about that. that. Is a whole, the governance uh, legislation is a whole other um, entity. Um, and President Shabs has been involved with this since the get-go um, uh, from the last session, and had we've had numerous uh, meetings with the, the work group, and we just chatted with um, Senator Dembro yesterday, actually met with him about um, the governance bill. So uh, I'll run through this, and if you have any comments, Richard, you can throw them in. Um, so Senate Bill 273 is the with the dash three amendments that are currently underway is what's been moved over. It's, it's going to pass from the Senate. It'll go over to the House. Um, there may be some amendments there. Uh, ideally, I, the Senator uh, would like to see this as just an MOU or an agreement between the universities um, and uh, uh, the legislature. But the changes that it are looking at are, um, you know, there's a number of them in here. Um, I think the real question that the presidents are asking is, you know, is how much does this impact our, our ability to govern our institutions? Um, you can see the list here, but it ranges everything from expanding the number of governing board members from 12 to 16, adding a second or um, shadow student um, position, for example, where there'd be a current student trustee and then a shadow student trustee, and they would each serve basically um, a two-year, a one-year term. So when the student trustee uh, at, sitting at the table uh, their term expires, then the shadow trustee would come in and we'd have another shadow or the shadow trustee comes in and becomes the live trustee and there's another shadow student. So it's kind of this constant um, cycling of students. Um, there are uh, requirements around how to um, pull, uh, gather the names for recommendations to the governor's office for potential member, members of the board of trustees uh, and uh, requiring the HEC to provide regular opportunities for trustees to meet up with one another and meet with HEC commissioners and, and learn more about their fiduciary responsibilities. So it's quite a range of pieces of legislation. The universities have worked very closely together to ensure this. Um, the work group included uh, trustees, um, presidents, board secretaries, uh, as well as the government relations folks. We also in the working group heard from uh, labor and students, faculty, staff um, uh, folks as well uh, to, to create this list. So we're like I said, it's moving over from the Senate. It'll move to the House. Um, we'll have another series of meetings with the House Higher Education Committee. We'll have some additional opportunities to talk about it. Um, but you all need to be aware of what's happening because it may, you know, change up the shape uh, of the governing boards of all of the institutions in the state of Oregon. Please, Crystal. Well, I guess I, I just, uh, there's, a, there's a bill similar to this for K-12 to HB 1045. You know, there's a lot of perceived need to go in and fix boards and I, I i'm just looking at this and what is it that they think needs to be fixed because i think things seem to be are there are there other boards of trustees that aren't functioning well because it seems to me the board of trustees here at eou is functioning very well without any of these improvements yeah i think um i could comment on that a little bit I think, you know, through the meetings of the work group that have occurred over the past several months, in fact, that work group had four last meetings, and then there'd be another one, and we were supposed to have a fifth one, and I think they've just, no, we're not doing that. <laughs> but what has occurred in a lot of these is there was an incident or something that happened on one campus, and, and it brought the discussion forward, and then and it grew into something that you know needed to be in legislation and um, senator dembro has always encouraged the mou approach and he still is he doesn't know if it's going to come out that way or if it's going to be in legislation but he has softened a lot of the things that were in here and my other comment would just be from a um, legislative perspective there are discussions by other legislators that if this kind of bill doesn't work its way through and get passed, then they might bring up something like we had last year in Senate Bill 854 that was extreme. So the goal, I think, of, I think I could say the majority of the work group, and certainly uh, uh, Senator Dembro was to not have anything in here that would really hamper the board's ability to function independently and as a fiduciary board. That's helpful. Appreciate it. Thank you for raising that, um, Christine. I, I concur. Um, any other comments? Appreciate your summary, Tim. Yes, Chair Martin. 
Yeah, I, I'm sorry I keep mentioning the AGB conference, but I guess it's because it's fresh in my mind. But uh, one of the key points I, that I found in most of the sessions I went to was this making sure that universities stay separated from the government influence and that we need to have our own public university system that is not influenced by pressure from politics and government control. And obviously when, when the government uh, or the governor appoints our trustees and then the Senate confirms them, there is a certain amount of political aspect to it. There were a couple of or several universities where the trustees are elected by the people and that came with its own set of um, disgruntlement from a few of the people that were speaking to that. But I think we need to keep that clear in our minds that, yeah, there's going to be this political government impact, but as much as possible, what you're referring to, Christine, is that um, we need to stay autonomous as much as we can. Thank you, Chair Martin. I, I would um, just add to that, that if you can rely on any of your trustees to um, join you and the EOU students, which I love the idea that you're taking them a day at the Capitol is pretty useful for, for up and coming college students, but some of your trustees have um, some connections through various other boards and commissions and um, if it's appropriate, there's a role for trustees um, to support you in that effort. And um, co-president Chavs, we're happy to do that because it's obviously very important to us to remain autonomous. I like to say one size doesn't fit all and it's ever so true in a rural area. Metro doesn't fit out here. <laughs> so let's, let's, let's keep fostering the urban rural um, understanding of things. Anything further on this topic? Again, you've been busy, Tim, or should we? Go ahead and move to our next agenda item. Certainly. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I'm set up right here, so if you'll indulge me. Normally, I go down to the present presenter's table when I'm presenting, but if you're all right with me working from here this time, I just as soon. I'm already ready to go. I don't have to pick up and move my computer. All right. So, um, as you know from the board materials, agenda item four uh, has been uh, is designated to talk about the final stage of the presidential search process, which is the portion where the board has hired a president and we're bringing them on and getting them through the first year. I still want to talk to you about that, but before we talk about the ultimate stage of the process, we should talk about the penultimate stage, which is the stage we're at right now, where we're just about to begin the on-campus interviews. Um, I'm going to share my screen here so you guys can view along with me. Let's see if I can do this without. So this is uh, the university's presidential search website. Uh, it's available to any member of the public to look at. Um, and there's if, um, one of the things that's useful on here is the search timeline. Uh, and I'm just going to pull this up for a second to sort of recap. This is not displaying, is it? Mm. All right, well, maybe we won't do that. Uh, it's displaying on the Zoom for those of you who were logged in, but uh, Chris, is that computer logged into the Zoom? Yeah, if you click click the Zoom button at the bottom, or, well, that's, that's yes, that's it right there but they want us to sign. There we go. Okay, so this is the, so I'll just back up. Uh, this is the web page, the public web page. On the public web page, it's a bunch of interesting information, including the search timeline. Um, and uh, I'll just go over this quickly. So it shows to show you where we've been. Um, we've set up the website, we issued an RFP. Um, we've uh, appointed the search committee and uh, selected the search consultant. Uh, the, uh, we did listening sessions for creating the presidential profile and finalized that profile. The search committee did work with that along with search consultants and the board approved that on January 25th. Um, so since then, uh, the uh, search was launched and closed on March 12th. The search committee reviewed and the search, uh, our search consultant working together reviewed the applicants. And 
uh, conducted screen uh, interviews for the um, semifinalists, the ones that sort of rose to the top. And those four concluded at the end of last week. And I haven't updated the agenda, the timeline since then, but on Monday, the search committee met and uh, made recommendations for three finalists to come to campus. Those recommendations are made to the board chair who reviewed them and has uh, endorsed them. And so now we're moving on to the campus visits and interviews and contract negotiation. So I'll close that real quick. And I'll, uh, I'll share just one other thing to remind you. Um, right document up here. Just a second here. So uh, just uh, since we don't have a cover sheet for this item, this particular topic, I'm just going to share this on the screen here. Zoom, there's Zoom. So this is the familiar AGB list of the 10 essential responsibilities of governing boards. And just uh, to emphasize the importance of this, uh, first, of course, establishing the mission of the institution and maintaining consistency with it, keeping it current. The second is selecting and supporting the president. So this is uh, absolutely uh, one of the most primary roles of the board. Uh, in many ways, you, it's probably the most consequential decision the board makes. Um, so then, uh, in order to, I've given, I've emailed you and I'm going to show on the screen here an overview of the process that's coming up. Just a moment. You've also got handouts you're looking at. Thank you for the handout, by the way. Sure. <laughs> um, so, uh, uh, I did the initial draft of this and reviewed this with, uh, several colleagues, one of whom Chris McLaughlin thought. Climactic might be quite the right term for this, but it really is the, the, the high point of the process. It's where all that work comes together. Um, had I thought a little longer, I might have called it the penultimate because it's not actually the final stage. The final stage is the onboarding, but it's the one just before the final stage. So um, since Monday, uh, as I mentioned, the chair has reviewed the recommendations and has approved them. And we have contacted the three finalists, and we have dates for them to come on campus. And those are uh, next Thursday, a week from today, we will have a candidate, a finalist candidate on campus. Uh, and those, and then the following month, that's a, there's our day and a half visits. So uh, it'll be all day uh, Thursday and half day Friday. Second candidate will be here the following Monday. Uh, Full day Monday, half day Tuesday, and the last one, the, the Thursday of that week, full day and half day on Friday. The visits end with uh, the actual interviews with the Board of Trustees. But prior to those, trying to get this to scroll, let's scroll. Um, uh, but prior to those, we provide opportunities for really all members of the university community to interact with these folks, to kind of get a sense for them. Uh, and they'll, uh, the, the folks in those interactions will provide sort of comments. Uh, there will be a comment form they can fill out in one form or another. And those will ultimately be compiled and given to the board when the board's making its decision about who to pursue hiring. Uh, but this is the schedule. This is, uh, this is a draft schedule for the day and a half that each candidate will have. As you can see, it's pretty demanding schedule. They have uh, four meals in a row with us, essentially. Uh, breakfast the first day, pretty early, 7.30. They get a campus tour, and then they meet for 45 minutes each uh, in sequence with the cabinet, with the provost and deans, uh, with the unions and the uh, administrative professionals executive committee. They have lunch with uh, uh, ASEOU, and uh, perhaps other student groups. Um, they then meet with the faculty senate for 45 minutes. They meet with the university council for 45 minutes. And then they get a brief break because they got to give a speech. 
uh, and they then give uh, an open forum presentation uh, that'll be any member of the, the university community, community can come and attend. Um, and there'll be a reception after that. And they're still not done. Then they have dinner with uh, some representatives of the foundation board and the alumni board members. Uh, the next day starts with uh, breakfast with various community leaders uh, to be named uh, as we develop this. Um, following and then following that, the actual interview. This allows the candidates to have a good sense of the institution and the community before having the interview. It also allows the community to get a good sense of each of the candidates. Um, we're doing this three times. So that's Thursday, Friday of next week, Monday, Tuesday of the following week, and Thursday, Friday of that same week. So that's pretty demanding. And you'll see right from the start right here, there's, uh, there are three meetings that the trustees have to be at, the actual interview. Uh, and that will be uh, the second day of each of those from 9.15 to 10.45. That's not the only meetings we're talking about that the board will need to attend. There are six in total special meetings that are not on your calendar. Uh, I will remind you that we warned you this would come at this part of the process. Uh, and I also want to remind you that our, because of uh, uh, trustees either uh, resigning early or cycling off the board, we're short four slots. We have four vacant slots on this board right now. So that really means, uh, and one of the remaining slots, which is the, the is, is co-president Moore, is a non-voting position. So it really makes it essential that the, the 10 remaining trustees fully participate in what will probably be the most important decision you make. Uh, now, oh, we understand that that's a challenge, but uh, that's what we want to make sure you were well aware of as of today. So next Monday at 3 p.m., a special board meeting to discuss uh, what sort of questions you're going to ask the candidates. Uh, Chris McLaughlin's working up some material, as, uh, and we've worked with Dick Merriman on that and some others. And, and uh, also just uh, general training that all search committees get. And it's at this point, the board is both the hiring manager and the search committee uh, about what kind of questions are illegal to ask and that sort of thing. All essential that you have before you meet your first candidate. Then the three meetings we've already talked about, the actual interviews of candidates. Um, the last one being in the morning of the Friday the 28th. The next Monday is really the ideal time to, for the board to deliberate regarding uh, how they feel about the candidates and to make a tentative choice as to which ones to, uh, which one to at least in, uh, engage in contract negotiations with. Contract negotiations don't always work out, our applicants may be applying other places. So um, things can happen that you, you know, you're not necessarily hoping or, but we'll, we need to have that discussion. And Friday, uh, and Monday the 1st would be the time for that. Because contract negotiations can be somewhat uncertain, we can't tell you when the final meeting is yet, uh, but that would be a public meeting where the board would uh, review the proposed contract that has been negotiated with whomever it's been negotiated with it, and uh, would formally appoint the president. That would be the start of phase, the final phase of the process, which we'll start talking about in a few minutes. But I want to get through this part first. Um, so uh, there's, uh, as you see in the memo, there's some emphasis on the importance of trustee participation. And uh, also, I just want to talk about information. Um, we will uh, be releasing information, application information, cover letters and such from the three finalists to the university community. Uh, each will be released, for each uh, candidate, it'll be released two days before they come. So people who are engaging in these various meetings, other than the board, will have some chance to look at that and think about those, uh, the specifics of each candidate before they meet with them. For the board, uh, we we're, we're actually want you to get access to the information as early as possible for your work. And, and uh, Chris uh, is gonna talk about that. Great, thank you for your attention. I've been assigned your resource for this journey uh, as a board, as a group, 
um, to evaluate the presidential finalists. This is a process that's um, very structured for um, equal opportunity uh, reasons and for best practices reasons. Um, the, the Monday meeting will be very important for you to attend. We're going to uh, um, together uh, understand the process and um, move forward with an agreement to, to work as a unit. The, uh, in a search, it's very important to work as a group um, and be on the same page. Otherwise, the, when you get to the actual candidate evaluation phase, it, it makes a difference between whether it's chaos or whether it's really good discussion on who's going to be our next president. Um, we'll be going over um, the hiring criteria at the time, your role, how to use the hiring criteria, um, and we'll be um, going into depth as far as what questions you want to ask these candidates. I will be giving you a homework assignment in a moment here um, between now and Monday. It's important that you fulfill that homework assignment so that you'll be ready for the Monday meeting. Um, and I'll be at your side the, the, the whole way um, from now through the end of the deliberation meeting. So, thank you. Thank you. This was a university where you were born, you didn't get homework? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> One of, one of the items on the homework is for you to uh, complete some training on implicit bias. Several of you have done this already. You were on the initial search committee. You don't have to re review that. Um, and I will be sending you the other materials, one through three, as, as indicated on this, probably late later this afternoon. Questions? Bless you. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you. Uh, so now we'll move on to, uh, oh, I, Chris just asked, uh, uh, I think Chris asked, just asked if there were any questions. Uh, if there would, or would like to have some more discussion, we can have it. Okay. I'll just say that for some of us, um, actually most of us who are working professionals, we're going to be making some serious adjustments at the last minute to our, our day schedule. So, um, and thank you, Chair Martin, for your nice email yesterday reminding us. So I have a couple of challenges. I'm sure other people have schedule challenges. The search committee, um, it's a lot of work you've completed. So thank you. It's also very exciting and important, as you say, Chris. So Chris, are we ready to go to agenda item five? Uh, uh, it would be the, the actual planned phase of agenda item four, where we talk about the new president orientation. Okay. And you can wrap that up in one minute? Uh, no, we're going to we're going to take some time for that one as well. Okay, please go ahead. I'd, I'd hate to keep, um, if, if we do, I, I, can, can get to agenda item five, that'd be great, because I think we could get through that pretty quickly. Um, sure. Uh, uh, I mentioned to John that he might, we might, might not have time, uh, but uh, if you'd like him to come on up, we can, we can do that. I'm sorry. Sorry, um, I'll, I'll follow your lead. I just, um, I know that we've had a discussion about item five in the past, so I was yeah. thinking we could move forward it fairly quickly yeah. rather than making him wait a month. So, <laughs> Well, uh, let's go ahead and do this next piece so we, okay. can, we can wrap up that whole discussion, and I think we'll have time for John. Okay, thank you. Uh, because this next material, you have, you was in the posted board materials because um, it didn't just happen this week, uh, and um, you've had a, some time to look at uh, I'll go ahead and share that too for just for discussion purposes. Let me make sure I got the right document. Okay, so um, share this.
So as I mentioned, um, the penultimate phase, the actual on-campus interviews, ends with the board having a public meeting where you appoint the president. And that is the start of the final phase of the process, which really goes for uh, a little more than a year. Um, as I mentioned, as those of you who took a look at the cover sheet and perhaps looked at some of the reference materials going on there, uh, this, this presentation is both based on quite current information from several different sources uh, provided by AGB um, and also, uh, uh, well, and, and also there's just some original work in there, uh, and also uh, looking at what Tim prepared for onboarding our last president in 2015. There's little bits of all of that in there. Um, but they're basically, I think I mentioned there's five phases. And they're all a little different. Uh, the first one is the shortest one. That's from the time that you have your, your, or your special public board meeting where you appoint the president uh, until uh, that person actually becomes an employee, which would be July 1st. And that's important to keep in mind because during this period, everyone's excited about the new president. Everyone wants a piece of the new president select, as the term I use, but they're not actually president yet. You've got a president, you've got co-presidents, and they are still in authority until July 1st. So that's the first thing. The other thing is to keep in mind that the president select has got a lot on their plate at this point. They're wrapping up a current job. They are trying, thinking about moving. They uh, they probably starting a house search in Legrand, as you know, which can be a prolonged process. Uh, and yes, we will be probably asking them to do at least a little bit for us in terms of coming to campus once or twice uh, for uh, things that just can't wait. And so that's the first phase. And uh, I both got the key dates that occur in there, uh, as well as uh, a summary of uh, the key activities when it takes place. I won't go through all those. You've had a chance to read them, but I'll be happy to take questions about them. Um, let me get, I'll go through the overview and then if we've got questions, we can address those. The second phase, we now have the new president and uh, they've got 11 weeks before the fall term begins. There's a lot that goes on there and that's where the, the bulk of orientation and, uh, and meeting with different kinds of constituencies happens. Uh, it's important to keep in mind, though, that the new president, while uh, being the executive and governing officer of the university and president of the faculty, is also a brand new employee uh, and has a great deal to learn. He or she has a, a great deal to learn about the institution. Uh, and it's important, while, you know, as with any new employee, to, to stage their orientation, stage their introductions, so as not to overwhelm them too much at the beginning. So I note that uh, everybody's going to want a piece in the new president's time. Everyone's going to have time to kind of talk about their issues. And uh, that can't be ignored. There has to be a structure for that. But you also need to uh, leave the president some time to breathe as well and uh, figure out what uh, she or he are doing. Um, uh, during this time, of course, we have the board retreat. So this will be the new president's time to meet as president with the board. Uh, so that should be a, a, a very interesting <laughs> occasion for us all. Uh, I do a note here, uh, it's usually just considered best advice for new presidents, uh, particularly in a situation where uh, a governing body is, feels their institution is doing fairly well and is not looking for a radical break with the past, that the new president be encouraged not to make major changes during their first year, to take time to learn the institution, learn the people. Uh, and uh, so I, I note that it's sort of anticipated the board will, uh, will uh, send that message, but of course you'll make your own decisions about that. Um, I also just want to note that the president might be in an apartment, uh, probably will be in an apartment during this period. They'll be trying to do some house searching and as you know, that can be demanding and that's another piece of it. Uh, aside from the, uh, the board retreat, of course, there's, um, will also be the Oregon Council Presence Retreat. So they'll get introduced to their uh, colleagues uh, by then, if not earlier. I, I, might, I should have mentioned actually during the prior phase, uh, one of the things we might ask the uh, 
president select to come in to do would be uh, if we wanted to take a chance, an opportunity to take them to meet legislators while the legislature is in session. It's a, we did that last time. It, it's just a thing. Anyway, so uh, moving on to the third phase. Uh, the academic year has begun. It begins with convocation, which is a speech by the president. Um, and uh, also the opportunity for the president to start interacting with the folks who have not been here. Uh, so shared governance and um, meet, uh, this would be an opportunity to tour the various colleges and talk to deans and faculty, each of them individually. Um, and that's a part, that's a big part of it. Uh, and then as the term goes on, um, the work becomes more the daily work of a president. Uh, I, I, as of course, we've got board meetings uh, during that time some, and some holidays and, and um, homecoming um, and the week for enrollment report. These are all important things that are happening then. Um, the fourth phase is uh, essentially winter and spring terms, uh, completing the first year. As I note, this is a very intense time, uh, the most intense time at the university. Um, it's the time when if the president administration are wanting to accomplish certain things that they want to be consulting with shared governance about. They really need to do that. If they haven't started, they need to start and, and, and do that before the year ends or it will wait again till the fall. Uh, we have two board meetings this time and various uh, committee meetings and we'll have a short session of the legislature. So uh, that gives you some sense of what uh, the rhythm of the work. Uh, one thing that's in here I hadn't mentioned until now, I realize um, the, as any new employee, the president will need regular uh, uh, time with their supervisor to kind of get advice and get direction and check on how things go. And if you look at this schedule, you can see that during the first phase and the second phase, uh, uh, and, and this, is all, this is all projection, right? Things can change. We're not officially adopting this. This is sort of an, an idea of what might happen. Uh, that uh, the president meets weekly with the board chair, who uh, under board statement number two is, is, is designated as the uh, administrative supervisor of the president. But then on regular intervals, I set, estimate here every three weeks, uh, the president would, the board chair might be, uh, that meeting might be supplemented by attendance from the committee chairs and the board vice chair, uh, essentially in a role advising the chair in the supervision role, but uh, providing feedback to the president. And that pattern would follow through the fall. Uh, once, the, once we're into uh, the uh, beginning of the next calendar year, those meetings might be a little less frequent. Um, but um, I still want, I wanted to, in addition to the regular board meetings, that's just an opportunity for the president to get regular feedback. And then uh, that period, of course, ends with, um, with commencement and uh, the start of the next summer. Now, um, and I actually call this last phase, uh, that's, that's the fifth phase, I call this last phase the final phase because um, it's the first normal summer the president and the university will have. Uh, and though there are things that happen every summer, typically, including the board's uh, own evaluation of its performance and the board's first evaluation of the president's performance in their first year. Um, there are some other things going on, uh, uh, both uh, well, I, I mentioned in there about the in the hall disruption. So the president won't have an office for in the usual place for the first year, but by next summer we'll be moving back into in low hall. Um, and finally, I note that summer is typically a time when senior administrators try to get a little vacation in. And as with any new employee, you want to make sure they're taking care of their personal lives and their personal issues and. Uh, the board will probably want to encourage the president to think about taking a little time off during that time. That's the overview. I'm uh, happy to take any questions about that. I read that through just before I went to bed last night and it kind of exhausted me, but thank you for the overview. <laughs> <laughs> it's a big job. Yeah, <laughs>
Well, part of the reason I wanted to be able to put this together is um, this transition in the, in the executive of the university is a momentous one. And uh, I wanted you to be under sort of get some sense of what it's going to feel like for the president, um, but also for your role as trustees of the institution uh, and maintain making sure that it's not too disruptive to the institution either. Um, and it's help. I thought it was helpful to kind of pull together in one place all the various threads that on a week to week basis will kind of be coming at people. Oh, you know, now we've got our first faculty senate meeting. Oh, now we've got homecoming. Oh, now we've got, oh, there's a, we take a day off for Veterans Day. Who knew? Uh, and so <laughs> it's also, it's, it's a planning tool for the board, for the university, and for uh, the, the new president. And I'm hoping that having that available as a resource will help sort of just make the transition a little smoother for everybody. And, but also things, things, things will go wrong on occasion, right? And uh, this also provides some framework for people to kind of talk about, okay, why did that happen that way? Where did we miss a step? Uh, and uh, also to make that not too, uh, oh, I, I don't know, too, too, too high tension a conversation. Uh, yes, oh, Mari too. Chris, I really appreciate this. Not, not only because of uh, the EOU presidential search, but um, a similar document should be developed for many other jobs that we have been at and or, you know, colleagues that joined organization that were part of and whatnot. So this is really, this is pretty nice. It's kind of a points forward with some key elements and key dates that it could be useful to imitate for other Thing. So, but I really appreciate it. Thank you. It's a good projection of 12 months or 14 months. Very nice. Thank you. You're welcome. I, I think it's really helpful. I just, uh, could I have you be in charge of my calendar too? Because I, I need this level of organization. <laughs> you should ask Pepper about that. <laughs> well, excellent. Thank you. Um, thank you for that. Uh, do we have time? to squeeze uh, in agenda item five. I believe so. Oh, come on up. It's your lucky number, John. John Garlitz, the floor is yours. I need to turn your mic on. Thank you for reminding me. Uh, this is what we alluded to last board meeting, I believe, is coming back to you with an adjustment. Um, what this does is it adjusts the capital projects from a $1 million threshold to $2 million threshold. I don't want to say that two million two million is the new one million, but two million in terms of predicting where a project lands, um, that's kind of the about the same level of accuracy. Um, plus, I just also want to make everybody aware that projects, regardless of whatever level, always go through the budgeting process. So Leanne would um, be remiss if I so none of none of these would fall outside of the budgeting policy. Um, excellent. Do, does anybody have any questions for John? I was just going to ask to make sure that Leanne sure. was good with you Le sharing all this. I, I double checked with uh, I double and triple check with Leanne. Also. Okay, <laughs> I assume you do. It it does seem like um, a million and two million still feels like a lot of money to me, um, but I appreciate capital projects are even maintenance projects yeah, are and also, very I expensive. I think I alluded to it in the documents is the frequency of board meetings kind of helps facilitate this you know unlike other boards which they're meeting monthly it's easier to get in front during the bidding period when we're opening bids thank you would anybody like to make a motion i need to see what the motion would be here uh, i uh, we're proposing an amendment to board statement number two to the portion which talks about the uh, which contracts the board is delegating authority to prove to the president and which ones have to come to the board for approval. Uh, and that, that's and, in our packet agenda item. It's labeled six, but I think it's actually five. And so all yes. the red line would yeah, be. I'd, the I'd be happy to make that motion as Chris stated. 
So I actually have a proposed motion there in uh, in the cover sheet. Uh, if that's the one you want to make. Uh, <laughs> that, that's exactly the one I want. <laughs> All right. Oh, I, I see. Second. It's on the it's on the third page. Gotcha. Okay, so Brad made the motion, and Anna has seconded it. Um, do we need to do a roll call, or can I do? Consensus? Oh, I think yes. Okay. Consensus. Okay, thank you. A motion made by Trustee Stevens and seconded by Trustee Kevin Otto. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. And opposed? Excellent. Thank you. Does this uh, this is just a motion to bring before the full board? That's right. Yeah. Yes, it was a recommendation from the committee to the board. Thank you, Chair Martin. Uh, I think that concludes our uh, governance committee meeting today. Any final comments or notes before we take a quick break and move into any closing remarks? A whole lot to cover, a whole lot to go on. Thank you for keeping us prepared and organized. Um, so this concludes the, the governance committee meeting of um, April 12th, 2023.
Thanks. Turn that off for a moment. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the uh, meeting uh, um, of the Academic and Student Affairs Committee. Um, I'm here uh, on behalf of Bill Johnson, who could not join us this afternoon. So I will be chairing this meeting today. So prior to roll call, we have a few announcements. So uh, Jordan, would you please read your announcements? Thank you, Chair. Um, please use the tabletop microphones when speaking so we may record today's meeting and ensure that those listening via the live stream may hear. Secondly, we encourage you to silence your cell phones to limit disruptions during this meeting. Uh, this meeting is open to the public to attend in person or via the broadcast. A recording of the meeting will be accessible from the board's web page until the following meeting. And lastly, if there is anyone present in person who wishes to give public comment, please be sure to sign the sign-in sheet at the recorder's desk located in the back corner of the room. That concludes the announcements. Thank you. We'll then proceed with the roll call. So Bill Johnson could not be here, So, and I'm also here, so I don't have to call my own name. But I will uh, um, proceed with uh, Lara Moore. Present. Tamra Mabat. Present. Deidre Schreiber. Present. Cedric Rio. Present. Maurizio Valerio. Present. And George Mendoza. Present. Great. Thank you. Uh, we are going to move now to, to the announcements. The first item of our agenda will be a few housekeeping items. Again, Jordan, would you please share these items with the committee? Happy to. Uh, our only announcement at this time is that we have received no in-person requests to um, speak for public comment. And that concludes my announcements. OK, thank you. Does anyone else have any other announcement at this time? Hearing none, this concludes the announcement portion of our agenda. We're going to move on to the consent items. So the only consent items that we have is the review and approval of the minutes from January 25th. Would any of the uh, committee members like to discuss these minutes? Are there any changes or anything else? No. Do I hear a motion to approve? So moved. Second. Okay, the motion has been moved by Trustee Mendoza and a second by Trustee Rio. Um, all in favor, please say hi. 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 So motion passed. Thank you. Okay, at this time, I would like uh, to ask uh, Chris McCuffin to share some information with the committee in regards to the presidential search. Thank you, Chair, or committee chair. Um, this is uh, the third announcement today, and I want to just take uh, advantage of you meeting here in the committees to give you a homework assignment associated with your obligation to um, uh, interview the final candidate candidates in the presidential search upcoming. So uh, you will soon, uh, you already see some correspondence in that from Chris Burford. I will be sending you additional correspondence and materials probably later this afternoon. And in the meantime, I, I want to give you as much advance notice as possible of what your homework is. And Leanne, I believe just, uh, helped pass that out. Thank you very much. Um, uh, Pepper, if you could, Where'd Pepper go? Uh, Any, anyway, if somebody could send me a list of the trustees that haven't been here today, I'll make sure that they they also get the homework assignment. Thank you. If you have questions, um, don't hesitate to call me. Thank you or email. Thank you so much, Chris. Okay, we are going now uh, to move on to the action items, and the very first. Action item is an update from Rhea Newman, interim dean of the College of Education, and this is regarding a new program, the Master of Social Work. 
So welcome, Rayad. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon to the Academic and Student Affairs Committee. Thank you so much for this opportunity to talk to you about this very exciting program that we are proposing here this afternoon. Um, per the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics, the job outlook um, for social workers is projected to grow 9% from 2021 to 2031, faster than the average, um, the average for all occupations. About 74,700 openings for social workers are projected each year and on average over the decade. Many of those openings are expected to result from the need to replace workers who transfer to different occupations or exit the labor force, such as retirees. So that's just a little bit of background. Excuse me, I have to share my presentation. There we go. Um, that's just a little bit of the background of why we are presenting um, this uh, program to you this afternoon. Um, with that, I do wanna again, thank you for the time this afternoon. Um, the timeline of this program, it has been on the College of Education's mind since prior to 2018. I have been in the College of Education, Education since 2013, and this has been always a discussion. There's multiple pro programs that we talk about. We talk about social work, we talk about counseling, and we talk about administration. This is the fruition of one of those programs coming to light. Um, in 2019, this program, the MSW specifically, um, was part of the Wiley contract moving forward. Um, at the time, there was discussion as to where this program should go. And at that moment in time, it was provided to the College of um, Arts, Humanities, and Social Sciences with the anticipated start date of fall of 2023. Uh, academic years 2020 and 2021, um, the program is being developed by outside um, entities um, that we had hired to develop this program, the curriculum, um, to align with um, accreditation standards for the social work um, profession. In 2022, um, there was the presentation of the program within the College of CAS, and um, unfortunately, they did not um, want this program as how it was developed. So at that time, um, the College of Education was offered to um, move forward with the program and the College of Education absolutely jumped on this opportunity. As I said earlier um, to 2018, we have been looking for opportunities to get this program into the College of Education. Across multiple colleges, um, the College of Education does house the, um, the social work program. So this is not something that is different. Um, this is something that is um, typical to smaller universities and to where this program is housed is within the College of Education. So currently the academic year 2023 and 24, we are going through the shared governance process and I do wanna share that process with you. Um, and then we're gonna be talking about hiring, hopefully for this program as we move forward. So the shared governance process that we have gone through, uh, when this program came back to the College of Education, the program was already developed. Um, that saved us a lot of time. Again, there were experts in the field that had developed this. They were uh, paid consultants that did all this work. So it was lovely that we didn't have to go through that. Um, we, we, I presented um, the MSW along with the chair of the, the interim chair of the College of Education at our opening session at the beginning of this academic year. The College of Education uh, took the vote and we decided to move forward uh, with this program as it was developed. We then took the program to the Educational Policy and Curriculum Committee in October. Uh, we had discussions there about it. It was then moved forward at, from the EPCC to the Faculty Senate. It was then moved in November. I pulled it off of the agenda at that point. We had a discussion, but it was not up for vote. The reason for that is the end of, um, there was some communication that we had come in support of the program from other entities that was not included on the agenda. So that was, they did not have enough time to review all of the supporting evidence and all of the documents that we wanted shared at that point. So that's why it was pulled. It was again brought forward again in December and that's when it was approved to move forward um, at the Senate level. So uh, apparently when you need to move the M. Uh, the curriculum, there are two pathways for this. This pathway is available for individuals who have a background in social work or in sociology and those who do not. So that's why there's the different of two pathways. Um, it is developed utilizing the 2022 Council on Social Work Education Accreditation Standards. 
Uh, one of the things that we know about this program is it needs to be accredited within the first three years because all these individuals need to be in an accredited an accredited program. So that's going to be something that's very important as we're thinking and moving forward um, with how we roll this program out and collecting the data. Um, one of the things I know through my experience in the College of Education and the process of accreditation it's a lot easier to develop a program utilizing standards than it is to develop a program and then align it to standards. So in the development of this program, we feel like it is um, done accurately. It meets all of the standards that are needed for accreditation. There are 72 credit hours and 900 field practicum hours that are required for the Masters of Social Work. So if you are an individual who is coming into the MSW and has no previous experience in this, but this is now where your heart is drawing you towards, you're going to need to do 72 hours and 900 hours of field experience. Um, if you have had experience in social work, um, coursework or sociology or anthropology, you're going to be able to apply for advanced standing of which you're only going to need to do 36 hours and 500 field practicum hours are required for this aspect if you're meeting this timeline. So we do have two different pathways that allow for more individuals to come into this program moving forward. The delivery of this program is going to be online. This is very important as we think about our region, as we think about our state, and as we think about the needs that we need to make sure we are addressing. Uh, we have the MAT program in our College of Education currently, which is the Masters of Arts in Teaching. This is a hybrid program where we have students come onto campus uh, for a residency week and then uh, four weekends with one of those weekends being online. Part of the discussions when we were talking about this and having discussions with the sociology department and, and um, faculty senate is, well, why is this not an online program? It's, or excuse me, on, on campus program. We need to make sure we are providing access to this program far and wide. We have a drought in regards to social work. We need to make sure we're getting access to as many individuals who are interested in this profession as possible. Um, and part of the delivery and putting it online is just so we can also address those individuals um, who are working and who are place bound because they have homes where they are currently living with children that they cannot pick up and move to attend uh, EURU uh, on campus courses. So this is actually going to give us more opportunity to provide social workers in the areas that we need um, social workers, which is traditionally smaller town rural environments because we just don't have access. So this program is going to provide access. The schedule of the cohort is provided here. Um, you're going to see there's five academic years listed. Um, it is color coded because it was a lot easier to present it this way than try to figure out how we were doing and playing with all of these numbers as we were moving forward. It starts with the green cohort. I talked about um, the advanced cohort stepping in at some point, and that's what this, uh, they come in the second year during spring term. All individuals would end at the end of spring term. When we're looking at the schedule, it's a two and a half year program. They start in, win it is proposed that they will start in winter term and they will go for two and a half years. They take uh, approximately three to four classes every term they are in program to fulfill those 72 credits that they need to fulfill for um, the accredited program. So this is just a diagram of how the rollout of those cohorts happen. You'll see in academic year 26, 20, or excuse me, 25, 26, we would actually have two um, traditional programs starting. They would have that green one, which is the first one, and the start of the second cohort during winter term. Um, so you're going to see there are going to be a little bit of timing where we're going to have a lot of students in this program, and then there's going to be some graduating out. Um, so it was just a lot easier, and that's um, what this diagram is showing is the colors of stopping and starting of those individual cohorts and moving forward. Um, so that's that piece. We did talk about um, starting this program differently. What if we started in fall term and went four terms, meaning all the way through summer? Could they get done? Yes, they could get done. We talked about starting program in summer and ending at the end of their second spring. We do have options as to how we prevent, present this um, delivery schedule. Um, but right now, this is what we are proposing because we do know that these individuals are traditionally, um, they're coming in as um, traditional master students. They're going to be a little bit older. They're going to have lives and jobs that they're going to have to fulfill during this time as well. So we want to make sure that our program is flexible um, and allows for as many possible students into this program. According to the accreditation standards, um, 
it indicates that there are no fewer than four full-time faculty within the program. So we are proposing with these numbers that we have, um, we have four faculty members that we would be hiring. The first one is the director and the second one is the field director. Each of these individuals per accreditation standards are required to teach 50% in the program and 50% into these administrative duties. Uh, this is similar to uh, the counseling program that is currently in um, recruitment stages. Um, so that's very similar to something that's already available on this campus. We would then be hiring two instructors after that first academic year, because with the numbers that we are projecting, those two individuals could teach all of those classes during that first academic year. So we would not need to hire those until uh, later in the program. There is also a staff, um, a classified staff member that would also be hired to assist in the development um, and deliver, not delivery, um, but the, the office aspects of this program as well, just because it is another uh, master's program and it takes a lot more time. And because it is accredited, we need to make sure we're following all of the processes to, um, to make sure we meet the accreditation standards. So that person is there and is in budget as well. We talk about enrollment projections. I just added this to um, the exact same timeline I shared a little bit earlier. Um, the one thing I really wanna point out and one of the reasons why this program has been delayed getting here. I, I shared with you going through all of the um, other shared governance um, conversations um, with faculty. And one of the reasons we pulled it back is because the numbers we were getting from Wiley were very high. Um, they were talking about a, a number of about 150 coming in. That sounds fantastic and I want nothing more than 150 students. However, I need to come in with a little bit different perspective. So what I did is I took my, my personal judgment, um, given permission from um, interim provost steamers. Um, I worked with Leanne Case um, and we just took what we knew from our current master's programs um, and came up with these numbers. They are low. I want them to be low because the only thing I can do is go higher than low. Um, but these are existing numbers that I would like to propose. And if we go much higher than these, I will be dancing more than I already do. Um, but I really just wanted to be very realistic with what we're doing. So our first cohort would be a cohort of 12 to 15. We would then be increasing that. Again, the green shows that original cohort, so that's not an increase of a number in that second year. That's the maintaining number. Uh, we would have 10 in the advanced, meaning they have some, again, some sort of um, experience in social work or um, sociology already. And then we would be starting that second cohort. That's how we came up with a total of 34. And we cap it at a total of 56 from that point forward. That is um, minimal cohorts and showing all of it across the board. So that's why we did that. So this is a little bit different proposal. It's not um, astronomical numbers, but I do think it's real numbers, but I also hope that they are low numbers. But I want it to be very realistic moving forward at this time with this program. So the remaining program rollout as we are talking, um, this next academic year, um, right now we are still going through all of these different processes. Uh, if given approval from this committee, we will then go to uh, the full board of trustees, get permission there. Um, it does still need to go to um, the provost council. It needs to go to the HEC. And then we do want this program also to go to TSPC because this is how we're going to get those licensed social workers into our schools. So we have to do all of these different pieces yet. Um, with that, that timeline in mind uh, for academic 23-24, we would like to start the hiring of the director, the field director, and that classified staff. Uh, we would like the program and class development um, to be happening during that time as well. And most important is going to be the recruitment, which is why I've really stalled. I've stalled a couple times in regards to presenting this program. And this is one of them, as we've had a couple programs throughout our campus that have had very short rollout times from the moment they are approved to when we start um, teaching them and there is zero time for recruitment and our numbers in those programs show it. I need to make sure that does not happen with this program. I need to make sure we have the appropriate time to recruit for this program. Fall of, oops, there's an error there, fall of 20, 24, 25, this is a year behind, excuse me, uh, there's a program in class development happening and again, continued recruitment. The actual start for this program is actually going to be winter of 25, not 24. And with that, 
I will answer any questions that you may have about this program. Thank you for your time. Thank you, yes. Rhea. Yep. Are there any questions? Uh, I just want to commend you for taking this on in the um, it wasn't intuitive to think that this would be in the College of Education. Uh, it's making more sense, um, just like our discussion a week or so ago yep. about the connection between teacher recruitment and housing and the nexus there. So yep. um, commendable the work Thank you've you. done. It looks really promising. Thank you. Trustee Mendoza, go ahead. And mine's probably a little bit uh, different than Tamara's because I, I wasn't here at the last academic student affairs. But I am crazy about you, Rayette. Um, it was College of Arts, Science, Humanities. Boom. Can you just one more time for me explain why it went to College of Education? Sure. And then after that, I'll have some other questions. Sure. So there, there was no, I have, I'm going to do this in a very particular way. So I need to think about my words I'm going to use. Um, we had to hire outside consultants because we did not have the individuals available to create this program. They didn't have the expertise in this area. Um, we do have social work, um, excuse me, we have sociology um, in the uh, department. Um, they are associated with anthropology as well. We just don't have it specific to um, the social work aspect completely. So we had to hire this out. So when Dean Lowe started development of this program, he had hired, he had asked for opportunities for those individuals to come in and collaborate and help um, in the development of this program. Unfortunately, they did not want to participate in any of these development opportunities that he had provided to them. Um, and so when it was coming to light that this program was not going to be successful and move forward in that college, that the College of Education um, started talking with the provost at the time, who was Provost Witt, um, about the opportunity of kind of taking this program back. Because initially, I talked about before 2018, we've talked about social work, we've talked about counseling, we've talked about leadership. Um, we wanted that back. We knew that it lived in the College of Education. Education, we knew that it has um, the benefits for students, and that's where we needed it to be. So when that started going out, um, it was we were starting to have those conversations. That was at the transition time um, from Provost Witt to um, Interim Provost um, Seamers and to myself as the Interim Dean of the College of Education. Uh, so when that official transition happened, um, Dean Lau still had opportunities to see if his um, college would like to um, take this program and and have this program and in each time they voted down no okay thank you for that for yes. me and I, thank you for the background I, I don't i didn't have that before i didn't remember at least um and then the last part of it or the two parts i'll just give you two parts explaining the role of um uh um i don't know why it's escaping me pearson not pearson it's wiley what wiley and what is their place within that and how much are they supporting with curriculum or staffing or any of the background from my perspective you would think wiley has kind of a backbone and an infrastructure in place that would really support with all of that and i don't think i heard that in this presentation right and then and if we didn't go with that because it's online but we're taking it doing it when we had wiley as the i'll just say the support structure in place i wanted to understand that I'll just say the nexus of that. Sure. And then just from a from a practical standpoint, um, there are school districts that are going to want licensed social workers, but there's far more school districts that want counselors. So whatever that, that might be, uh -huh. if you embed some counseling type classes so that they're actually certified as counselors, if they, they have the TSPC licensure, that might be a nice overlay um, with some of those classes. Um, yep. Because if you ask me, we look for counselors. And if we can't get counselors, we might settle for licensed social workers. Yep. Yep. Okay. So I'm going to address the first question, which is the role of Wiley. Um, so this comes to, I believe it's Appendix C when Wiley contract was um, signed. This is one of the programs that they um, had requested be developed. Uh, so that's part of the development and, and why this program is on, on the table of why it was developed. Um, so the role of Wiley is traditional to any of the other roles that we have with Wiley. They don't actually do the development. They don't do the curriculum de, um, creation or any of that. It's more in the recruitment of students um, and, and into the pipeline of EOU. So that will remain Wiley's um, 
perspective niche into this program as well it is a specific college of education program the curriculum will be ours it'll be social works curriculum um it'll be um the traditional pathway that that Wiley does with any of the other programs, which is basically marketing and getting students into the program, which right now we've had conversations, um, this committee, or excuse me, the board has had conversations about how EOU needs to consider maybe doing that on their own um, in the future. But right now that's really what we're use, utilizing them for in regards to this program. So they've had no impact on the curriculum or the staffing of this. Um, in regards to adding those additional classes, absolutely. Um, one of the things many of you know about the College of Education is we um, pride ourselves on continuous improvement. So whatever I can do to get those classes in there, we will make sure that we can do. We do also do um, want to develop the partnership with the Masters of Counseling. Um, and see what we can do in collaboration there. There is some a slide that I skipped. Um, I apologize for that, but there is some opportunity for partnership. We talk about um, how this program previously lived in a different college and, and how it came to um, the College of Education. So part of the development when the College of Education took it over and before it was going through the various processes of um, shared governance, I had met with the sociology department and asking how we can partner with them. Um, so together we came up with these three ways for partnership. I, we want to make sure that we meet with them uh, just to make sure that there is no overlap of placements. That is a concern that they had when we were moving forward. Um, their program is, is um, pretty much local and we want to make sure that we are not um, impeding in on any of those placements and which is one of the reasons why it's going to be really important that this program is online because we want to make sure those individuals have opportunities in the towns that they are in so we are not um, imposing on any of those um, current placements that they are using for that program. The other opportunity is for cross-curricular collaboration to develop curriculum with the rural focus. Um, there are um, some elective courses. There are currently three of them in the program. And the nice thing that we're going to be able to do with a partnership with them through our conversations um, is just to make sure that our program is up to date and meeting the needs of the region that we know are um, issues that we need to be addressing and preparing our professionals for. And the third thing is an opportunity for those social faculty to teach in the classes. Um, part of this discussion I had with them, um, I had one faculty member say they would be willing to teach into the program. They just want to make sure it's accredited first. I can, I can respect that, but I have to get to the accreditation part first, which means I have to have a program first. So it's chicken egg conversation there. Uh, yeah, just a quick question. Sure. Uh, first off, thank you for your presentation. I think the program looks really wonderful, and I have no doubt that you guys can make a successful program out of it. Um, my question is, I'm looking at just the financial mm -hmm. um, analysis of this program, and this is more for, I suppose, our financial people in the room. Um, but our cash flows, both cumulative direct and cumulative overall, including with indirect costs, even through the whole forecast, are in the negative. And that is also with um, an assumption that we can get 56 students starting in fiscal year 2027 and maintaining that number. I guess my question is, and this isn't just in regards to this one program, but with some of the various programs we've been adding in the recent years, and some of our discussions we've been having with the programs that we're adding, I just wonder if we are stretching a little bit with what we can do as an institution at this time. Um, that's just one of my questions because this is very dependent on enrollment as any program is going to be. And in the best case scenario, all the way through this forecast, uh, um, we're, st we're still negative while it's decreasing and we are catching up and getting to that point where it's positive. It's negative for a while and i just wonder if this institution is in a place to make or pull that trigger on adding um a new program like this but i think the program definitely has a lot of opportunities for sure and i love the presentation but that's my main concern and full disclosure um leanne can probably come tell you as well but this what we are presenting to you today is what did we call it what number what number is this <laughs> oh, yeah. um number 99 number 99 we have looked at this program so many different ways what does enrollment look like what does it look like if we run a complete cohort through what does it look 
like if we presented how we did today? What does it look like if we do um, the summer start through spring for the two years? We've gone through so many of these different pieces. There are different pieces where we're out and out of the red a little bit sooner. Um, there's pieces where we stayed in the red a lot longer. Um, but this is the one I'm presenting today is the one that I felt most comfortable moving forward forward with. So don't think this came lightly. And this is why it's taken until April for us to be presenting here because we've been working on this for months. I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you. Thank you for that. And thank you for proving me right because she asked me who would ask a finance question and I said it would be you. <laughs> so thank you. Um, I'll just answer um, speak to your question about are we stretching ourselves too thin? Are we going too far? When we entered into the agreement with Wiley and um, we were bringing all of these programs on and they were stacked and they were staggered out so that we weren't doing all of this at the same time. Unfortunately, because of COVID and the pandemic, um, we're a little bit more condensed. So yes, to be perfectly honest, yes, we are. Um, but those programs that we've brought on should now be entering into where they are performing as we expected. So those areas um, where we're underwater right now should be performing better, which will help this program and help our entire cash flow as we move forward. Um, Rand did an excellent job um, piggybacking on um, Dr. Lau's work as well in putting this together. She's not exaggerating when she says we've been through about a hundred of these over the last three years and looking at it. This is probably the most realistic um, pro forma we have put in front of you over the last three years since we entered into the Wiley contract. Rand did an excellent job of being <clears throat> being realistic in her enrollment numbers um, while at the same time looking at the financial obligations that go along with those. Um, we had a lot of conversations about not making it look like it would work um, just because we know that this is a program that is in such high demand um, that we need to bring it on, but we wanted to be realistic and bring something forward to you that, that um, we felt good about in the end. Um, you, you mentioned um, just now that we should be at the point where we're starting to see the outcomes from some of those other programs. Can you elaborate a little into that? Because I'm just curious on that as far as I guess the question to be direct in my mind is, do we wait on this program another year to actually see the fruition of how those other programs are doing before we bank on, hey, are they doing all right? Well, they'll help support this program. I would want to be confident that they actually are um, before ending up adding this program and not giving it the real financial shot that it deserves um absolutely and, and i think that's a valid a valid question as well that the board would have to entertain um waiting another year pushes us out another year which just puts us one more year behind the competition and bringing this on all right it's already pushed it out to winter of 25 um so we've taken into account some of that so you have to get started to be able to build that curriculum and, and get a structure in place. I, I think that Ray had also spoke to it a little bit on the marketing and the recruitment side of things. She didn't have two years to recruit. Those programs that we feel aren't doing as well um, as we had anticipated, some of that is obviously from the pandemic and just recovering from that. But we've also heard that that's because we didn't have a long enough track for recruitment. So we're starting to, we should start to see some of the effects of that recruitment and being able to be out and doing 24 to 24 months of recruitment now for some of those programs that we just started. And the hope is that we would be able to um, develop our own pathways within the social program here and say, once you are done with this program, if this is something you're interested in, you feed right into this program. So that's part of those other opportunities we're in development of. Um, we do have outside um, letters of support for this program um, from individuals in the community and the region saying, as soon as you have this, we have individuals we would like to get through the program as well. So um, thank you. Yeah, I just mentioned one other thing that might help with this program as we get into student recruitment, and that is that there's already been a donor uh, who has pledged uh, $300,000 over five years for scholarships for master's level in both of our both of the programs that you mentioned. I think that's going to attract students uh, here and help the program get started faster. Uh Thank you, Chair Kavanado. I just really briefly 
Um, if you haven't already, um, Community Counseling Solutions is the nonprofit that provides mental health um, services to all of Eastern Oregon, I think, maybe with the exception of one county. They would be a tremendous partner if you haven't already covered them. So they're very generous with sending their employees to get further training, et cetera. They're always in need of MSW and other counselors. So thanks. Nice presentation. Great. Thank you. Chair Martin, go ahead. Yeah, I just wanted to say we have um, had presentations of lots of um, incoming programs. That was so well done. Very, very good. I could tell a teacher did it. <laughs> Yes. I also want to say, um, you know, as we look at it, I, I think we have to kind of evolve with where we see needs and sometimes the programs that we're bringing on are addressing a big need in our society right now and our schools are desperately needing these kind of services. So I think if you can um, bring that counseling piece into it, it would be great and I have all the confidence in the world you can do that. And the other thing is, I wondered if Provost um, Niemer, Seamers, sorry, <laughs> Nate Seamers, if Provost Seamers has any, just a, a couple of things that you'd like to add to that? Well, the reason why she was so calm is a, um, a, a smooth classroom never made a skillful teacher. So it was really good navigating the waters. We worked close on this because I was exiting as she was coming into the role. And so we actually had to have a lot of crucial conversations about the impact this program would bring on the College of Education, but also the region and also the nation because it moves online. So um, there were a lot of opportunities for the region. And I know those opportunities exist because I was invited to a social hour at the landing by the OHSU provost coming and welcoming um, her new role and um, coming to the region. And I was amazed, well, uh, Tim was there and um, President Moore was there and how many people from the local community shared excitement about this program and the Masters in Counseling. Um, people from Grand Ron Clinic, Grand Ron Hospital, um, other clinics across the state. And so the word spread fast, um, but it's, it's, it's actually going to take some time. To your point, um, Trustee Real, we've got to look at this from the financial lens, but also the, also, I would say the um, the process review lens because we're I'm getting into kind of a leap forward mode of analyzing program um, and how, program growth, program development, and getting into a deep dive analysis on how our programs are performing. And I'll be talking about that at the sort of the end of this agenda. So it's it's been it's been a good opportunity, a growing opportunity for Eastern Oregon University. Um, there are concerns, and those concerns are with other institutions of higher education that compete with us. So I had a conversation with the provost of Portland State University and the interim dean, Jose Toll, about the program. And they said, well, whatever you do, don't bring trucks here advertising your program because they usually have approximately 700 applicants for their program and they matriculate around 252. So we know that the, the, the proliferation or need is there. We just got to figure out the market values of that. And anytime you launch a new program, you need to bump out six months of marketing and marketing is an advertising. And so there are some, you know, complications in a challenging way throughout that process. So we're going to do it right. And we're going to take our time through the process and make sure that it's successful. Thank you. Thank Trustee you. Valerio. Uh, kudos to the great presentation and, and more so, thank you for trying to be realistic with the numbers. In one of the tables presented in the materials, the number were 30, 90, 163. Now, if we plug these, those numbers back into this prospect here, the picture changes completely, right? So the question is, how do we balance those two? Do we go the pessimistic way, in which case this one makes today, is very frightening, financially speaking, because it takes a long time not just to break even, but to carry on losses. However, if the number are slightly more optimistic, it will be a slam dunk. So my question, the second question is, who is the competition? Are we stepping into a field of master of social worker that has 17 different institutions offering something similar, or are we filling a gap? Sure. So right now there are 
three that are offering this program. Um, currently, it's George, um, George Fox, which is full time in person. So that, that's going to limit the individuals there. The other one is PSU, um, which does have face-to-face -face with, um, with some online components. Um, and the next one was going to be Pacific, and they were just going to start coming on um, fall of 23. So there is a huge need for this. Um, we This is all that we have in the state. So do you want to? And I could just add to that that there are other trues who are uh, – interested in a, in a program like this, even some discussions with legislators about funding. And so waiting a year could actually make a difference in our ability to be first in and successful. Thank you. And to carry forward a little bit more into that question is, that's why this team took their time to really analyze the finances, to make you know mathematical sense around the reality of the finances, instead of just saying, we're going to we're going to hit a 300 mark or 160 mark. There was really no logic in that kind of design. So we just quantified the numbers and it took an additional two months to really get down to the, the bottom of the reality of what this thing would produce. And it could always go up, but we always, we like that scenario versus it consistently trending down. Are there any other questions? Uh Personally, my comment is that it, I have no doubts that this is a very uh, needed program. Um, when I looked at the pro forma, I was scared. I saw those red numbers. Uh, so what I'm getting from you, from Leanne, is that this is a very conservative outlook on this program. And uh, hopefully those numbers are actually larger than what you're anticipating because that's the only way that you're going to convince me because <laughs> I, I i really when i saw those numbers it was like wow you know and we are going down to 2032 and it's yes. still in the negative correct and as um trustee of valerio said there are numbers that came out if you look further back in some of these documentations where numbers are at 160. i just don't feel confident getting there in three years so I just need to, I, I needed to be very conservative, conservative for my own numbers and for my own um, mental well-being moving this forward. Yeah, I'd like to also add, just to help everybody understand, program review begins, this is alpha. And then by the time we look at how the program is launched is omega. And so this is thorough program review. And so um, Dean Newman and AVP um, Case began reviewing this program thoroughly under a microscope, looking at the finances, looking at the logic behind what was handed to us to actually, you know, realistic calculated numbers. And so we attach this to a program review process. We remember how we lifted it up and raised it a little bit, and then we analyzed it through the entire process for consistency. Oh, I want to think. Um, we did ask for Wiley to update their numbers, and they upped their numbers. Um, and that's when I felt even less confident in their numbers. Um, so if my numbers are absolutely low, fantastic, which I anticipate they will be, but I just needed to move forward with something realistic. And to be clear, those aren't setting caps for growth. They're just what we predict with expansion capabilities. Because we work in a cohort, a cohort means a band of warriors. And so a band of warriors are people going through the program. Very good. So I'm um, just making sure that there are no further questions or comments. If not, um, is there a motion to the board to recommend approval of this topic as presented? I would like to make a motion to approve the new program, Masters of Social Work. So um, Trustee uh, Riol has uh, moved. Is there a second? I'll second that. OK, Trustee. Uh, <laughs> uh, as uh, seconded. Um, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes. Uh, congratulations. Thank you for your time. Okay. All right. So we are now um, 
moving uh, on to the next action item, um, and this will be uh, presented by Board Secretary Chris Burfer. So, please, Chris, please proceed. Thank you. Uh, this is this item's been waiting a while. It's been on two prior agendas at the end of this meeting schedule and not been had not been addressed. Uh, so uh, we have a half hour on this schedule. Um, we're starting seventeen minutes late. So I hope you're not planning on ending this meeting at four. Uh, <laughs> and I say that because. Uh, my, my goal for this meeting is to have a robust conversation about uh, what is the purpose of this committee? What is, how does it best serve the mission of the university? How does it best address uh, its very important role, uh, really addressing, you know, a, 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 a half of the divisions of the university? Um, so, uh, This is a convergence of two projects. The first was a housekeeping project. Uh, and I addressed that a little bit in the cover sheet. Uh, initially, I as board secretary was trying to take care of a problem where we had uh, basically more governing documents than we needed. We had a lot of overlap between what board statement number three, which addresses committees, says about committees, and what the committee charter said about the committees. And not only was there a lot of overlap, but there was a fair bit of inconsistency. And so I proposed a project to uh, bring them into consistency uh, by uh, taking the procedural parts of the charters and integrating them with the procedural parts of the board statement, and then uh, basically importing the scope of work portion of the charters into the board statement as well as a scope of work for each. And uh, repealing the charters. Uh, having one document where all that is available is just more transparent and it avoids the problem of you amend one thing but not the other. Uh, so that was a housekeeping arrangement and uh, I was uh, perhaps, uh, and, and I think as far as uh, the governance committee and the finance and administration committee went, that housekeeping proposal uh, was, would have got the job done and, and we could have moved forward. But as I started having conversations with uh, the chair of this committee, uh, Bill Johnson, and uh, also with uh, the, the VPs that report to the committee and others, it got, we got into a deeper conversation where importing the existing scope of work language uh, seemed like, um, while it would take care of my housekeeping problem, it wouldn't necessarily help this committee be as effective as it can be. Uh, and so that's really the focus of this conversation today is uh, what's the best scope of work for this committee? Uh, and I think if you, whether this meeting or a subsequent one, can reach a strong sense of, of consensus and, and, and mission around a scope of work, uh, then the housekeeping part gets easy. Um, but uh, first things first and substance before process, and we should really talk about the scope of work work issue. Uh, I'm going to share my screen. Give me a second here. I've got a couple things up here. Yes. There we go. This is your current charter. Where'd my mouse go? Here it is. You seeing that all right? Okay, it looks like that's coming out okay. Um, there are elements of the current charter that I do carry over into the, the proposed language, which we'll look at in a moment. But one of the things that I thought was particularly, in retrospect, glaring about this charter is that we have, when, under specific responsibilities, we've got a list of things about academic affairs. And then we have a list of things about student affairs. And there's 
not much overlap between them. It's as if this were two committees, um, one for academic affairs and one for student affairs, dividing the time of, that's normally allotted to the other committees. And if we think about how the committee has been operating, that's kind of how it's operated. There's often been like, well, this is the VP of student affairs as part of the agenda, and this is the VP, this is the provost part of the agenda. Um, and um, there's, they don't necessarily overlap in their content or in the discussions. So uh, I sent you a bunch in, in preparation for our discussion. I sent you a bunch of things to read. Uh, probably the most important to start with is this article from Trusteeship Magazine, uh, which I, I will say it's representative of an overall trend that I heard a lot about at the AGB conferences last, was that just last week? I think it was, and the weekend before which is about um, making sure that boards are, that, that the, the limited amount of time that trustees get uh, and that administrators get with trustees are used to maximum effectiveness. And it's about boards being strategic as opposed to uh, more operational. Now there's a certain amount of operational work the board has to do, right? There's all those things in board statement number two that you didn't delegate to the president, like contracts over a million dollars that you have to decide. And those are operational decisions and there's a role for that. But if you're doing mostly that, then we're missing out on your greatest value as uh, fiduciaries for the state and for our present and future students uh, thinking strategically about the institution. And so this emphasis that AGB has been having both at the conference and in other forms, including this article, is about how to get you strategic. And um, that is a contrast between uh, some degree the, your, your, your current one, which is kind of operational in, in orientation and a more strategic focus. And what this article emphasizes is that at uh, higher education institutions where they are doing the work that we are talking about needing to do and that we doing already but need to do better, which is focusing on student success um, and an access institution like ours that's really key to our mission, um, then this, the topic of student success is, is it's an overarching priority for us. And when we talk about recruitment and retention, that's what we're talking about. We're getting, we're having students Bringing, getting them here, getting them what they need, getting them the career and the and the education they need, and graduating. Um, well, that is something that is totally a collaborative effort between student affairs and academic affairs. Uh, if you cover one piece well and the other's not being covered, you've missed it. Um, these students eat, they sleep, they live and breathe, they have mental health crises, they have uh, opportunity, opportunities for joy and growth uh, that are the realm of student affairs. And if student affairs does its job well, then they are maximally prepared to make the most of their educational opportunity. Uh, and if they're getting a great educational opportunity and they're not getting that, they're missing out, they're dropping out, and vice versa. So uh, the point of this article is that it, it makes sense to reorient and to combine at institutions where they're separate, combine the Academic Affairs Committee with the Student Affairs Committee as a joint committee uh, so that student success is uh, in the spotlight and uh, that strategic, and it can have that strategic focus. So I, I had that. Otherwise, I sent you the, in many ways, the source material that we used back in 2014, 2015. Uh, uh, I sent you both of these books by age. GB, which were from that era, uh, about the Student Affairs Committee, about the Academic Affairs Committee. And in particular, in those, um, they have some examples of charters in the back. Eh, I didn't think they weren't that helpful. But the section, the section is called Section 3 on committee responsibilities, uh, seem to have language that really got to the heart about what the committee is supposed to be doing. So um, I did not do this work on my own. I, I worked with the, the VP for Student Affairs and for the, for the provost and, uh, and to talk about what kind of things to present to you. And where they endorsed this uh, attempting this blended approach. And um, 
So that's the origin of the second document I'll share with you, which is an attempt at that. And I'll say at the outset, mm, this is a meeting, I've told people, I think this is a meeting where the conversation is almost as important as the result. So if you were to say to me, that looks great, Chris, let's, we'll, we'll move, make the motion and move on. Part of me will be like, okay, great, I can go take a nap. Uh, but I think it's important, more important that the committee really think about how it wants to deploy itself strategically. And, uh, and if that means taking longer over this language and coming back to a subsequent meeting, um, uh, if the result is a really good conversation and really good final product, I'm great with that too. So I'll s move to the other document. So this is what, um, among the various attachments, this is the one that would be for discussion purposes today, a an idea of a, a new uh, scope of work for the committee. And uh, just to recap, this would, if, if something, the, the final version of whatever is proposed here that gets moved onto the board and approved would get plugged in to board statement number three and wouldn't be a separate charter. But that's a separate discussion for a different day that really we're gonna have at governance committee. But until we can't have that conversation, we get this part right. So uh, I'll just go over this quickly because I didn't provide a lot of detail about where this language came from and I do want you to have that. Uh, the article, the section 4.1 is a standard section that appears in each of these. So I just used it, you know, inserted academic and student affairs committee for that piece and provided information from your current charter about who, you, who the lead staff supporting the committee are. And then 4.2, um, this is language, uh, the, the two paragraphs under here are uh, actually taken from your current charter. Uh, I'll go back there for a moment. Are you seeing this? You are seeing this. Good, I'll switch, so we can switch back and forth. Your current charter, they are also near the beginning uh, under general purpose and scope. They are essentially two and three. Um, but uh, one, I don't want to talk about one because this is, significant. Currently, your charter says that you engage in policy matters relating to faculty and professional and classified staff, including your status, responsibilities, discipline, and the welfare. Uh, that shouldn't be entirely surprising if you think about the way these committees operate uh, lots of places, including places that do not have collective bargaining agreements. Uh, and so where issues of management of faculty decisions about promotion, but also de decisions about discipline are uh, partly through the shared governance process rather than through the collective bargaining process. And um, so it's a natural thing uh, in those types of institutions, particularly private institutions, not so much public ones, that they, they, the board has a stated role in that and, um, and that the board's committee would address that. Here, I don't think you've ever addressed one of the, the, anything under the item one uh, because we have pretty elaborate processes for uh, both a collecting of bargaining agreement for faculty as well as promotion uh, manual that's handled through shared governance. And um, so in the current version, this part's actually just taken out. Um, you may have feelings about whether that's a good idea or not. I didn't want to omit the fact that this this potential part of your scope of work is, is not in the, in the final version. Um, otherwise, we move this language up. And then and in 4.3, um, this is also general uh, language, um, sort of addressing just your, your overall, there's basically, it's a basically a pyramid. We've got a couple things at the top and then we've got four things and we've got the greatest detail under item 4.4. And in 4.4, that's really where I've imported language from these committee responsibility portions. Uh, but instead of listing them separately, I've integrated them or and sometimes combined them. Uh, and that's where this language came from. So if you look back at this book, you can sort of see where each came from. Um, uh, there's another element of your current uh, one that has come out, I believe. Let me double check that. I'm working from memory at the moment. 
Um, no, I think that that's actually from a different model. So that's the overview. Uh, sorry if I talked longer than necessary, but I just kind of want to get that foundation before kind of kicking it off to you guys. And, 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 you know, I know you're back here, Matt, but feel free to sit in my seat if you'd like, so you can be part of the conversation. Um, and, uh, see where we're at. So, uh, first I'll say to the VPs, do you have anything you want to add uh, before we move into general conversation? So, um, I would like to add from the perspective of um, the work that Chris Burford did um, on this document, I think I want you all to know um, the deep dive that he did, as well as connecting with both um, um, Provost um, Seamers and myself. And so I think he did a lot of listening to understand when it would, it, you know, from our perspective, um, what's important. And so I just want to appreciate the, the work that he did. I think one aspect of it, and I know you kind of touched on it a little bit, but I really want to dive deeper into um, part of when you see the the new um, kind of proposed uh, charge, I think for me, the scope of work, if you notice it in the very top part, again, it says academic and it says student, but after that is all combined. Mm -hmm. and, the, and for us, that's the importance of the work that we do on our campus, but really is academic and student affairs working together um, in the work that we do. And I think it highlights the fact that um, that that's an important work that we do on our campus, right? So it's matching the philosophy we have on our campus. And I think that's really, really important. And so just to appreciate that the, the updates that were made, um, the good listening and deep dive that you did, Chris, to understand um, our perspectives. And I really feel that you understood my perspective as the VP of Student Affairs. And so just know that that's kind of where the development was um, in, that, in that document. So I'll let Matt um, share from his perspective. I think it was our first meeting with Bill Johnson. I recommended we look at the charter because the date was 2015. And so we really kind of wanted to unpack it out, update it and grow it. We got busy and then we met with Chris and Chris listened well. And I think we had multiple conversations from, you know, our wisdom perspective angles where we see um, the intersection, how we're thematically woven together through academic affairs and student affairs. But what helped us was the guides that Chris has showed up a couple times, assigning us homework, going back to reading that to get us, you know, in a lane, but to cross our lanes appropriately. And he kind of guided that process. And I'm excited about the work that we've done and committed to. And it's, it's forward thinking in my opinion. Other questions or comments? I have a question that is there is determined by ignorance or so but i'm going to ask it anyway so uh, and number uh, two things thank you very nice process i really appreciate us sending out those booklets with an example from agb i didn't understand what they were for then i connected the dots and they were very useful i think it, it, that the final document is better better written written than those this is my question when i read, read the charter first in 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 the first point it states, uh, academic and student affairs serve as government to do this. One, faculty and staff affairs, policy matters relating to the faculty and professional and classified staff. I know you mentioned some of that. In, in the um, revised version, that word staff cease to appear. I guess I want to I want to ask only one is only appears one time when we mention in the first 4.1 staff support to the committee. So this is my question again. Maybe I, I, I need to understand is this committee representing faculty, staff and student or is only representing faculty and student. So um, just to not to cut off the conversation, just a little additional information. Essentially, that item one under general purpose in your current one, to me, makes this look like this is the committee that um, the human resources director would come to, to talk about um, things, uh, high level policy related to management of staff. Um, we haven't really had the human resources director coming to the board around that because frankly 
uh, we've treated much of that as really under the purview of the president. And um, I think that's consistent with the president's charge in board statement number two. Um, so uh, that's, that's why I've, I suggested taking it out because I'm not, we haven't seemed to have it, we haven't been using it that way. I would hate not like to just sort of keep language hanging out there if we're not, don't know why it's there. Just as a clarification for myself, are, are you referring to the elimination of the first statement as you explained the prior because we have the share the governance? Yeah, the first statement was blended into 4.1 later on. Some of the, many of the similar words are there. But that word staff disappeared from the mm -hmm. charter. I mean, it was present in the charter and it is not present anymore. So for my own clarity, again, maybe I'm ignorant on how this is working really, but I like to have the clarity. When I think about EOU, I always think about the three main components, the students, the faculty, and the staff. And uh, that in my mind is the team. Uh, so that's it. I, I'm, Sure. That maybe, uh, but am I correct that the statement uh, was eliminated because it pertains to like a personnel issues which we don't deal with uh, at this level because of the uh, sharing governance, like issues of tenure and promotion or other personnel issues? Am I correct that, that that's the reason why it was um, then eliminated in the new version that's correct uh I, I don't see this committee as dealing with hr issues whether they're for faculty or staff or administrative professionals we have collective bargaining agreements for two of those we have a personnel manual for the third um and we have established processes and i just whether that was the intent of this language originally or not we haven't used the committee that way and i i, I don't think that's a i think the committee's plates full enough as it is Christy Mendoza. Thank you for the presentation. Here's what I wrote down while you were doing, you were talking, looking at things, thinking about it. Um, layman, right, from a, a layman's perspective, um, I would just say I usually think about graduation rates and enrollment and overall success. And most, I think, trustees think, oh, we want the EOU to be successful, we want kids to graduate, we want enrollment to be nice, we want a good experience. Okay, so the one thing I would say, we're about thriving, and that, that back to that thriving student, there are mentions of it with some of the programs, but I just think that word thriving once in a while, we want to see that things are, are going well for our students, for our staff, um, for the institution. So th somewhere in there, um, the success or the thriving of, of our institution, I know it's in there for outcomes, and there's words like outcomes, but I think... We want to see that things are, are improving because that's our goal, that things are doing, you know, going well, that we're thriving, um, that things are going up. Then I, I wrote down, there is a mention of athletics and activities in there. From, there's a section in there. There's a student services sec section in there. I didn't see, although there probably is, but I didn't see diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging. And somewhere in that, whatever that might be, I do think that there should be some mention uh, and maybe there's just equity in there. I, I don't remember, but I didn't see that. Um, and then I, I would also say we're we're looking at the future of the institution. We're looking at things if, if they're relevant, if they're connected, and if they're aligning towards the best future that we can have for our students, the best future we can have for the region, the best future we can have for the state. Like we're thinking of those things. At least I think most trustees are. We're not just in the present. Or the now, we're for the future, and that kind of stuff where it's relevant or strategic or interconnected, those are things that, as long as there's words like that once in a while in there, or is there's thoughts like that in there, because I, I, I believe, yes, we want policy, yes, we want goal alignment, but we want to have words in there that integrate. So those are, that's my feedback. Thank you. I think, uh, I, yeah, I think those, I could certainly work on a draft that integrates those elements. Yeah, that's a very good point. Thank you for bringing it up.
just to recap and make sure I got it. First, uh, the use of the word thriving, uh, that verb, uh, seems an important thing to integrate into here. And I, I agree. Um, uh, yeah, all right. All right. That's right. Uh, the There's no specific addressing of DEIB issues. That seems like a, a pretty pretty significant oversight. Uh, so we can I can work on that, and then I'm making sure that it emphasizes that we're we're planning. You know, we're, we're, we're this is about steering the university and these issues, not just in the present, but look with a future focus. Sorry, right? I didn't say last week again. Most of us are here because Can you please uh, use the mic? Most of us are here again. We give of our time. We give of our life. We give service because we love EOU and we want students to graduate and have good experiences. We want staff to have good experiences. We want staff to feel valued, understood, all those kinds of things. We want them to want to be professors or deans or administrators at EOU. We want them to have a great experience, but we want, we want the university to thrive. We want things to happen that take care of kids, community, region, and state. Um, at least I think most of us, and those values, as long as those values are pretty close. Thank you. Chair Martin. Yeah, on 4.3.1, is that faculty professional performance still included in that? It It's in there. I, I wasn't sure exactly what the ASA committee's role was in regard to faculty perform professional performance. Yes, I'm glad you mentioned that. Uh, Trustee Mendoza had alluded, or no, it, it, Mauricio, you alluded to that as well, uh, Trustee Valeria. Um, I, I, I do think that if it means what it seems most obviously to mean, which is it, that that if we're talking about specific faculty, that no, it shouldn't be within the scope of this. Um, I think uh, that could be rephrased to have more of an emphasis. So yes, yeah, so we start off, the first thing on the list is academic quality. That's the piece that's an essential board responsibility. Uh, so I think if we've got academic quality there at the start of the list, the probably fa faculty professional performance is, um, uh, doesn't really need to be there. It's if we're making the other changes we talked about in terms of human resources type of things. So that could certainly be deleted. Well, either human resources or the president would. Right. Did we, sorry. Did go right ahead. And I'm using, I'm, I mean, I'd read it, but I don't remember everything. Um, negotiations. Is there, I know, is that, that's just the general board, the big board. I don't think we ever get into negotiations. You're talking as collective bargaining negotiations? Wrong committees and big picture. Okay. Yeah. Any other comments or questions? Uh, I personally would like to thank you, Chris, for providing those booklets and the article. I think that um, they were really enlightening uh, personally because of um, really clarifying more the role of this committee, um, which brings up the fact that I feel uh, very overwhelmed uh, on the number of tasks that, that this committee needs to accomplish. And while that's not the scope of this conversation, I really believe that the, for us to be operational, we needed to have a very clear calendar of things that we needed to evaluate on a, rota on, on a rotation because we wouldn't be able on any calendar year to really cover the scope of all the, the things that we are. But I think that we have to have some sort of internal, um, you know, a calendar, like a grid or something uh, that we make sure that we consistently, you know, really apply the scope of what we have in this charter. Being new to this committee, I, I honestly don't know whether we 
we do all these things or not, but they are definitely worthy. So it's very nice that they are combined in the, in the piece, the overlap or the meshing of, of the academic and, and student affairs is definitely, you know, how we operate. That's, you know, you can't eliminate the, the one piece from the other. They are intimately connected. So. I just wanted to make this comment, but I, I urge everyone on this committee to really think about how we operate, you know, how, how we can set up an agenda for ourselves so that we make sure that we really cover all the, all the scope of our work on a consistent basis. I, I can speak to that if you'd like, sir, just in the board secretary role. Very quickly. Yeah, quickly. Um, we do prepare one of those uh, for the Board of Trustees. We call it a work plan. Uh, and that is an attempt to capture all the things that happen every year as part of the board's schedule. Uh, partly we developed that because every time we get an idea of something new for the board to do, we need to take into account that about 60% of the board's time is already taken with things that we do every year in, in different contexts. Um, I have occasionally developed a, one of those for the governance committee. I will confess, I didn't this year, uh, but a tool like that might work, be helpful to the issue you're addressing with this committee. Kind of, what are the things that we can expect at, during each of our meetings that we're going to be addressing? Um, and I could certainly uh, share tools with uh, the folks who are supporting the committee. And also, said. I suggested that we set up some priorities uh, so that we can immediately address uh, um, certain issues so that, you know, we have like a calendar where we have item X, Y, Z that come up um, on a yearly basis and maybe others that are when needed. So. Are there any further questions or comments? Okay. Um, if not, is there a motion to the board to recommend approval of uh, this topic as presented? Well, I think I've been asked to make some changes. Oh, okay. And I'm not quite sure what they'll look like. So, so I'd kind of like to come back uh, at your next meeting with updated language for okay. you to consider. Okay, that, that's fine. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Okay, so this concluded all the action items for today's meeting, and now we will move on to the discussion items. So I would like to invite Julie Kenry to present um, on the Moonshot for Equity. Julie is the Strategic Initiative Project Director. Go ahead, Julie. So as, as we set up, if it's okay, if I um, can give a reminder and introduction so I can let you all focus on that. Um, so I, I believe everyone um, hopefully has had an opportunity um, to meet Julie, who is our project director of Moonshot. I'm very excited about the work that she's doing. I want to say um, that I really have felt as uh, when Moonshot, we started Moonshot, Shot. We were, of course, tasked with uh, immediately moving forward and making progress on the Moonshot for Equity program. Um, and I really felt like um, when Julie arrived, I just handed her the baton and she just went running, sprinting, if you will, to, to move things forward. And so I think we're really excited and I'm really excited to have Julie share the work that's happening, the updates that are happening. Um, I think for us, um, when it comes to um, being successful in Moonshot, um, part of that was keeping that momentum and keeping us moving forward and utilizing that momentum and that excitement to um, help our community college partners continue to move forward with that excitement. But just know that Julie, I literally passed the baton to her. She started sprinting, doing phenomenal work. And so I'm excited that Julie gets to be here with you today um, to speak about the updates and the great work that she's been doing in moving Moonshot forward on our campus and with our college partners. All right, thank you, Lacey. And uh, thank you all of you for the opportunity to come and talk about Moonshot for Equity today. Um, let's see, find the right button here. 
there. Um, so as uh, already stated, my name is Julie Kennery and I'm the Strategic Initiatives Project Director. And I was hired in December to launch the Moonshot for Equity work. Um, so I first wanted to just share what the objectives are for this program. Um, our objective is to eliminate equity gaps and increase access to higher education across the Eastern Oregon region. And we're doing this in collaboration with our regional partners in higher education, that's uh, BMCC and TBCC. So the three of us are all implementing the Moonshot for Equity best practices at the same time. And we are um, going to, that, that collaboration is gonna become really essential when we talk about transfer pathways. So um, I want to begin with the working definition that we're using for equity. Um, so this is something that was um, developed together with Beanie. Um, we're identifying and eliminating systemic barriers to increase opportunities and access for those who have been historically and are currently marginalized. And the important words here in this uh, two parts. One is we're eliminating systemic barriers. So that's the focus of this work. And the populations that we're focused on are students who are marginalized. And some of those are defined um, pretty traditionally across all areas. Um, that includes race and ethnicity, gender, gender identity, first generation status, so socioeconomic status, persons with disabilities, so some of these are identities that people carry, like race, and some of them are status definitions, like I'm the first person in my family to ever go to college. And so um, there are different challenges associated with these different, um, different populations. So when, when we talk about eliminating um, barriers, we're talking about this population who, so we're focused on our marginalized student populations. Um, what are we doing? We're, we're looking at our systems, we're changing our systems, and that means that we're looking at policies, we're looking at practices and processes, um, and we want to improve our systems so that they're meeting student needs. We're measuring that by looking at um, how our marginalized student populations are impacted, but really this benefits all of our students. Um, so we've got a lot of metrics fo focused on marginalized populations. Um, at EOU, we're also interested in these other groups. You know, we have a lot of rural students and rural students face different challenges. Um, so that's an important population that we're also focused on. We also care about our transfer students and transfer students have different challenges. Um, again, and online students, um, we have a very large online student population and we need to be sure that all of our systems are, um, make it possible to be successful. So uh, just going through our, activities so far. So um, way back last year, in late June, the board approved our contract with EAB, which means that we entered into a five-year partnership to implement Moonshot for Ex Equity best practices. Um, we did that with our partners, TBCC and BMCC. We're all kind of coming up to speed during this first year. Um, Lacey gave a tour to the whole campus. Um, so you may have seen other presentations about Moonshot for Equity from her. Um, so that happened all through the fall. In September, the HEC approved our first year of funding. Um, EAB has offered a leadership institute last fall. Um, the team of people here at EOU who have launched Navigate as a technology platform attended an EAB conference last fall. And then in December, I was hired. And so here we are in 2023. Um, things that we've been working on are really just getting started on, on the real work here to do. Uh, so we um, you know, are maintaining our 
our ecosystem and our connection with the funder, the HEC, we um, have selected as an institution the four best practices that we want to start with. So out of the 15 that we will be doing, we've selected four. Um, EAB is offer, continuing to offer their support and consulting service services. So they gave an executive update to our administration in February. They also came to EOU and offered an in-person equity leadership institute. Um, we have now formed our equity leadership team. And, um, and one other thing that is related, which is happening right now, is our campus climate survey. So that's open to all EOU employees and students right now throughout the month of April. Um, so starting in May, we'll be launching these best practice teams who will be doing all of the actual work to review our systems. So looking at this in more of the, the five-year timeline. Um, so we're essentially entering phase one here. We, you know, we're about nine months into our five years and we'll be focused on these four best practice areas that are listed under phase one. So that's proactive advising, transfer pathways, hold reform, and retention grants. At the same time, um, campus climate and student coordinated care network, those are two other best practices, um, but I'm putting them here a little separately because they're really going to be ongoing throughout. They're not as discreet in the type of work that they're doing. So we'll be talking about campus climate and we'll be um, implementing strategies for both of those two areas as an ongoing piece of work. Um, so as those phase one practices are completed, we'll select new practices, then we'll implement those in the second or the essentially the third, fourth, and fifth year. Um, each of the best practice areas includes ongoing evaluation. So we'll be setting up systems so that we can continue to evaluate whether we're being effective in our work. And then we'll complete our implementation period in June of 2027. So that's what our five years looks like. The work continues and we'll always be evaluating this work. Um, so just to kind of come back to, this is something you may have seen in the past. This is the list of the 15 best practices that I'm referring to. So the ones there in red are the ones that I've just discussed that we're focusing on right now. The bold are the four focus areas for this upcoming year. And then I've also got the um, campus climate and student care highlighted because, you know, we're, we're kind of always thinking about those. So I wanted to give you um, a little idea of the methodology that we're using for these best practice teams. So these are our four best practice areas that we're focusing on. And this is the um, strategy that I'm going to use to bring people together to do this work. Um, so it's based around the idea of having a, a core leadership team that's providing oversight of four subcommittees and the, each subcommittee will focus on one of these best practice areas. So for this phase one, because of the particular practice areas that are involved, these are the departments that are all connected to systems that we'll be addressing. Um, so the equity leadership team consists of department directors from each of the departments that are listed there, plus two faculty members. So each of these subcommittees has um, not all of those departments represented, and there are a few other departments that are only on one sub subcommittee, but they will be seated, some with the department directors, sometimes with staff from those departments, but having that representative voice from that department to be part of the discussions and conversations to move things forward. So the role of the leadership team is really to, um, one, provide that oversight. So be the 
the review board for recommendations that come from the subcommittees and kind of keep everyone in the loop on everything that's happening. Um, they'll also be selecting the members for the um, for the subcommittees themselves. So this is um, describing the um, the workflow that happens in those subcommittees. Um, there are basically four phases to their work. Um, generally, these are going to be one-year commitments for people, but that will vary because some of the subcommittees we have some work that's already happening at EOU. They don't need to start from zero. Um, other subcommittees are more complex and they're going to take longer. Um, but essentially, the first phase is a research phase, just really understanding what are our current systems. Um, the second phase is developing recommendations. Those will go to the equity leadership team for review. And then the um, third phase is implementing those recommendations, so making those changes. Um, and then the last phase is setting up the ongoing evaluation. So I just wanted to come back to the campus climate survey here for a minute. And the main thing that I want to point out here is, you know, campus climate is, is one of the best practice areas and it's really important in the Moonshot framework. But it's also, th this campus climate survey is actually something that is um, coming through our Title III grant. And this is where I want to um, really emphasize that this work is not an add-on to other work. This work is to bring everyone together around equity and to, it really provides capacity for the existing programming that's on our campus. And um, so I've been able to, to help support the campus climate survey to be implemented this year. And, um, and we, it's uh, really everybody working together. So, um, you know, looking sort of from a, the higher level view, you know, what we're really doing is reframing our institutional systems by looking through an equity lens. And Moonshot is a tool for us to do that. Um, it's, this is challenging work, but it's also, um, we also have a lot of resources on our campus already. Um, we have all of these different grants and more that are already acting, already operating. Um, Moonshot for Equity is, uh, you know, coming in alongside to support these efforts. And the idea of this work is really to, you know, take those things that we're doing well. And so these people here are examples of things that EOU is doing great. Um, so there's all kinds of stuff already happening in our, on our campus that is serving this need. Um, but what we can do with Moonshot for Equity is look across our whole campus, bring everyone together and you know, kind of fill in the gaps. So there are other pieces that may connect different systems, things that are working well or scaling up things that are working well and being able to kind of look at the big picture that way. Uh, Moonshot for Equity also comes with its own set of resources. So we have a student communication platform called Navigate that came onto our campus, um, I think about a year and a half ago. This, um, through Moonshot, we are gonna be utilizing that a lot more. Um, so it not only is a student communication platform, it's also a way for us to evaluate things that are working and things that are not working. Um, we've also got our regional ecosystem. So having TVCC and BMCC doing this work at the same time is, is so important. Um, and then we've got EAB itself and the framework for Moonshot for Equity. So it's really nice in complex work like this to have a framework to kind of go back to, you know, as you start getting lost in the weeds of it. Um, we have 15 best practices that we can begin with. Um, we can do that work. We have consultants who've implemented these things 
things at other universities, so they're familiar not necessarily with EOU, but with these things that work. Um, so it's nice to have them working with us and to have that structure. So what is our moonshot? So you're probably familiar with the concept of the moonshot, which was the United States um, wanting to get a person on the moon and back to Earth. Um, so that was a really clear objective. Um, and I wanted to kind of make our objective more clear here, which really is to close our equity gaps, which means that every student at EOU is equally likely to persist and graduate. Are we going to do that in five years? Probably not. Um, five years is how long it will take us to implement all these changes in our systems. And then we'll be evaluating over time and continuing to adjust things so that we can achieve that goal. So um, just to kind of wrap things up here, going back to our five year timeline. So we're um, we are at that on the green line um, and we're just about to start our phase one best practice work. We'll be doing that over the next four years, implementing new best practices. And then we'll, by the end of the five years, have our ongoing evaluation in place. So um, thinking about you know, what we're, we're doing here, um, the main point is we're viewing student success through an equity lens. And that means that we are looking at these equity gaps and we're asking the question you know how are our systems contributing to these equity gaps instead of looking at those equity gaps and thinking you know what's wrong with this student why is the student not successful we want to look at you know what can we do to support students to be successful how are our systems not working for people um, and you know there's some examples from more of the physical world thinking about you know universal design in an architectural sense um, if you think about uh, stairs stairs are accessible to most people most people can enter a building using stairs but some people can't and almost everyone can enter a building using a ramp the people who can walk up the stairs can use the ramp and so can all the people who can't use the stairs um, so when we're designing these new systems, we want to be thinking about how can we build systems that are accessible to everyone. So that is our, our um, goal and our thought process. Um, so then thinking about the Board of Trustees, um, I was looking through the nine principles principles of trusteeship and number six is lead by example champion justice equity and inclusion and really i want to say you know this is the work of everyone it's the work of each of us individually um, it will challenge each of us individually and it's also the work of our institution and we've really taken such a significant and important step like our leadership here at EOU has selected to do this work, which is really the first and most important thing. And that's put us on the pathway so that we can accomplish these things. Um, but we now have to carry that forward and, and do the work. So um, having the support of, of all of you is really critical to that. Um, so, any questions? Thank you so much, Julie. So, questions for Julie. Go ahead. Yeah, nice presentation. I liked learning more about it. Um, when, when we brought this program on, we covered it a little bit. I was just wondering if you could dive more into what exactly those... Um, I know we were excited about the partnerships uh, with uh, Blue Mountain and TVCC. I'm just curious, now that you're in this role and you're really 
getting this program going. What do those partnerships really mean for Eastern Oregon? How are we leveraging that? What does that actually look like? I heard a little bit about it when we were talking about the program, but now that it's started, what are we starting to see in these early stages? Well, in the very early stages, I can see small benefits right away, just as far as accessibility of people on those campuses and kind of having a go-to person when you want to make a connection. Um, that is, is a really important piece. Like there was an opportunity for us to apply for a grant that provides scholarships across all three of our institutions. And so we were able to make that connection, which those things have to happen quickly. They can't, you know, you can't spend months working on that, making that connection. Um, so in, you know, a very small way, that's just a tiny example. Um, as far as the moonshot work, you know, we're all still just getting on board right now. That's, um, so it's, it's been pretty internal. Everyone's sort of gathering their people and, um, going through working mostly with EAB to kind of solidify the program on their campus. So like EOU is doing that here and we've really established the program, you know, made a hire for somebody to implement it. Um, so the other campuses are in that process right now. And um, what I'm understanding from talking to EAB is that we'll all start coming together more this summer. Christy Mendoza, go ahead. Uh, love it. And I like, thanks for the presentation, like the PowerPoint too. Uh, the, enroll, the enrollment retention, persistence, graduation, I, lo I love that. I do think that, you know, there's going to be some costs and of course you've got a grant and we're doing that. Uh, long term there, besides training staff or changing culture, doing all these kinds of things that, that take place, um, do, are people thinking about the funding for future scholarships or future retention grants or future things and where is that money gonna, going to come from or there's going to be other pots of funds that we go out for i mean how is it going to be sustainable i guess after five years um well as far as examples like retention grants um that will be the discussion you know on that best practice team um and there's also, you know, potentially some reorganizing of things and redistributing funds. So it's not necessarily about um, always needing new funds, but it's also going to be about looking at what we're doing and is this the best way to help students? Or is there another way that we could redistribute things so that we are helping more students? Um, so there, those things will be specific sometimes to best practice teams. I know that um, Lacey and Tim are working on kind of the big picture funding for us to continue this work for the next five years. Um, so that's kind of the big push as far as funding. Then, you know, there are ongoing costs like, like any technology platform. We'll keep having to pay for Navigate. So if it's useful to us, then, you know, that will be worthwhile. Um, so there so that's is that a, that's a short answer to the <laughs> to the funding yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes <laughs> Christy Barredio. thank you good to see you julie uh can we go back at three or four slides uh, uh the slide that says the about the resources this one this one oh, here okay so as today i'm looking at the timeline are these operational today all these three here, you would mention Navigate, uh, or what percentage? I mean, from zero to 100, we are 80% with Navigate, 30% of the um, regional ecosystem. Can you give me a better idea? Um, yeah, so it, from that perspective, we are not fully utilizing Navigate. I mean, we have Navigate and it's 100% here, <laughs> but there are more features of Navigate that over time we will add and utilize more fully. Um, and I couldn't tell you what the percentage is. No, 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 that, 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 that's but, okay. But, so, so we have it in our yes. possession, but we have a learning curve on how to use it. Yes, okay. exactly. 
Yeah, and the regional ecosystem, again, kind of as I was Still discussing bad, yeah. earlier, you know, we, we're we just bringing all of this up to speed right now. So um, mostly EAB is working with our partners. You know, we have all been in conversation and we've all um, been part of the discussion to, you know, one, select to do this and two, to, you know, get things moving. But um, But we're not actively working together on our best practice work yet. I think that like we're here at EOU just getting started on um, forming those teams. And I would say that BMCC and TVCC are a little bit behind us in that. So they'll probably be forming their teams, you know, maybe in the fall or sometime like that. But we'll all be working together. I would say by next fall, we should be fully engaged and work together. Thank you. I was going to make a comment, but go ahead and then I'll, I will. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, just a quick question. I know we discussed a little bit. It wasn't fully clear to me. Um, from your perspective, what is your expectation regarding board support um, or continued board support? Yeah, the last slide um, that mentioned a little bit of what that vision might be. Could you just elaborate a little bit more on that? You know, I would love to just discuss that with all of you um, because I I do think that having a very, you know, present and vocal support from our leadership is critical to this work. You know, having everybody um, sharing their value of the work that we're doing is really important. Um, you know, of course, there's also the sort of bringing in funding, but I don't really see that as all of your role. I see um, EOU administration is working on that. Um, but like your voice, you know, in our partners around the state is important too in your value of this work. Um, so I think all of us communicating that and, you know, getting more comfortable communicating about some of these things because sometimes they've been hidden issues um and so being able to to um talk about what we're doing um with other people i think is really important so julie i had been thinking about how this committee and the board can in one way support in a very concrete way your work and that goes back to our discussion the other day about how data driven this um, pro project is and how we cannot necessarily rely at this time on valid data from the past to assess this project. So perhaps that is our commitment as academic affair committee academic and student affair committee to work with our administration to make sure that we can provide you with the tools operational tools where you can you know in some fashion i don't know how much we can reconstruct from the past but at least moving on to have a system in place where the data that you need for the assessment of this project is absolutely in place. Um, I think uh, we had this conversation the other day and it's essential mm -hmm. because when you go out and, and seek further support, whether it's at the federal level or whatever level, they will want to see any assessment of, you know, what changes this really made on our campus and the, and the, our partners. So, that would be my plea <laughs> that we can help you that way in 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 whatever way we can work with our administration absolutely that would be wonderful data is a critical piece of how we're going to evaluate and also understand you know what we need to do moving forward different strategies and all of that and i just comment that i think you know the inception of this project came from EOU, and I think EOU has has led the efforts up to this point, and I think EOU will continue to need to lead uh, with the two community colleges. Uh, but some of the uh, navigate, something you may all know, but it's worth mentioning in case you don't, 
all three institutions will in, will implement navigate so that if a student takes classes we get i think 20 percent of our students from transfers uh from community colleges so a student could take class at a community college they come to eou and all their records and notes and all that stuff would already be here so that's one of the first big steps in in collaborating with each other and then as we go forward and all three institutions get educated on these best practices and we're operating in the same fashion and it you know it can involve wraparound services and several other things but i think the point is the uh, the end goal is to smooth the process to completion for all students Is there any other question? Go ahead. One, um, I know we're running late, but. Oh, sorry, one-on-one -on -one with students to, I mean, other than data, what about one-on-one -on -one involvement? I mean, how do you reach students? Because some students, believe it or not, might not be active on social media. <laughs> so. And, um, and you might not have time right now because you're a one person operation. <laughs> um, yeah, at this stage, we're not talking to students directly, but we definitely do want to get student input into all of this. Um, and I'm working with Beanie really closely because, you know, a lot of her institution wide work is so highly aligned and related to what what we're doing with Moonshot for Equity. So I like to see, you know, Moonshot kind of slides in and helps provide support for any of this work. Um, and, and we have met with students just to talk to them about different things that they're interested in, but not in a formal way. Um, and our, as far as our evaluation, you know, it could be that there could be some survey work or, or um, understanding student needs through those kind of one-on-one -on -one ways, but we're also looking for ways that we can, you know, in an ongoing way, we really want to evaluate, evaluate this on whether students are successful. Um, so there may be points at which we need some information that is like getting more into the weeds, like, okay, why is this working or why is this not working? That might require surveys or those, one-on-one -on -one conversations to kind of pull out the details, but our evaluation will be more based on, um, and on that bigger picture. I don't see any other question. Julie, thank you so much. This is great work. So, thank you. Yeah, we really appreciate right. it. Thank you. Good to see you all. <laughs> Well, we are running a little late here, but I would like at this point to uh, invite interim Provost Simmers to give us an update regarding academic program reviews. Do you want the short or long version? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, we'll make it work. Well, thank you. I'll do the best I can in the time that I've been allowed to talk about program review. I kind of alluded to it earlier about program review when um, Dean Newman was talking about um, the, the, the reviewing process of a program, how it's formed and developed through the process that we begin looking at a program to the idea of um, strengths and weaknesses of a program. So when you read your cover sheet, I really wanted um, to talk about the historical um, perspective and the deep dive that we actually do here on this campus when we look at program review. It's not a new process. It's been going on quite some time. And, you know, it involves uh, a variety of processes and criteria when we uh, review programs annually and through a five-year longitudinal academic program review called LAPR schedule. 
Um, these are faculty led pro uh, processes working with their deans closely and include an analysis, a quantitative analysis or quantitative data analysis, and also kind of a narrative, a qualitative uh, data analysis as well. As we look at the context of each program, um, we look at market trends for programs. We look at um, opportunities, um, strengths, weaknesses, uh, the student learning experience. Um, that's oftentimes, in my opinion, the pinnacle when we look at a program review is what are the students experiencing as they go through a program? Um, what is that kind of like? Are there, are there gaps or there barriers that the students are experiencing? And then also um, aligning with institutional uh, support, whether that could be finances or marketing or advertising needs, areas that we might not be hitting the mark on at the um, administrative level or the dean level. What are some of the goals and aspirations and recommendations? And so those are opportunities that we need to spend time on looking at academia or the academic side of the institution for students as well as the experts that develop the content and teach in their field of expertise. Um, I continuously look at um, continuous improvement and program growth um, as a former teacher myself and faculty member, uh, an associate chair, a department chair, a dean, and now a provost um, program review is very, um, very um, close to my heart because I oftentimes look back at my own experiences as a student and think, could, could my experience have been better? And I oft, often think, where was my favorite degree? Out of four college degrees, which one was my favorite? Where did I take away some of the most uh, cognitive developments um, through the whole entire process of exploring you know my pathway on becoming where and who I am today and it's because of uh, programs and um, that I've learned through and explored so faculty content experts um, oftentimes are the ones who really dig deep into the programs um, they're not only working with their deans but they're also working with their colleagues and in, in the programs as they review you know, some of the um, some of the items and the specifics where programs we need to look at student success and um, equity and also how we can look at alignment. So how do we align programs and what are we aligning them to? Oftentimes we talk about academic freedom or we talk about um, we talk about content experts and we talk about accreditation and when we think about accreditation. Um, we utilize guidance from NWCCU and we utilize a mid-year cycle evaluation uh, programmatic assessment. The institution must provide pro programmatic assessment of at least two programs as evidence of a continuous process of improvement. The program should be broadly uh, representative of institutional efforts and as a result um, programs that are approved by a CHE uh, a reorganized prog a programmatic accreditor, accreditor are uh, discouraged for this report. So when we look at what um, a mid-cycle report looks like, let's see if I can get back to that. I'm going to give you an example of program review at the accreditation level. Um, when we talk about the guidance, we look at guidance, and oftentimes we think of accreditation, is it in itself in continuous improvement? Yes. Um, in October, I attended an NWCCU um, conference in Seattle, and some of the aha moments for myself was they're, they're gaining some momentum to look deeper into programs so that I knew that we actually had to really look closely at how we and what we review in program assessment and so forth. And so programs should be uh, broadly representative of the institution's efforts and a result um, programs that are approved and how they're accredited um, oftentimes take a thorough analysis. And so to do that, we actually have to analyze different components of the program process. Um, EOU engages in program review processes and in student learning assessment processes. Both of these are highlighted in the response in the first section outlines EOU's pro, uh, program review processes and uses economic program annual review and the academic year. As you can see in the report 2021 economics program culminating five-year review. So oftentimes we're in a five-year cycle as we analyze and review programs here on this campus. Um, 
aligning not only with um, NWC, NWCCU accreditation, but we also have two professional colleges that have national accreditation. And so that requires additional accreditation efforts that we have to actually comply with. And for example, the College of Education, when I was the dean um, there for three years, I was required by Senate Bill 78 to get national accreditation by 2025, or we would no longer exist as a college education or EPP. So we had to get busy quick. So we had to work within multiple different frameworks of program review. We were doing program review through the LAPR process for NWCCU, but then also AQEP. And so we actually had to kind of look at ourselves in multiple different lenses. Um, and with success, we received national accreditation in AQEP for the first time since 1929. Uh, we also look at program review um, college by college, depending on if it's a licensing granting um, college for teacher preparation, or if it's for the College of Business for their national accreditation. Dean Henniger had to lead those efforts when he arrived in 2019. And so sometimes what I say program review, it actually has multiple different pathways that it plugs into depending on the accreditor. Looking at our program review archive, you can see here, um, and you all have access to this, programs that are currently under program review right now at this time, you'll see it's psychology, chemistry, biochemistry, health and human performance, FSA, anthropology, sociology, communication studies, music, and early childhood education. These are programs that were selected by the deans. Uh, the deans selected the programs because they felt like within this window, these are the these. This would be the process that we'd go further. So you can see when you look at 2021 uh, to 2022, here are programs that you can click on and the re the review process and to understand how they're doing. So biology summary, EMSA, MAT summary, MBA summary. And that gives you an idea of the programs that were selected by the deans at the time. If you notice in 2020 and 2021, there are only three colleges that had programs that went through program review. The College of Education kind of hit a pause button because we were going through a national accreditation review. So we kind of were given the permission by Provost Wood at the time to pull out of this cycle and focus our efforts on our own program review so that AQEP could look at us and work with us to obtain that national accreditation. So oftentimes you'll see all four colleges in there with program review. Um, I've heard Trustee Real oftentimes say, we've launched a lot of new programs. Um, how are they doing? Are they, are they expanding? Are they flat? Are they in decline? Well, this is something that we need to look at for 2023 to 2024. If we're gonna look at some of the newer programs that we can kind of review and assess through this process and that doesn't maybe get you the immediate answers that you need, but it does lead us towards the answers, hopefully, that we're seeking for program success. Well, I didn't mean to move that, so give me a minute. There we go, inch up under there. All right. So we use an annual academic program review template. And what that looks like is you'll see metrics up here, which aligns with the goal one, goal two, goal three. So this is strategically aligned with our strategic plan. And this is, um, let me move this out of the way for you. So academic program outcomes, objectives and KPIs, key performance indicators with five-year trending targets. And so this really gives us an idea of how we drive our academic program outcomes um, working with this. Um, so it's usually the dean sitting down with program chairs and program faculty to walk through this as they go through the journey of program review. Um, to junior faculty, it's a new onboarding process at times. They could be onboarded with a dean by a dean or it could be a program chair or a program lead. It depends on the program and what the druthers are with the deans and how that happens. And it could be a collaborative effort. And then we look at some of the, uh, we dig a little bit deeper, employment of completers as percentage of alumni reporting employment status, objective two. Um, when I arrived here in 2019, um, the first thing I wanted to know a little bit about employment completers is how do we get that data? Because we actually used to do focus reports on my former institutional campus for 15 years, and it was really hard to track down students once they graduated. But once we tracked them down, we found alumni that could maybe give us back money and we could find out what they did for a living and go after them to kind of bring them back to um, uh, Mountaineer Nation. So there, are, this works in many different kind of components and mechanisms. 
we actually look at re-enrollment of completers, uh, faculty participation within the discipline and service. Sorry about that, it's kind of moving a little bit. Full year numbers, student engagement and development. Uh, you can see that's a work in progress. Student learning, objective two, proficiencies in GLOs, PLOs, DPD, and UWR. Um, goal three, objective one, new transfer headcounts. So looking at the data, total enrollment, headcount and FTE, uh, minors, SCH to non-majors, credit hours produced. Uh, and you can see as we build out through the goals, the continuation of program review is pretty extensive. It takes much more than just somebody saying in a narrative that we're doing good. So once we flush the data into this, then I rely on the deans, the lead, and, uh, the lead of that um, college to really simply say, you know, I'm going to provide my wisdom and my qualitative narrative to, to, to be the storyteller to build this data forward so that people understand what, exactly what they're looking at within program review. Longitudinal five-year archive. So I've already, I think I've already been there. Hold on a minute. Okay, so steps to enhancing the process. Continuous improvement regarding the process. I first, the first time I heard continuous improvement is when I arrived at Eastern Oregon University. Um, we never used that terminology at Emporia State University. Uh, maybe we thought we were perfect or something, but we never used the continuous improvement process. Um, that's, that says a lot about an institution that we're continuously looking to improve what we do for students, staffing, faculty, um, and also our reviewing process. So when we think about continuous improvement, this is kind of really, um, does it, the bullets really don't do justice to the high level of work that's performed by the faculty when they do um, continuous improvement and analysis. Continuous improvement could be me, re, me reviewing my uh, teaching evaluations. It could be a one-on-one -on -one with a student. It could be um, somebody who leads a student club or organization trying to get feedback from the students. It could be a conversation with the dean that they may have had an unfortunate conversation with the student. It entails so much. It could be that we're losing students because we're not retaining them in the major because it wasn't a good fit for them to begin with. So what we do is we review measures and data and modify as needed. And so oftentimes it depends on the type of data that we analyze through program review. And so to do that, we have to ensure that we have accuracy of the data. Data accuracy is very important for program review. If we don't have accurate data, then we're not really reviewing the accuracies of the program. We can tell a story, we can, tell, we can apply the narrative to it, but if we don't actually have the quantitative data in place, um, we can come up short with certain parts of the components as I previously shared. Um, utilize program action plans. So program action plans depends on, you know, what the data tells us about the um, data analysis of the program, then also what other stakeholders that are going through the program review process are seeing through that. So I call this kind of an area as a former dean that it's kind of like internal bargaining with the program to find out what action plans need to be set forward. Oftentimes we hear, I've heard many times, we need more marketing, we need more resources. Well, um, you actually need more advertising. Um, we have a small marketing department that might not be able to meet all those needs. So we have to look at how we can develop other program action plans. A program action plan could be working with a superintendent, a grow your own teacher program. It could be our first year experience in Dean Lyle's college. It could be, and student affairs. It could be work that we're doing with Title III or the RPED grant or um, the credit for prior learning grant. So we can, we can, tailor to the and utilize program action plans depending on what action needs to move forward. Um, I think the deans do a phenomenal job in the area of developing action plans for the greater good of their college and the programs, but it takes an entire unit to, to develop those out. Okay, timelines, EOU annual planning effectiveness and assessment calendar. So we actually use a calendar. It wasn't as good as um, Chris Burford's as he shared previously. That was phenomenal. I'm gonna steal some of those ideas. But we actually have a, a, a calendar that we follow through the, uh, the review process. So when you think about the months, 
we begin in July with the budget process, previous and current year, effectiveness process, annual program review, longitudinal academic program review, the LAPR as you saw it previously, academic professional development, student learning assessment. Then we move into August and you can see some of the um, items that the calendar guides the deans and the faculty and the programs through the entire process as we gain to have an understanding of a clear picture of program review on this campus. It's intense, um, it's time consuming. Um, I would, real quick, Dean Henniger, how often do does it take, you don't need to come forward, how often does it take to follow the, the calendar process or Dean Newman? I would like for them to hear from maybe a Dean to identify how much time consumption takes place with following the calendar. A lot. <laughs> You'll have to come up and sit in the microphone. And this was a cold call on my attempt, so sorry about that. It's okay. Um, it takes a long time. I, um, in my previous role as the um, chair of the College of Education, I wrote the MAT and the undergraduate one last year. So it takes, um, we have to rely on the data that were provided in uh, early November. Um, and it takes a long time to actually dig through that and comprehend it. Um, because you can take one glance at it and decide what you're going to do with it. Um, or as we continue to talk about like the really good deep dives and thinking comprehensively about what this data is telling us and asking those really hard questions. And, and sometimes it's asking for clarifications of this data. Where is this data pulled? What are we doing with it? And it's bringing it back to your whole team and, and really thinking through like, okay, this did not give us the results we were anticipating or thinking we we're getting. So what are we going to do about it? So um, the, the L the LAPR process in itself um, is not something that's done overnight. It's truly a long, a long term, year long process, really. It, it took me six months to do the two and I was working consistently on it and trying to make sure I was doing steps and having conversations with faculty and making sure that we were moving forward in the process. Great. Thank you. Sorry for the cold call. Thanks. But you can hear it, you can hear it from the field what the intensity and the level it takes. So imagine if you had 15 programs that you were going you were sending to the re review process. My point is you can see how it's quantified on that list on the website with what's selected through the review, the review process because the barriers are time to be able to look at them all. It's very challenging. And so Deans are very selective and very um, pensive when it comes to uh, dialing down on program reviews. So they make sure they actually spend a thorough time through the analysis process. And as you can see, the calendar continues to evolve. It's, it's a lengthy process and it's very, um, I think it's very beneficial for the outcomes as it's a guidance, kind of a rubric that pushes us to a deeper understanding of the review process. So in November, institutional research provides data to colleges. We had a change in November, and so it took some time to get to, uh, I would say, homeostasis or stable, uh, stable mode with the data. So it took myself and all the deans and Angie Adams and um, Reza um, a collaborative effort to do some digging into our data so that we can start getting data to the colleges. Did it slow us down? Yes. Um, so the deans had to get in there and do some work themselves with really looking at kind of creating this patchwork quilt of data so that we could continue the process moving forward. And they did a fantastic job. April program action plans are developed. So that's in conversation right now. Uh, we're working towards what that'll look like. Um, we came to an alignment agreement on maybe setting a date in May for this to kind of land. We're getting more comfortable with our data, which is a good sign. And that, since that drives so much of our program review process, it's very pinnacle that it's appropriate and good. Um, sorry, I rushed through that because it looks like we're 15 minutes over time. Uh, but if you need me to come back in May, I'd be happy to, to kind of allude to some of the questions you have. Um, I would be happy to take questions at this point to help you um, understand more about program review. Go ahead. Christy Go Thank ahead. you. Um, it's a, it actually was really thorough. I don't mind the shortened version. Who is responsible for institutional research, the data? Um, do individual departments collect that? 
um, you, you mentioned some challenges getting that yeah. data. That's Can you talk question. a little bit more about that? So right now, um, you met Reza, Dr. Jelaine, who um, has been moved up into the role of um, the Director of Institutional Research. He was hired to be our Instructional Design and Technology um, employee here. Uh, he replaced David Bentz. I could see that we needed more than what we had during the transition time from his predecessor. And so looking back at his Vita, I went and pulled his Vita when I hired him and looked, you have the skill sets to take on this role. And then with support from the presidents and support from human resources, we made a decision to put him in place um, to, to start some of this work that we needed with data analysis and then also becoming our internal auditor. So we now have an internal auditing data system in place so we can build the warehouse that he presented previously so that we actually have good, transparent, open, clean data. And so um, he began officially April 1st. He's been working on the back end of it, but he's responsible now to feed data. And so he's gonna feed data into systems like program review. He's gonna feed data into athletics and he works closely with IT. And so he's kind of the the oversight, the the now the um, the purveyor of all good data that we're going to build out forward. Um, he's been able to identify a lot of gaps, but thanks to Jeff Carmen and his team and Jocko Thompson in there, they've been able to help us um, collaborate to get to that single source data um, and who will house that. So we're trying to rebuild institutional research in a in a way that. It's not only accessible for all, but it's also um, uh, very tangible um, in a way that it makes sense to individuals accessing data. Yeah. Trustee Valerio, uh, One quick question. Thank you, Matt. I learned something every day. You mentioned something earlier. You said, if I were going back to my student day, what would I do different, right? So is academic, uh, are academic program reviews available to students? In some way, some form, they inform student bodies that show me the beef. I want to know what I'm getting into it, and I want to know where, which one are successful or not. Is that something that we share, we plan to share? Certainly not in my days. I can't speak for all programs, but it's accessible on the website. But do we lead them to that website to show them maybe their program was reviewed? I don't have an answer to that because I haven't asked that specific question to the deans and I don't want to cold call them again. But, you know, hopefully um, two things. Hopefully we do do that. But are they interested in it? Depends on the major, maybe. Um, I would have been one of those students that's interested in how my program is performing. Um, so it just really depends, I think, case by case and situation by situation. Yeah, and I guess when we are ready, when we feel confident yeah. yes. and comfortable with it, yeah. is that something that we feel like the students would ask for? Um, that's an excellent question. I hope so. No, okay. that's fine. That, that's it. No, Thank no, you. I Thank hope you. they would. Yeah. Would you think students would ask to see program data that are in program? Okay. Yeah. It's yeah. a really good question. No, that's a really good question. I like it though. It's a challenge. If I can throw a thought in here, yeah. as a student, you can't ask for something that you don't know exists either. And this is the first time I've ever seen this web page on the website. And I was like, oh, OK, I should go check this out. But you can't ask for something that you don't know exists either. That's that's a, that's a brilliant point. So um, I should have started with this. This this conversation started in my office with my executive assistant. She said, do the trustees understand the deep dive that we do with program review? We kind of sidebar conversationally talk about it because it pops up. And so with her, I mean, her long range wisdom that she's brought, she brings to the table anytime we have a, a good strategic or a tactical conversation, um, she suggested that we needed to do kind of a high level dive into this. I mean, I would love to spend at least two hours with this group on program review and how we're going and where we're going in the future. Um, thanks to President Moore, and she knows where I want to go beyond from here because I love I love crisis and I love experiments and I love as a former science professor, I love to fix things and I always don't have a lab in front of me to do it. 
but I love some of these questions and talking points because I too want to know if students would show interest in their own programs and the data. Can they interpret the data? Can we teach them to interpret the data? Can we teach them to be more of an advocate for their program because they're seeing how the review process is going? Could they be internal auditors of their programs? Could they be checkpoints for us in our programs? I think so. Let's utilize them. Let's let's make them teachers of teachers within the program. As opportunity for you, you to be one of the first. Yeah. Oh, okay. I, I just want to remind folks, I think you're aware of it anyway, but I always like to go back to the 10 essential responsibilities governing boards. And number six is ensuring the quality of the education provided by institution. As trustees, you walk in the door, many of you already knowing how to, for instance, ensure institutional integrity by reading financial reports and other things. But this quality thing is not something you walk in the door knowing. So getting this kind of briefing and getting as form, well informed about it can really help you meet, fulfill that. Because ultimately, whether we're turning out, you know, degrees that aren't, uh, aren't worth the paper they're printed on is, is your responsibility. <laughs> no, that's a good point. And I've shared with Chris before, I mean, we have a very powerful board. We have UC Berkeley graduates, the best rugby team in the world, UCLA. We have um, EOU graduates. We actually have, you know, graduates from Wharton in certificates and uh, MIT and University of Oregon Law School. And we have a lot of talent here. And as we continue to learn more about ways to help you learn more about us, um, it's important and understand academic affairs because it's rather a large unit, but it's critically important for us to make an impact with the students that go through our doorways and exit out and onto the world into the workforce. If I can make a comment, uh, I think in terms of the process of uh, closing the loop is going to be really important uh, because in these many years, I think we've gone through several program reviews, but not necessarily. And of course, different deans, different provosts, different everything. But I don't know that we have ever really, we have submitted a report, but we have never heard back. So there was, there has not been that feedback that is really important uh, in terms of discussing you know what is that needs to be yeah. improved or maybe everything is great or this thing is going down the tube or whatever it is but i think that that piece of closing yeah. the loop will make more and more credible and useful the yeah. the process in itself yeah closing the loop is an ethical proclivity i mean it really is and we must do that Instead of just reports just disappear somewhere to a drive somewhere, we have to be able to bring that report in front of people and analyze it and ask questions and be careful what the answers are and walk through them and learn from them. And that's what we do. I mean, this is this is our science is program review, um, especially under the office of the provost. It's very important. And where that is parked, we have a lot of websites that are still functional and, you know, we're still trying to kind of piece things together to get it so it's kind of clean and consistent and and unified and aligned yeah and that was going to be my question is there a consistent standard form that all departments and all classes fill out so that you can compare apples to apples instead of i mean does the college of education have a different form for their um review than others or is there something that we can just look at real cleanly and, and yes we're building that so it's consistent and there's some elements on the form that i want and i've been working with the president about it president Moore, with what what additional should go on that form but they do use the consistent model but one of the things we're having to clean up the deans hit a wall because we utilize campus labs but they were not able to access components because they didn't have permission to get into their own area to play around with the assessment data that was there, but also upload accurate data. So having a unified form, which is I've showed you a couple of the, the version of what we're doing, um, we've got to really kind of dial down on that as a consistent form that we're going to do. And the deans do a really good job of aligning with me, aligning together that we actually have our model into place. So it's we're building the ship as we sail it, but um, we're, gaining, we're gaining a lot of productive ground and we should be there 
I'm thinking, okay, I'm thinking by the, the next retreat, you're going to see a document that Vice President Seidel hands out, that really colorful document. We're going to have that for academic affairs, that we're going to have something similar to that. So it'll have program review in there and also informational items so we can celebrate out further of the work that we do inside this unit. Okay, I uh, thank you so much, uh, Professor for this uh, discussion. Um, I think we are running so late that I don't know that I want to open any other discussion. So um, I, I just want to remind you that the next meeting is on Wednesday, May 3rd, um, again from 2 to 4. And with this, I have the authority to adjourn this meeting. <laughs>